was made and a uh, right tight trial of trephination followed by mini monoca stent insertion was planned under local anesthesia so surgeon for the first procedure is uh, professor ms bajaj sir over to you sir thank you uh, okay. yes it's very clear now yeah it's clear We can see the microscopic view also. Yes, yes, we can see clear. Doing a probe test. Okay, so uh, now uh, after inserting the probe, the Bowman's probe, we have encountered a soft stop. And we will just see the measurements that how, what is the So it's at about 11 millimeters, 11 to 12 millimeters from the 
um, lower punctum. So soft stop at that site along with the syringing findings uh, indicates that this patient is having a common canalicular block. So the procedure that we're about to do is a Sisler's trephination, which is a very uh, minimally invasive procedure for such blocks. And uh, it works. Uh, the prognosis increases as the block, block is more distal. So uh, if it's a very proximal block, say less than 5 to 8 millimeters, the chances of success are relatively low. So we'll just now, uh, I'll show you the refine. So as you must have seen, this is a, the Sisler's refine. Uh, outside is the cannula, which has been sharpened. This, it, it comes like this, that is, there's a sharp edge and it's absolutely round at the tip. And then it has a stylet inside, which is, just coming out at the tip of the cannula and it's about maybe three millimeters longer than the cannula, the, than the trephine. And uh, the main purpose of this stylet is that the, the trephine does not start cutting before we want it to. So when we introduce this inside, it's going to just act like a probe till we take out the stylet and then the cannula, st the, the trephine starts cutting at that time. Oh. So now I'm just introducing the trephine. The stylet goes in first, followed by the... Hello. Yes, please. Uh, good morning, Dr. Mongre, this side. Yes, please. Uh, can I ask a question? Uh, this is common canalicular block and clinically can we assume that everything else is normal or the block is extending so, um, from common canalicular yeah, on? We cannot, uh, yeah, you're right, Dr. Mungre, and a uh, very good morning to you. Thank good morning. you for joining in. <coughs> so you are yeah. absolutely correct. We cannot assume that the NLD is uh, patent. So our main purpose is to clear the this block first, reach the sac, and then only after that, uh, if there is a another block beyond that, say for example in the NLD, then uh, one can combine the procedure with a probing or in those cases, and even in adults, uh, it may be worthwhile to just probe it so that. Uh, at least if you're able to, some mild distal obstruction is there and if you're able to clear it in the same sitting, that will be really worthwhile. So now I have uh, dilated the punctum a little further to introduce the trephine and we have reached the site of the block. And uh, now we will withdraw the stylet from the trephine. I'm withdrawing it here. So as soon as we withdraw it, the cutting edge of the refine is exposed. And now with keeping the direction of the refine in the physiological uh, or the anatomical direction of your uh, canaliculi, we are doing a gentle to and rotatory motion. Uh, clockwise and anti-clockwise to yes, yes, trying to negotiate the block. One should not try to force it through too much because then you are likely to cause a false passage.
and now i have uh, got that little feeling of a issue give and uh, i can feel a heart stop now which means that we are in the sack feeling the sack feeling the sack without the sack so then the end point for the uh, preparation would be the giveaway sensation as well as the heart stop that we are able to feel in the yes, side sack uh, as soon as you feel that there is a little uh, you, the cannula will go the trephine will go in further beyond the site of the block then you will have a feel a little tissue give also and then uh, your other thing पानी आ रहा है चले में हां जी आ रहा है पानी आज नाक में आ रहा है गले में गले में आ रहा है सो द पेशेंट हैज कंफर्म दैट शी कैन द फील द फ्लूइड कमिंग थ्रू द सरिंजिंग इज बेटर सो थ्रू दिस ट्रिफाइन ओनली वी कैन फर्स्ट बिफोर टेकिंग आउट द ट्रिफाइन एट द सेम टाइम वी जस्ट कंफर्म दैट द एवरीथिंग इज पेटेंट आफ्टर दैट now we have to do the tenting with the minimum oka stent so i am withdrawing the trephine now and now we will fashion the tent in such a way that it is about 3 to 3 mm beyond the site of the block which was the site of the block so if the block was at around 11 whatever we confirmed on the table was around 11 to 12 mm we will keep the stent little longer than that and minimum of that okay hello sir this trephine can be reused again or like uh, well uh, possible one strictly speaking it is disposable okay okay sir. but uh, you can easily use it for 10 to 15 cases without losing its uh, you know cutting edge Okay. The, okay. The cutting edge technology of the trephine. Mm -hmm. Okay, sir. All right. So now uh, <clears throat> this is the minimum of our stent. It has the plug here, which will fit, which fits slug, snugly into the punctum, so that you don't have to suture this stent. And uh, this is the the actual length of the stent is much longer, as you can see. It's about forty millimeters. But so if you could show the uh, head again clearly, I mean it was not very yeah sure right. I think this is a lot of reflection coming from the scale, isn't it? Now you can so much better, sir. It is the scale of it. Yes. So this is the head here. Uh, this stent does not have a lumen inside. So whatever drainage happens after putting the stent will be along the uh, outer edge of the stent only, right? So this. and this is the plug so if the punctum is not patchless or loose this fits in snugly there if your punctum is uh, loose or the you feel that it's not snugly fitting you can even pass one or two sutures to and fix the stent to the outer wall of punctum so here we have uh, this is 40 wood so we need to do we'll cut it a little longer first and then we can always trim it down later so let's say we can about 15 mm we can uh, make a cut here i think that was a great surgical point because at times i feel it's difficult to put in the entire minimoca stent all through all the track so trimming always helps us keeping uh, yes. uh, getting out of this procedure very well soon so so as you can see i have cut it in a bevel shape right so that also helps sometimes because you know uh, you may have uh, you know uh, had a successful trephination but when you put the stent inside because of some kinking or of the canaliculus you may not be able to insert the entire length of the stent so there that's when you end up in a little problem on the table clips or the so uh, 
it's a very attractive procedure uh, because other only other options are quite invasive like an alicular dcr etc so here we are not uh, it's this this procedure can be done easily without any major uh, surgical intervention so luckily in this case uh, we have been able to go beyond the obstruction site without any problem but sometimes you may end up having problems in introducing the stent and uh, then i'll just discuss with you what what is my technique for that how i negotiate that hold it here with the force hold the lid here just uh, stabilize the lid you need a tooth force so it just goes in with the plop like that snugly fitting into the punctum and uh, so i think we said our prayers today properly everything is that should uh, on according to plan but yes sometimes uh, because this stent does not have a lumen and you can't thread it over a probe to make it rigid so it's a flexible stent and uh, even if you have the right length of the stent you may end up the stent coiling up inside so in that situation what i do is that uh, the thinnest lacrimal probe i just uh, along you know i just put it into the punctum just along the stent you know with the stent inside and it makes the canaliculus straight and then the stent can be easily pushed into the desired uh, length whatever you want so here as you can see it's quite snugly fitting we don't need to put a suture but otherwise one can put a couple of sutures at it has a collar here as you can see the collar one can put eight o vicral one and two to fixate the stent and we usually keep the stent inside for about 3 months and uh, after that one really knows the patency status before that there may be some reduction in watering as the capillary action along the side of the stent but you are not really sure whether 100% patency has been achieved unless you remove the stent completely uh, post operatively uh, antibiotic drops and uh, then first full strength steroid just to prevent the these drops the steroid drops to prevent any fibrosis initial fibrosis after the procedure it these help and then you can taper down to low strength steroids so that uh, for about 4 to 6 weeks you can use very low strength steroids so now as you can see uh, we have within say about maybe must have taken about 10 minutes for the entire thing so very patient friendly and a doctor friendly procedure so if there are any questions i'll be happy to answer those sir uh, for the beginners like uh, for trifination is there any other uh, is any tips or for prevention of this uh, false uh, uh, this passes and all uh, you see uh, that's why i said that the more proximal you are the more chances of false passages so the success rate keeps on increasing as you are more distal so for beginners i would uh, suggest that uh, well for anybody actually whether it's a beginner or a very experienced person the chances of false passages are always there so it's just that you uh, if you want a good high success rate you can uh you know take up initially only common canalicular blocks or blocks which are beyond 8 mm because then your chances of going in the wrong direction are quite minimized once you put your yes, yes. refine along the anatomical direction of the canaliculus you are just maybe only 1 or 2 mm away from the opening of the sac so uh 
rather I would say that uh, one should start with doing only common granular blocks and then uh, you can go say to distal blocks which are beyond 8 millimeters. Okay. Proximal to 8 millimeters usually don't have a good prognosis. Mm -hmm. So one can uh, do that uh, and then one has to explain to the patient. Uh, there is no other specific method to prevent a false passage except that you just go in the anatomical direction and you just do a gentle uh, you know clockwise and anti-clockwise motion. Don't try to force it much through the tissues and uh, once you're in the sac then you can feel the heart stop. But yes, of course, if you go through a false passage also and you might reach the sac through a false passage and then you'll still feel a heart stop. And once you put the stent there, the chances of recanalization are much less to the false passage as they are to a normal recanalized canaliculus. So, well, it's your luck and the patient's luck. But uh, yes, you can take all these, do all these steps which I just enumerated. and. Uh, it's on a Monday or a Thursday they work, on other days they don't work. <laughs> All right. Sir, in the post-operative period, do you give steroid eye drops or you add cyclosporine drops also? No, I, I myself, uh, I give antibiotic and full strength steroid, like dexamethasone, for about uh, two weeks, which uh, prevents the initial fibrosis. And then we can separate it down to low strength steroid, low tepredinol, fluoromethylone for another four weeks. So I think that the steroids are very potent uh, antifibrotic agent, so I prefer to give steroids. Cyclosporin, which has been showing good response in long-term stenosis, is you can, can try. try. Okay. Can try. After three months, once you remove it, yes. then subsequent follow-up, uh, how frequently? Means monthly, etc. Or, or do you do then uh, repeat probing at some point of time? Yes, so a monthly follow-up would be required uh, and then sometimes if there is a re-stenosis, we might just first try to, you know, uh, put in a probe through that. It might be just a very thin membrane or something. So we can even do a probe probing in that case. And otherwise, if it's a stronger uh, or more uh, harder, this thing, you know, stenosis, then one can consider a, uh, this repeat procedure after about at least six to eight weeks of the initial, uh, of removing the stent. And then, uh, you know, uh, one can try it once more and if it works and then otherwise then you are not uh, having any other option but to do a, a penalegular DCR after that. So I think uh, the main thing is that uh, even after you've done this procedure once or twice or thrice, you can, you have nothing to lose. You can give the patient a trial of this procedure first, which is a very non-invasive procedure, and then go on to anything bigger later on if uh, it doesn't work, right? So we have the, now, if there are no other questions, we can, the other case is ready, the second case is ready on the other table. Uh, Dr. Achnameel is uh, just raring to go. So, uh, so thank you, sir. That was a very lovely, uh, beautifully de uh, demonstrated uh, this okay, surgery. Thank you. Thank and you for your attention. Thank you, sir. Thank yeah. you. So next case, we have uh, the live surgery will be done by Dr. Rajna Mil. Uh, she will be doing a surgery or uh, showing the surgical resection in the case of uh, ocular surface squamous neoplasia. I request. Uh, yeah. Can I ask me to uh, present the case? Yeah. So the second so the second case for the live surgery is of, of a ocular surface squamous neoplasia. So the patient was a 52 year old male uh, who is farmer by occupation and presented with a inferior temporal mass 
uh, in the left eye for past one year, which was gradual in onset, painless and progressive. Right. So there was history of smoking in patient, which was significant. And there was no history of trauma or systemic illness. And there was no family history of similar complaints. On examination, 4.5 into 5 mm elevated uh, nodular papillary lesion uh, seen involving 3 to 5 clock hours of limbus and adjacent to cornea with pigmentary changes and dilated tortuous feeder vessel. On uh, UBM examination, we can see that there is uh, no involvement of corneal stroma as such and there is no involvement of sclera but uh, and anti uh, chamber anti chamber angles are also uh, show no evidence of tumor on uh, asoct there is hyper reflectivity seen in the superficial layers of cornea suggestive of involvement thus the diagnosis of oculosurface famous neoplasia was made and it was classified into ajcc uh, tnm staging it was t3 n0 m0 and uh, um, management was planned for the patient with wide local excision uh, with no touch technique with cryo and amniotic membrane graft. So the uh, surgery will be performed by uh, Dr. Rachna Meel. Over to you ma'am. Thank you Parag. Uh, so this is uh, a great T3 tumor. It's involving uh, the limbus and the cornea. That's what makes it great T3 according to AGCC. Now the whole idea of doing the excision in case of uh, ocular surface squamous neoplasia is to excise the tumor and to ensure that there is uh, no seeding of the tumor while you are doing the surgery and take care of anything that is left behind. So essentially uh, we've already blocked the patient, we've given him a peribulbar block. And we've kept the pupil dilated in order to see the corneal involvement. That's a better seen in uh, um, uh, with the dilated pupil and uh, with the glow from the fundus. And uh, you could also do preoperatively staining with rose bengal to look for the extent of the corneal involvement. So the first step is to mark your margins of excision. Usually we take around four millimeters for the conjunctival part. Ma'am, I have a question. Yes, please go ahead. Uh, have you tried uh, chemo reduction or primary treatment with uh, medication yes we do that this, in this case no we did not so tumors which involve less than three clock hours of the limbus they are they can be uh, dealt with upfront surgery or if the patient does not want surgery you can go ahead and uh, do an upfront excision larger tumors which are uh, involving more than three clock hours of the limbus are more likely to have surgery related side effects and therefore in those cases we would prefer and encourage the patient to undergo immunotherapy or a chemotherapy but in cases like this you could either go in for a surgery or you could try conservative treatment either of the two will work well so now we've marked the borders we've taken four millimeters from the conjunctival margin and on the corneal side we're, we're a little more conservative so maybe two to three millimeters on this side is what we're taking and you can see the edge of the tumor is here there is not much extension into the cornea as uh, visible in the glow here. So the idea is to remove the epithelium up to three millimeters from the border 
of the tumor. So we apply 100% alcohol here to devitalize the cells. Sida dekhe, light me dekhe, Baba ji. Thirty seconds to one minute, you can apply it, and then you can scroll off the epithelium. After that, once loosens up, keep the wash ready, please. Like I'm are we using absolute alcohol for this? Yes. You can see seems to have loosened up here now. Wash me. I'm so positive also. You just initiate the scrolling with the blade and then continue with a uh, plant experiment. Me so So we've achieved the scrolling of the epithelium to the limbus. Now we're going to initiate the incision on the conjunctival side. So before that, uh, because we uh, want it to be a bloodless peel, we'll, we can cauterize these margins first before we do the uh, beginning of the incision. We start with the incision. So I'm just going to cauterize the conjunctiva here. Yeah, okay, all right, it's so working.
So he has these two feeder vessels coming from the inferotemporal side. And that. Okay. Stop oh. again. You can see the feeder vessel there. So the whole idea is to reduce the bleeding to as minimal as possible. That reduces the bleeding of the residual conjunctiva. You expect that in cases which have these feeder vessels, they are likely to bleed in when you are particularly working from that area. It's not. And all the while, while you're doing the surgery, the whole idea is to stay away from the main tumor and not touch, and any instrument that touches the tumor must be discarded or the swab that you're using.
हाँ जी तारा दे हाँ ऑल राइट सो वी हैव अर मार्जिन सेल या ओके सो लेट्स गिव हिम सब सब टीन एंड क्या नहीं मैं लगा के दो गिव मी नंबर सिग्नल प्लीज इधर दर्द है अच्छा ओके ठीक है एक मिनट सीधा रखिए सर This is other silver. Okay. I'm just going to give him a little bit of a sub tin. Okay. Last we one tikka will put. Okay. Nice. Give me a swap, please. Keep it here. We let it work. Uh, Ma'am, is the subterranean block always further required? Pardon, I couldn't hear you. Uh, is, is the subterranean block further always required, Ma'am? No, good peri bulba will usually not require, but in this case, somehow, uh, especially if you have a little bit of an inflammation, then you might need to have. Uh, add on more anesthesia. That's about. We almost done. All we need to do now is to dissect it off the base. Thank you. Keep the crescent ready. You can see how dilated the vessels are here. Okay. You see, it's not adherent anywhere, as was also evident on the UBM that was done preoperatively. But it will be adherent at the limbus, which is usually the site of origin for these tumors. Want you to just put some pressure on the globe here, this way. So, my so UBM always has the tissue at the limbus. You want the globe yet steering? One second. I mean, uh, so one. the UBM becomes very uh, definite, ma'am. That guides us very well, I think. Yes, for the uh, especially one second. So I'll just take a second and answer your question there. Yeah, remove that swab, please. Use another one. Here. This area, yeah. And don't touch the tumor much. Only here, touch here only in the area that I'm working. Yeah. So this is a pretty friable tumor. Papillary tumors are pretty friable. So once you hold them, and the idea is to hold them with the conjunctiva. Leave it. Use another one. Cannot. All right, give me a question, please. 
So the larger the tumors, more difficult it is to uh, keep your area bloodless. But you try as best as can be. Please mop on the other side. What I'm doing is I'm giving pressure sorry, on the globe so that I am able to get the right plane. Can you push from there? Yeah, with the yes. And to hold the tumor is very difficult, like I said. Uh, now you need to mop here. Mop again, please. All right, it's very friable. Hearing from wherever I can, wherever I'm holding it. So just, I'll just place this here. Okay, it's all right. Okay, leave. So instead, I will use this because it's not letting me hold it. And you can mop from here. Mop from here, yeah. I will cut it with the scissor and shave off the rest with the crescent pad. That's what I'll do. Right. So where is your filter paper? Keep it, uh, keep it like that. Keep it here on this. On this. So you, whatever you harvest, you have to send it for your pathology. It's best to send it on a filter paper. So this is the left eye. We've already prepared it. And uh, this is the lateral side. This is inferior, superior. Is it visible now? So what we are essentially going to be doing is we are going to place this tumor here on the filter paper. And we'll orient it in a way the way it was on the ocular surface. Can you just hold it? The filter paper, please. So this is inferior, this is medial, this is the lateral. So this is the part that was next to the cornea. Since this is already torn, we may not have the ideal situation here. Where is the, yeah, all right. And this was the rest of it. It's good to have a pre-op photograph to help you align the tumor in the right way while you send it to your pathologist who gives you a report for the margin and the base here. So it's very important to orient it the right way. You can see the normal conjunctive is on this side. And this is the pigmented part of the tumor. And you let the tumor dry on this. This is superior, lateral, inferior, and it's best to write it with a pencil or something which does not kind of go away when you dip it in 10 percent formula. So we let it dry for some time and then we put it in the formula. Forgive me. Oh, this is it. That's about it. Try okay. So we'll just shave off this residual tissue on the limbus.
ఓకే చూడండి ఇట్స్ డిఫరెంట్ యా ఫస్ట్ టు టెల్ యువర్ అసిస్టెంట్ టు నాట్ టు రీయూజ్ ద మాప్స్ వన్స్ ఇట్ టచెస్ ది మస్ట్ చేంజ్ ఇట్ ఫర్ అ న్యూ వన్ అండ్ ట్రై నాట్ యూజింగ్ ది సేమ్ వన్ అగైన్ that's it i think we're done with the excision there's a little bit of a deeper excision from this particular phase but otherwise seems fine so now we go on to the second step so we've excised the tumor this was a wide local excision now we have to take care of any residual cells that might be there for which we do a joint cryotherapy so what is recommended is a double or a triple freeze cryo which you apply to the conjunctival margins and also at the limbus it has to be a fast cryo with a slow thawing and at least double if not triple cycle no i need cryo Now, just the cryo probe. Check for the ice ball formation here. Yes, it's working fine. So what you do is a reverse cryo. You don't place it on the top like that because you do do not want to cryo the sclera. It's only the conjunctiva that needs to be cryoed. That's a rapid file, and this has to be done in overlapping manner. So do not put any saline; it has to thaw slowly. this is one of the most so i always tell the residents when we are doing the surgery that this may appear the most boring part of the whole procedure but this is the most crucial part of the whole surgery Okay. That was the first cycle. We are just going to repeat the whole process once more.
You can also cryo the area of the limbus. Where the tumor was arising. But then again, it's best to do it only if it is less than three clock hours. For larger tumors, it's not be advisable. You uh, can limit the cryo at the limbus only to the area where the tumor was actually adherent to the limbus. All right, that brings us to the last part of the surgery, which is to reconstruct the ocular surface, which we are going to do with amniotic membrane graft. It's a substrate graft which is going to stay there for some time while your epithelium regrows over it. So this is the stromal part, which is against this paper. Please ensure that after you excise the tumor, you have a change of your instruments and you're not using the same instruments that you were using for the excision. You can uh, fix it either using a zero vicryl or you could use it use a fibrin glue here. Can I have to do? So. So we have the two components separately. 
So a very good morning to all of you. Welcome morning. to this workshop. Good morning, Rachna. Good morning, Professor Bajaj. Is sir there in the OT? Okay. So uh, if there are any questions from the audience, you could let us know. Again, I have a question. Yeah, sure. Hi, Dr. Mogri. Welcome to RV Center. How are you? I have a question. Not only question, but an uh, observation that there is a even enough uh, material available now to give to show that uh, interferon is the treatment of choice in these cases. Fine. And uh, we should definitely give it a trial before we take patient for surgery. Now, now what is your take for this? And uh, second part of this question, what are those ominous features in tumors like these which warrant a primary surgery? So, uh, Dr. Rashna, there's a question here. Yeah. Yes, I just want to finish this and then I'll come to the question. Yeah, sure. So, now we've, uh, we're done with the placing the AMG. For the epithelial defect, you could either put a BCL or you can just put the glue over it. That will make the patient less symptomatic. I will just organize. Ointment, please, or eye drops, antibiotic drops. Yes. So the question was, uh, yes, that was a very valid question, and I'm happy that this was asked. Uh, interferons have come up as a very gentle way of treating uh, the uh, ocular surface squamous neoplasia, and they definitely must be tried uh, in cases uh, wherever feasible. Now and wherever there are no ominous signs like uh, you said so. So now the point is where is it feasible and where it is not. So again, interferons, if you want to give them as drops, they need to be uh, prepared in the particular concentration and the facility for the same may not be available everywhere. The other thing is if you want to give them as perilesional, so that is the other choice which is I think uh, more feasible in the periphery if you do not have a pharmacy to dispense those drops. But then again, they have uh, the drops that you make need refrigeration and they may last only for 10 days. So you cannot use them beyond 10 days. So you have to have the patient coming back to you every two weeks for same. So having said that, looking at the feasibility, often the patients are coming from far away places and a case like this, which is easily resectable without much uh, complications that you're expecting from the resection here. You may go ahead with the resection, uh, keeping in mind that the patient, if he's coming from very far away, may not be able to come every two weeks for getting the drops. And the treatment with interferons will take at least six weeks for, in some cases, and longer uh, uh, in many other cases. So that has to be kept in mind. And the ominous signs, so if, uh, where, what are those cases where you do not want to try interferons? Uh, now, what is the intent of treatment? So immunotherapy can be used for reduction, which is immunoreduction, or it can be uh, used for treatment, complete treatment, that's immunotherapy per se. Uh, for immunoreduction, you could try it even in cases which have larger tumors. Uh, but the ominous signs which you should be looking for will include thicker tumors. So if you have a tumor which is like more than four millimeters in thickness, or there's a history of previous surgery which you've not done yourself, so you really don't know what to expect. That's the second thing. The third is if uh, you suspect that the tumor has scleral invasion, which you will in cases which have only conjunctival tumors, you can always do the motility test. You can uh, see whether it is mobile over the underlying sclera, which will tell you that it is not invading the sclera. But if it is fixed, 
then you know that it's invading the sclera and perhaps you would want to go in for surgery rather than initially giving a trial of interferons. And uh, then there's a variant which is called the mucoepidermoid tumor, which is uh, more yellowish than the usual variety. And in those particular cases, if you're suspecting a mucoepidermoid, again, you would not want to delay the surgery and would want to take rid of, uh, get rid of the tumor as soon as possible. Any other questions from the house here? Excellent and very patiently done surgery. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. And one thing I want to add, if there is a scleral invasion is there, definitely we will consider for plug brachytherapy is there. So there's another option for that one. Yeah, absolutely. So if you have a, a tumor that's adherent to the sclera while you're dissecting it, then there are a few things that you can do depending on the availability of the infrastructure. Uh, you could go ahead and do a scleral uh, uh, excision of around 20% of the thickness of the sclera. You could do that. You could apply cryo in that area. If it's a very small area, uh, you could apply cryo in that area. And uh, some people often use MMC, but that's something that doesn't have a lot of uh, literature to support it. So I believe cryo and scleral resection would be what you would recommend. And of course, if brachy is available, that's the best thing to do. Yeah, and also that histopathology is very important. So you have to see what you get on the histopathology. Sometimes what may not be clinically visible, you may end up as having microscopic residual disease on the scleral bed. And then in those cases also postoperatively, if you have the facility for plaque brachytherapy, like we've done in a few cases over here, it works quite well. Any other questions? Yeah. Ma'am, uh, for this, if you have any, uh, like in these cases, we meticulously you have to remove every, uh, like the tumors and all. But in some cases, like, will you, will you like to consider, like, prophylactically adjuvant uh, any immunotherapy, like interferon post, uh, post treatment, or you'll wait for the histopathic report only and start uh, the treatment? All right. So, uh, Cases that are having skip areas or multiple areas of involvement or large diffuse tumors where uh, you do try to excite, uh, primarily in those cases, you try uh, topical therapy first. But sometimes if they do not respond and you have multiple lesions or large diffuse lesions, uh, you do the surgery, but surgery is very difficult in those cases because you have uh, this large areas that you have to excise. And uh, sometimes it may not be possible for you to get that, do a wide local excision. So you may just end up doing a surgical excision just at the edge of the tumor in order to save that conjunctiva. I think there you must start the treatment with adjuvant uh, topical therapy immediately. So that's why it's very important as who the primary surgeon is, because it is after all the surgery that will, uh, the surgeon who will know how much it has been resected and whether there is a need for adjuvant treatment. Of course, the histopathology is extremely important. It supports, uh, it gives you the evidence of residual disease and uh, further helps you in determining adjuvant treatment. Oh uh, yeah, and the proponents of uh, topical interferons, those who really advocate for it quite aggressively, uh, one of the schools of thought is also that, you know, when you do surgery, you're actually just limiting your treatment to localized disease, whatever you can see, whatever is visible. Whereas if you use immunotherapy, it works on the entire surface of the ocular uh, surface. So even if there is any microscopic disease anywhere, that can also be taken care of. So that is one more uh, advantage that people who use topical interference uh, site. So thank you very much. That was a wonderful session. And I hope Thanks you all so enjoyed much. it. And uh, now I, I think it's time to move on to the next session. So we have a short tea break here. And all of you are welcome to join us for a cup of tea. Yeah. 
ठीक हो गया ठीक कर ठीक हो जाएगा ये निकाल दीजिए
So we are now going to start the surgical skill transfer session. And uh, I invite Dr. Rachna to present the first uh, talk on orbital decompression in thyroid eye disease. Hello. Yes. Morning, everyone. Thank you for being here. It's so nice to have you all here after this uh, COVID time. I think this is the first physical workshop that we are having. And uh, so very happy to have you here. And we'll start uh, with the vast session. Uh, so the first talk is on uh, three world orbital decompression. Not very commonly done. I've also started doing it recently. But I thought it would be interesting to do, show something which is not done very often and something that is of common interest to ENT surgeons as well as oculoplastic surgeons and less often done by the oculoplasty people. Uh, so indications of surgery, the ones that have conventionally been there are optic neuropathy secondary to the thyroid eye disease and corneal exposure. Now, more recently now, cosmetic restoration and improvement of proptosis is also another indication that is being used. And what we need to remember is that orbital decompression is performed uh, first prior to other surgeries for strabismus or correction of eyelid retraction. So that's something very important that we need to remember. Contraindications are essentially almost similar to what you look for in a patient you're preparing for DCR surgery. So you wouldn't want the patient to have any sort of sinusitis or atretic sinuses, any uh, possibility of an orbital infection, immunocompromise, or bleeding disorders. Again, the patient has to understand what to expect from the surgery, and uh, expectations uh, can uh, not be met if they are far-fetched, so that the patient has to understand. And of course, the patient has to be uh, uh, stable as far as thyroid function tests are concerned. So essentially what you want to do uh, in a three wall decompression is create osteotomies or openings in the three walls of the orbit. So this is the orbit of the left eye. This is the medial wall. What you see here, is there a pointer? Or I'll show it with the cursor. So this is the anterior lacrimal crest. This is the posterior lacrimal crest. This is the lacrimal bone and this is the lamina papyracea. So medially, what we want to do is create an opening in the lamina papyracea. That is, so you stay behind the posterior lacrimal crest. While, while, while you're doing a DCR surgery, this is where you're working. But when you want to do a medial decompression, this is where you're working. You can go as far as posteriorly as the optic canal itself. For the floor, what where you decompress, it's important to remember, you have to stay medial to the infraorbital group. So this is the infraorbital group carrying the infraorbital nerve. It's arising from the inferior orbital fissure and coming onto the inferior orbital foramen here. And the bone lateral to this is quite thick and you need to remain uh, medial and posterior. So the anterior part of the bone is left to support the globe. Otherwise, you may have a subluxation of the uh, globe and hypoglobus secondary to the surgery. Lateral wall is what most oculoplastic surgeons do because this is the area where we normally work also when we're doing orbitotomies. So what you remove is a part of the zygoma along with the greater wing of sphenoid. And again, you may or may not remove the rim per se. So you may preserve it or you may remove it with the that uh, posterior part of the lateral wall. So this is the case where we did the surgery. A uh, young patient with eight to nine millimeters of bilateral proptosis and I'll go on to the video now. So this is done under general anesthesia and uh, we pass the cotton sutures through the lid in order to uh, get the exposure of the ocular surface. We bridle the three sutures, uh, three muscles, which are the medial rectus, the uh, inferior rectus, and the lateral rectus. This is essentially done because intraoperatively, uh, you uh, want to clearly identify these muscles when you're working in that plane so that you do not damage the muscles and end up having a post-surgical strabismus. So this is done using a 406 suture. You do a transcarancular entry into the medial orbit. And this is where you're given the incision. You are extending it inferiorly into the inferior fornix since we are also doing a flow fracture repair here. 
and then a little, little bit superiorly to get enough access. And then we direct and dissect the tissues. When you uh, dissect the tissues here, where you land up is the posterior lacrimal crest. Once you identify it, you give a uh, incision in the periosteum here. So it's essentially like a DCR surgery, only that you're working in the posterior medial orbit rather than the anterior. And once you've given that incision, you expose the bone. So you can see the bone here very well, the lamina paparatia. You can see it once, yeah, there, that's the lamina paparatia behind. So you have to now initiate a fracture here. So you make that opening. And the bone is so thin here that once you make an opening, all you have to do is lift it up with the forceps and it virtually breaks the whole bone up to the posterior uh, ethmoid sinuses. And you can see the sinus mucosa here. You, this is then followed up by opening of the periorbita, which in most cases of TAD already open, opens up by the time you expose the bone. So I didn't have to do it here. Again, inferiorly, you dissect the tissues, cut the retractors, and you reach the inferior orbital margin here. You identify it, and you give the incision in the periosteum, just like you do for orbital flow fractures. And you lift up the periosteum. Again, you have to remember that you have to stay medial to the infraorbital groove. You initiate the opening in the bone here, and you extend it posteriorly. What is also important to remember is that the medial strut that is there between the inferior wall and the medial wall needs to be conserved. So you do not go too much medially. So you, all you do is you extend posteriorly as far as possible and laterally you take care of the group. Also, this is an important site where you can excise excess of fat. So like I said, you do not really need to open the periorbita. Usually it opens up while you're doing the surgery and whatever fat is prolapsing, you can excise it carefully without causing too much of a traction on it. And having done that, we then close the conjunctiva using uh, 80 Vicryl. So this is done. I mean, this takes around half an hour to 40 minutes, but it's the lateral wall decompression, which is more time taking. The wall is thicker and creating the osteotomy is more difficult. Uh, this is a stellar, modified stellar right incision. You extend it from the lateral lid crease like a Berkey's onto the, <clears throat> uh, next to the lateral canthus. Stay sutures are passed to expose the wound and then you dissect the tissues to be able to reach the, this is the lateral orbital rim. Then you give an incision in the periosteum here and you lift off the periosteum of this orbital rim and this is extended both medially which is this way and laterally. So it is most adherent at the rim. Beyond that, it is not so adherent. So once you have reached the edges of the ridge, you can use a blunt instrument like a spatula to just lift it off. And you can see the fat is already coming out of that breached periorbita there. Similarly, laterally, here you have the temporal fossa and you are lifting off the periosteum here. Now, this is a bone aspirator. This is a very useful instrument uh, that, that you use. It's just like a phaco probe. But instead of the lens, what you're doing is you're working on the bone. There's an aspiration and there is an irrigation. So view is uh, very good when you're using this. What I've done is I have uh, trimmed the rim because unless you do that, you're not able to see the fossa. Once you do that, you see the fossa here. And this is the temporalis muscle, which is inserted there. There you can see it now. So you have to cauterize it and you have to disinsert it from there. So once you've done that, you can see all of the fossa, and this is where you have to create the osteotomy. So the rim has been thinned out. You can see you cannot see this part unless you trim the rim. And again, using the excavator, it takes a long time. This is a video. It's looking much shorter. It might take around 15 to 20 minutes while you chisel off the bone with this and then slowly uh, create that opening. So you initiate at one place there, and then you try to widen it to make it as big as possible. The problem is that the bone posteriorly, as soon as you make the osteotomy and widen it by around 10 millimeters, is quite thick behind and you can start seeing the bone marrow in that bone there and you extend it superiorly and inf inferiorly. So what some people uh, do to further enhance the osteotomy is to remove the inner table of the greater wall of sinoid, but we are just limiting to this full thickness osteotomy here. And that's about it. So we have this rounded osteotomy in the lateral wall. We've preserved the rim. 
it helps you to take the hurtles reading better and it's also protected for the globe. So we usually conserve the rim here. That's the orbital fat plus a part of the lacrimal gland. You try to open the periorbita and you allow the fat. So it's very important to open the periorbita if it is not open because un unless you do that, the fat will not prolapse into these openings that you have made. And that is what essentially brings about the correction of proptosis. Then you close in two layers, you're closing the orbicularis followed by closure of the skin. So you also give a pressure on the globe to help the fat to prolapse into those openings that you have created. I think that's about it. So now these are just the intro pictures to show you that's the opening in the medial wall. There's a large opening. And uh, this is the, so you could do a balanced decompression without approaching the floor, depending. So it's a case based approach whether you want to do one wall, two wall, or three wall. Essentially, each wall will give you a two millimeter of correction. Fat itself can give you a correction of two to four millimeters. Uh, depending on how much fat you are excising. So that's the fourth wall. This is the post-op correction uh, of the patient after both eye surgeries was done. She still has a lot of eyelid retraction, which we need to treat. And that, therefore, the difference is, does not look remarkable. But once you do the lid retraction surgery is uh, when you will start seeing the difference. Complication, of course, the most common one is orbital hemorrhage. You could have a compartment syndrome, diplopia, restricted motility hypoasthesia and CSF leak. So uh, these are just a few photographs of the patients where we've done decompression unilateral in this case. This is another lady. Again, a lot of eyelid retraction, which needs to be treated now. This is the first case we did where we only did a lateral wall decompression. He had a facial nerve palsy. And so we only did uh, one wall and we had to do a tarsorapy for the facial nerve palsy also. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'd be happy to take any questions here. Ma'am, uh, out here, ma'am. Yeah. 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 Just post-operatively, what you advise for, like, if steroid and anything? Yes. So, uh, like I said, wherever you're touching the orbital fat, whether you're doing a blepharoplasty or you're doing orbital decompression, uh, you have to advise patients to avoid any kind of procedure, that, uh, any kind of maneuver that would increase the valsalvas, uh, uh, produce a valsalvas. And of course, you give them antibiotics. So we give intraoperatively one shot of IV antibiotics followed by five days postoperatively. And of course, it will induce chronic, uh, it will induce sinusitis because you've made openings into the ethmoid and the maxillary sinus. So you have to tell them uh, to put uh, uh, drops in the nose to take care of the congestion. And uh, also, you also tell them to take steam, but not in the initial one week or so. So just like sinusitis, the same treatment. And uh, that's about it. And some anti-inflammatory to take care of the inflammation secondary to the surgery. But the most important thing is not to create that valsalvas. It would induce an orbital hemorrhage, and that could be disastrous. Anything different you do than what you have done? So those are actually emergency indications for surgery. There, of course, we would like to do a medial and a floor decompression rather than a lateral wall decompression because that much of decompression is faster and it will take care of uh, any optic nerve uh, compromise that, or compression that is happening. You can extend posteriorly, although it's best done by ENT surgeons, especially when the optic nerve is uh, uh compressed at the apex because uh we usually however hard we try tend to remain a little anterior to the posterior most part of the medial wall uh, so that's best approach from the ethmoids and uh, is best done by the anti surgeon but yes for the corneal exposure the surgery like i said if you do a medial and pro decompression or even a pure medial wall decompression it will give you enough correction of proptosis to take care of the corneal exposure and it's a faster surgery compared to a lateral wall decompression. When in active cases you do decompression, any pharmacological modification you do? Uh, 
or you continue with IVMP like we are doing normally? Yes. So essentially, uh, we do continue with oral steroids after that. And the pulse uh, steroid that we give the six week, the 12 weekly course, we usually, uh, in cases where you have a optic nerve compromise, we would do an IV empty, IV uh, pulse methyl uh, prednisolone, which is a three day course. And we do a surgical decompression only if it has failed after repeating it twice in a two weeks duration. So, uh, yes, we would continue with the, the 12 weekly course after the decompression or an oral steroid, I, whichever the, the the surgeon prefers, but that's about it. Thank you. Okay, so our chief sir has joined, Professor Tityal. We welcome sir to the yeah, workshop. Good, 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 sir, morning good morning to all of you. Sir. Good morning, very nice to see you all of you, uh, bright and uh, looking so good. <laughs> Thank you, sir. <laughs> sir, I'm in good company. <laughs> <laughs> thank, thank you, thank you for uh, you know uh, starting this. Uh, workshop in a uh, right uh, manner. I think that is the uh, one important consideration which uh, we always have to start things in a correct time, in a correct way and the uh, beautiful life surgeries I could see, uh, especially uh, Rasna doing that uh, beautiful dissection of a uh, tumor, uh, subsequently uh, placing that in a paper in a correct direction. I think that was a learning for us also. Like keeping those tumor in the correct direction so, so that our pathology people can do a good assessment of uh, these tumors. To begin with, I think I would definitely like to welcome uh, all of you, especially people who are sitting in the audience or delegates who have joined us today for this very, very uh, attractive, uh, not a workshop, it's actually a CME where we have uh, every component of a teaching. Basic idea of uh, conducting these workshops in RP Center is to uh, transfer the knowledge uh, from uh, experts who are sitting here today, both from the ophthalmoplasty point of view and the uh, ocular oncology point of view. These are two areas where uh, we don't have many, many uh, uh, teaching classes, courses, uh, surgical skill transfer happening in the country. So I would uh, definitely like to congratulate the team uh, headed by Dr. Uh, Professor Mandi Bajaj and uh, Dr. Radhika Tandon, Dr. Bhavna Rachna for uh, conducting uh, this course in a manner which highlights all the important aspects right from the basics to the very, very important surgical areas also. And uh, what I find very interesting in this workshop is you know, so the, uh, uh, Cases which are unusual sometimes, sometimes the surgical uh, classically shown cases uh, would be uh, simple, but they'll give you a lot of uh, surgical tips also. And the discussion is definitely going to be very, very fruitful. I could see uh, participation from the audience uh, in a very, very uh, attractive manner also. And the last part which uh, we're going to have is uh, you know, showing them the various investigative areas because ophthalmoplasty and oncology it's you know does have a very important part of our investigation most of the things are not visible they are hidden uh, either behind the skin or behind the orbit so i think imaging would be a very important aspect for these and uh, i'm definitely uh, pretty sure that uh, there'd be a good uh, discussion on that point again uh, i would definitely like to uh, thank you and sorry that i could not be physically with there i had to come to gwalior i uh, could come back in the night uh, like other people do it the age catches up, you know, you have to take some rest also. But I can see that uh, whatever I, I, I would uh, have a time, I'd like to listen to entire session. i listen to all morning session also. I'll be sitting uh, in the hall, but listening to you people. Thank you, uh, Dr. Bajaj and team. And thank you, Dr. Radhika, Bhavna, Rachna, 
Lomi uh, and uh, Neelam and the young uh, people sitting there. Uh, and wish you all the best. Let's have a very good uh, journey of this uh, workshop on oculoplasty and oncology. Thank you and good day. Okay. Thank you, Professor Tityal. It is really wonderful to have you as a part of the workshop. Even if you couldn't join physically, we are really grateful that you could join in and you're taking so much such a keen interest in all the academic activities as the center at the center and i would like to tell the audience that uh, the kind of positivity that professor tityal has generated amongst the residents and the faculty is unprecedented everybody is now willing willingly doing their work and with created with a lot of happiness so that is a great feeling to have to have the chief of the center guiding everybody and uh, taking so much interest uh, as a token of our appreciation, there is a small uh, um, this <laughs> plantel <laughs> which was uh, there for you, and it will be sent to your office. Thank so you. Thank please you. accept this uh, virtually thank today. <laughs> so, <laughs> and thank you so much for all thank your you, encouragement. Thank, you. thank, thank you. you. Okay, carry on. Thank you. To uh, present this paper to Dr. Bajaj, the head of uh, I think we'll uh, go ahead with the last session uh, that we started. We uh, now have uh, Professor Bhavna Chawla uh, coming for the next uh, 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 presentation. And I'm sure we are all going to relish this, uh, the surgical uh, treat that we are going to have. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you, Rachna. So before I begin with the video, I will, uh, Kusumita, uh, our senior resident, uh, she is going to give a brief overview of the case which was operated upon. Uh, good morning, everyone. I am here to brief about the case which we had operated, the plaque brachy therapy. Uh, the patient was a 15-year-old male presented with chief complaints of diminution of vision in the left eye since three months, not associated with any pain, floaters, or flashes. He had consulted a local hospital wherein he had diagnosed as left eye choroidal mass and was further referred for uh, further evaluation and management. And past history and systemic history was insignificant. On ocular examination, uh, the right eye was within normal limits, whereas in left eye, he had a vision of 1 by 60, which was improving to 6 by 12 parts, uh, with anterior segment being uh, almost normal with a uh, uh, early IMSC cataract. Whereas in fundus examination, the left eye had uh, left eye showed, an, uh, this was the opto-CP of the patient, which showed an elevated doom-shaped mass arising from the choroid involving the macular area with overlying orangish pigments as uh, represented by the arrow. And this was the ultrasonography of the posterior segment, which showed an hyperechoic doom-shaped mass in the uh, intraocular mass with a high amplitude spike at the apex followed by moderate amplitude spike, suggestive of a positive kappa sign, with an apical thickness of 3.9 mm and largest basal diameter of 10.2 mm. On fundus autofluorescence, clumps of hyperautofluorescence was noted, co correlating with the orangish pigments. Uh, fundus fluorescein angiography was conducted, which showed patchy fluorescence in the early phase and staining and leakage in the late phase. ICGA was done, which showed hypofluorescence in the early phase with mild hyperfluorescence in the late phase. This was the OCT image of the left eye, which shows the, uh, the similar picture of dome-shaped elevation with subretinal fluid with choroidal shadowing and loss of photoreceptors. The MRI of the uh, patient uh, showed uh, the T1-weighted image, which showed an uh, Hyperintense lesion in the left, lobe, left globe intraocularly. On T2, it showed an hypointense globe suggestive of melanoma. So, FDG PET scan was done to rule out other distinct metastasis, and there was no signs, uh, there was no uh, distinct metastasis, it was limited within the globe. 
So the uh, diagnosis was left eye choroidal melanoma, medium sized as per con study with early IMSC. And we had planned left eye black brachytherapy under local anesthesia. And the further uh, video will be discussed by Professor Bhavna Ma'am. All right, so uh, this is a brief video uh, to show you how the procedure was done. So this is the plaque brachytherapy facility that was started five years ago here at RP Center. And uh, we have a separate OT dedicated for this because of radioactive regulatory controls. This is the place where the plaques are especially kept over in the OT. And uh, this is all under the supervision of the radiation safety officer. We have a team uh, that comprises of a radiation physicist, a radiation oncologist, and our surgeons here. This is to show you how dosimetry planning was done in this particular patient. And this is the software that is used. And this is, again, the autoclave where the plaque is actually sterilized. So this is a brief view of, you know, the brachytherapy OT that we have in RP Center. And uh, as I mentioned to you, because it's a radioactive area, so that is why the patient has to be kept in isolation as long as the plaque is uh, in C2. So this is the particular patient that was just described, uh, and uh, he is now going to be anesthetized. And then uh, this is because it's a choroidal melanoma, we can do this procedure under local anesthesia. So a peribulbar injection is given the way we give for local cases. And uh, then um, after that, uh, just before we begin the surgery, we confirm the eye, we do an indirect ophthalmoscopy to uh, confirm the characteristics of the tumor that we are treating. Uh, it is important to see both the eyes, make sure that we are treating the correct eye. A preoperative ultrasound is also repeated in the OT, um, again, just to confirm that everything is in order. So here you can see the B scan image of the mass, and this is how the, the, um, the OT uh, tray is laid out, all the instruments, everything that is used for plaque brachytherapy. This is the plaque. So uh, we have two plaques. Uh, one is a dummy plaque, and one is the actual radioactive plaque. So here you can see that the surgery is going to begin. And if you recall, then this patient had a choroidal melanoma that was in the temporal area. So in this particular case, we'll have to go through the temporal area. You can see over here, the lateral rectus being hooked and these uh, vicral sutures being passed to, to it. So depending upon the location of the tumor, we have to determine the axis. Uh, so in this case, because it is temporal, uh, we will have to disinsert the lateral rectus temporarily to be able to complete the surgery. So that is what we have done, but it's very important to keep track of the muscle because we have to reattach it later on. So this is how we insert the dummy plug first. The dummy plug, the whole purpose is that you insert it and you localize it and you see exactly where it is. Repeat it, confirm it with the ultrasound. Over here, you can see the shadowing. It's lying exactly over the tumor. So once you know that the dummy plug is in position, you just make the marks onto the sclera and then you can remove the dummy plug. Those marks are there. You pa pass pre-placed sutures. These are 5-0 ethibon sutures that are going through the partial thickness of the sclera. So these sutures will remain in place and that this is what we are going to anchor the radioactive plaque with. So once we know that these sutures have been placed, both, so here you can see the plaque has two uh, eyelets, one superior and one inferior. So therefore to fix it, we need to put two sutures, one in the, in this case, it's the superior and the inferior part. And this is now the actual radioactive plaque going right inside the place where it is designed to be. 
the sutures are now being tied over here so we have to make sure that it is firmly anchored it should not slip because it is very important for the plaque to be in the position that it is uh, meant to be so these are uh, again suturing both the superior and the inferior areas and then after that uh, we just have to close the conjunctiva uh, but before that if you remember that in this particular case uh, we have you know sort of used a hangback technique for the lateral rectus muscle so uh, we will have to uh, uh, pass these sutures here and make sure that we don't lose the muscle and the second step of the surgery when we are going to remove the plaque we'll have to pull those sutures back so that the muscle can be reinserted back to its original position so uh, this is the first step of the surgery and as i mentioned to you the software determines depending upon the thickness and the uh, the um, you know, width of the tumor the software determines for how long the plaque has to remain in c2 so like for this patient it was say about 16 hours so we plan this uh, plaque removal after 16 hours in this particular patient so that can vary it is different for retinoblastoma it is different for choroidal melanoma it is different for ossn like you know plaque brachytherapy can be used for a variety of indications so all that has to be calculated in advance and it is important that for that period of time the patient stays in isolation so for that a separate room that has you know the required regulatory approval uh, from BARC, which is actually monitoring the whole procedure from here. Uh, they have provided the approval for that room. So the patient will remain isolated for that much time. So here you can see the conjunctiva is just being closed after the surgery is over. And uh, so this essentially completes uh, step one of the procedure. Now, stage two would be actually removing the plaque. So for that here, we are just giving our subconjunctival injections at the end of the surgery. And uh, then because as you remember, this was under local anesthesia. So the patient can be shifted back into the room where he stays in isolation. So this is the um, area where now the patient will remain in isolation till the step two, that the, the plaque is removed. So this is a, a plaque removal uh, step. And over here, we can see that uh, we're just cutting off those sutures where we had sutured the anchor Diver so that we can gain access to the plaque and uh, in this particular case uh, we will just be removing the plaque uh, cutting off those vicral sutures that had anchored it to the sclera and it is very important to be very quick with this procedure because you know as long as we are handling this it is radioactive material and whoever is in the OT whether it is the surgeon or it is uh, uh, the nurse and uh, everyone else in the OT is having exposure to this radioactive material so that is uh, the thing that we have to be very efficient about this procedure procedure immediately pull it out uh, of the eye and then it goes back into the box where it is meant to be and this is also one of the reasons why we initially use a dummy plug so that the duration of radioactive exposure is reduced not just to the patient but also to us and uh, then this is you know like i mentioned so not in all cases we have to uh, remove the muscle or we have to disinsert the muscle it completely depends on the location of the plug sometimes uh, of the tumor sometimes it, if it is so, sort of inferotemporal inferonasal then you can just go between the two muscles so that makes the procedure simpler but in this particular case we had to um, handle the muscle as well so once that is again sutured back into position we just close the conjunctiva and uh, that's about it uh, once this is done then the patient is uh, ready to go back home and then the, of course uh, follow-up is very important like in every other case so we keep the patient for about 24 to 48 hours just to observe and monitor and uh, then once the patient is comfortable he is sent home and then kept under regular follow-up we normally our protocol is we first follow them up after a week so this is the team i want to acknowledge everybody who has been um, you know, helping with this program and who's been very supportive and uh, uh, if anybody has any questions i'm happy to take so we're joined by our unit in chief professor radhika ma'am welcome ma'am thank you so she's been a great support for our ocular oncology program and uh, we're very happy to have ma'am here and also professor seema sain who's in charge of the uh, ocular pathology department welcome ma'am Thank you for joining us. If there are any questions, I'm happy to take them. Ma'am, does it have any effect on 
does it have any uh, bad effect on the ocular surface also i mean in that duration no so this is a ruthenium plaque yeah i mean i wanted to uh, also delve a little bit upon the kind of plaques we have and how they work so we have two types of plaques essentially iodine and ruthenium what we are using here is ruthenium and it doesn't uh, doesn't have you know much harm on the ocular surface uh, most of the times the complications are either radiation induced retinopathy or optic neuropathy or cataracts that are the more common complications but of course if you if sometimes for ocular surface squamous neoplasia if you're using the plaque and suturing it and a part of the cornea is being covered then there can be corneal erosions and you know a little bit of corneal toxicity i have a request not a question for us uh, the uh, practitioners what are the modalities you have created for the referral of these patients so that they can be managed in a proper manner means how can we refer patients for these specialized procedures so uh, we are getting it referrals. is a, yeah so uh, you just kind of uh, advise refer them. to rpc yeah that's it <laughs> as simple as like, that like like retinoblastoma clinics yeah. are there yeah they have to go through all these they have to first go to come to the opd and then from there you automatically will take care so all these uh, patients they are treated on priority there is no waiting as soon as the patient comes to the opd he's seen immediately in the clinic so if for that is some helpline available helpline number or we something specific helpline for oncology yes but uh, we do have a like i mean the casualty is always there 24 7. we have a helpline for casualty and anybody can contact the casualty be it oncology or be it any patient and get immediate help and if there's anything else beyond that another request also i in fact made last time to professor bajaj for uh, histopathologies from uh, from the practice sector how can we send samples for the histopathologies so, is there some something you can uh, dr sen uh, if they come first i think i guess they will have first to come to us and then we will request a review of that slide, isn't it? Yeah, I view it's for to send the samples. The sample directly. Primary samples, yes. Mm -hmm. So even a even a surgery outside done outside, can we accept the sample for? Uh, if it comes from... through the uh, ocular oncology surgeon, okay, like they can refer to Dr. Bajaj or uh, Dr. Uh, Rachna, whatever. Yeah. So, so then, even a fresh sample can be accepted by our pathology section. Yes, yes, no problem. All right, because usually we get the blocks reviewed and all. Right? right. Mostly we get the slides and the blocks. Yeah. But uh, once in, matlab, there is no, uh, I think there is no uh, this thing. Problem if even if you can send samples, but so they, they should, should send it in formalin. Uh, yeah, yeah. Should have it preserved in formalin. formalin. Yeah. So we send a relative of a patient with the sample to the OPD. Then they no, can... no, no. For the for registration, I think uh, with the onc onc ocular oncology people will need to see because yeah, the proper is... form has to be filled up with all the details. Yeah, that is what I wanted to ask. So you is can't. There a, is there some bypass to that? Because suppose I have operated a patient at some place. Fine, and just I want to send a sample to your department. No, if that uh, particular hospital has got a pathology set up, we don't have. That is what I was asking. None at all. Hmm. None at all. No, no, we have, but uh, no, no, we don't have it at, at many places because I we operate at many many places like our setup in some. Uh, so you're from places. Delhi? Yes. So there are um, many technicians here in the private setup who are uh, processing samples and making blocks. So is, that is the easier way you are that saying. Will that will be better. The, we, we, the time we, will be saved. Yeah, we make the blocks yeah. and then send the blocks yeah, to yeah. you. Okay. Yeah, because usually when patients are operated outside, sometimes they have a histopathology report with them and we want to get the histopathology reviewed. We see them in the clinic. Of course, they come through the OPD and through the UHID and everything. So then we specifically, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, get in touch with the, the parent uh, hospital or institute and request them for blocks or slides, whatever is available. And then we can get them reviewed by our department. Oh, that is also one thing that we have been following in our clinics. 
but uh, sometimes those blocks and you know patient has come from very far sometimes those blocks and slides are not available or they are in a damaged state where you know the not much information can be available on pathology so that is sometimes a limitation thank, thank you. you thank you thank you yeah, yeah uh, dr bajaj can you hear me yes, sir. hello hello think, yes yeah yeah in in general the policy in aims for in uh, recent years changed because in the past there have been so many uh, referrals for a uh, uh, examining the pathological slides in the main department now those requests are not being taken in it is only for those patients who are treated at, at aims and their slide can be reviewed if they have the block for a, in general request for a people getting treated outside as a just a secondary opinion uh, aims now does not allow that part okay but in the rp center uh, I, i'm not sure how much load in the pathology department if they can help, uh, we can consider that. But in the main names now, no longer we take uh, such uh, you know requests. Right, because they were helping us with the review of the blocks, but this yeah. request which has come is different. He is saying that uh, even a fresh sample they want to get it uh, reported by us, which is uh, a bit uh, that, unusual. That will, that will not be possible. Yes, because it has to be a patient who either being treated in names or now subsequently referred for a treatment. Yeah, and you want to re review the pathological process, then that can be done. So it will be better if they get it processed somewhere, reported, and then send it for a review to us. Uh, that uh, can, I think RP Center can do it because right. I don't think we have that amount of load as such. Okay, that's that a good Seema, idea. Seema can tell better in this yeah. regard. Right, thank yeah. you. Yeah. Uh, okay, I think that was a very important discussion and oncology is always difficult to practice in a non-institutional setup. So um, I, with that, I now invite our next speaker, Dr. Parag. He's a bright, talented, upcoming oculoplastic surgeon, and uh, he's going to be presenting uh, a surgery that we are all are always keen to have a look at, lateral orbitotomy. And over to you, Parag. Uh, good, good afternoon, everyone. So uh, my name is Parag Tyagi. I will be presenting a uh, technique of lateral orbitotomy. So a little bit of introduction about it. Uh, it is a surgical technique to approach, approach lateral orbit that involves creation of a lateral bone flap. Uh, indications are mainly lesions in the region of the lacrimal gland fossa, which are extending uh, posteriorly, and lesions of intraconal space, which are not palpable and which are uh, uh, lateral to the optic nerve. So. Uh, Several skin incisions have been defined for approaching lateral orbit. Uh, some of the older ones are Crowley incision, who first uh, uh, performed lateral orbit in 1888. Subsequently, the skin incisions were modified from vertical to a horizontal one by, by Burkis. And later, the incisions were modified to uh, use of uh, eyelid crease incisions. and. Uh, Currently, the most commonly used one is the modified stellarite incision, which is shown in the slide with the red color. So, uh, coming to the uh, surgical uh, case, brief summary of the patient. He was a 30-year-old uh, male patient who presented with axial proptosis for past three years, which was slowly progressive and diminution of vision for past six months. As we can see on the MRI, MRI imaging also, uh, there is a heterogeneous contrast enhancement and a well-defined intraconal space occupying lesion is there and optic nerve is seen being pushed medially. Coming to the surgical procedure. So as you can see, uh, GB paint mark is done to, uh, marking is done uh, for the modified celluloid incision. Uh, stay sutures are passed to the upper lid. Uh, Globe protection ring is placed. A 15 number blade is used to uh, uh, place the skin incision along the markings. Followed which uh, suborbicular dissection is done to expose the lateral orbital rim. Once the rim is exposed, the peri uh, uh, incision is given over the periosteum. 
and followed which periosteum is elevated both anteriorly and posteriorly incision of the periosteum can be extended so for creating the osteotomy Uh, so for create, creating the osteotomy markings land uh, the landmarks are the uh, superiorly it is the frontozygomatic suture and inferiorly uh, it is just short of the uh, ar zygomatic arch so as we can see this is the uh, lower boundary of the uh, proposed os osteotomy which we will be, we will be creating and this is the frontozygomatic suture so our osteotomy will lie between these two landmarks this is the periosteum is being lifted posteriorly uh, to separate the temporalis muscle as well uh, anteriorly lateral canthotomy is being performed so once the markings are done along the uh, landmarks Uh, oscillating bone saw is used to uh, initiate the osteotomy so while performing the osteotomy uh, continuous irrigation and aspiration is to be done so that there is no uh, heat necrosis of the bone uh, followed which a ronger is used to uh, hold the bony fragment and uh, it is removed uh, now the traction suturing is being placed in the lateral lactus muscle which will guide us in uh, when we tuck the lateral lactus muscle we can uh, uh, approximate its location and thus prevent its injury now the periosteum is being opened in t shape fashion the long arm of the t is usually along the border of the lateral lactus muscle so once the periosteum is opened uh, the tumor can be palpated with the fingertip and blunt dissection is done to expose the tumor so as we can see once the periosteum is removed and uh, this is the lateral rectus muscle is being hooked and pushed inferiorly to uh, aid in better exposure of the tumor so once we have exposed the tumor a cryo probe would be used to uh, hold the tumor mass and a gentle traction would be placed so now the cryo probe is being used to hold the tumor mass a gentle sideways move motion is done and a gentle traction is to be placed and usually tumor comes out in toto once the tumor will be out uh the uh, bony fragment which was removed is reposited back and is placed in position and fixated with titanium plate and screws and as we can see the now we are we have replaced the uh, removed fragment and now we are checking its final position manual screw driver with a titanium screw will be used to uh fixate this bony fragment in position so once the uh, fragment is placed in position then closure is done in layers
uh, initial uh, subcutaneous tissue uh, orbicularis is closed with 60 vicral and skin is closed with 60 silk. So this is the post-op one week clinical picture of the patient. Uh, patient had a good vision post-op. Uh, so points to remember when we are doing uh, a lateral orbitotomy. One is to identify the correct cases. Traditionally, all the lesions which are lateral to the optic nerve are better approached with lateral orbitotomy. And uh, the modified stellar right incision which we give uh, it should not be extended beyond 2.4 centimeters from the lateral canthus to avoid injury to the branches of the facial nerve. And the rim of the bony orbit should be uh, reconstructed whenever possible for better cosmesis. And uh, retraction uh, should be uh, avoid released periodically when performing the surgery to avoid ischemic damage to the optic nerve. And uh, while opening the periorbita, uh, care should be taken not to damage the lateral lactus muscle. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, Dr. Parag. You have very nicely uh, shown all the steps of uh, lateral orbitotomy. So, um, uh, in whenever you are dealing with the orbit, there are certain uh, crucial decisions that you have to make regarding the approach, which will depend on the size and the location of the tumor. So, uh, first of all, you have to decide which type of orbitotomy you want to do, whether anterior, lateral, or inferior orbitotomy. Uh, then, whether you want to go to go transcutaneous or transconjunctival. And after that, whether you want to go transseptal or subperiosteal. So, all these decision, the decision making is more important than the surgery. It's the surgery is also important, but once your plan of action is clearly demarcated the the less chances of having any problems during the surgery so like uh, you know the planning is half the battle already won so these things are very crucial and they will all depend on the clinical presentation the imaging findings and the type of tumor that we are dealing with so i won't go into the nitty gritty of that but i'm broadly speaking i'm saying that these are the uh, in mentally uh, in your planning the decisions that you have to make and you can uh, decide according to uh, the presentation and the imaging of that in that patient. Any other questions that uh, anybody wants to ask? Can I add on with your permission, please? Yeah. Uh, during the surgery, we always keep on assessing, seeing the pupils. Fine. And in post-operative period also, Virtually after every two to three hours, we open the pack patch and see the pupil reaction and see if there is any hematoma formation. And if it is there, then drain it before we lose the optic nerve. Thank you. The important point, and uh, even when I'm operating, I keep telling my uh, SR who is assisting me, okay, keep have a look at the pupil because especially when you're going a little more posteriorly, uh, rather it's better to leave a part of a benign tumor at the apex rather than go and take out the entire thing and have the chance of vision loss and fe feeling very happy about it that you have a, a non proptosed blind eye it's better to have a slightly proptosed eye but a seeing eye so because the function is the main thing that is there you're not dealing with just taking rid of getting rid of the proptosis so absolutely dr mongre your uh, suggestion is well taken thank you Thank you, Parag. We now go on to our next speaker. Again, a very young and talented and dynamic Dr. Asmita, and she will be talking about essentials in managing eyelid malposition, ectropion and intropion. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'll be discussing with the assistance of some videos the essentials of uh, managing eyelid malpositions. So coming basically first to intropion, which is uh, an inward turning of the eyelid margin. It is classified as involutional, congenital, cicatricial, and spastic. 
So uh, going to the upper lid entropion, which is mainly seen in secretorial cases, in cases of SJS, OCP, or in cases of trachoma, it can be classified as minimal, moderate, or severe. So in minimal, uh, what basically we have is a lash globe contact seen on upcase along with an apparent migration of meibomian gland. Moderate entropion is there when we have a lash globe contact in primary position along with the lid retraction. In severe entropion, we also have some distortion of the lid along with metaplastic lashes. This is important to know because I'll be discussing based on this classification only how we manage the cases. So our surgery is decided based on the classification. First, if we have a minimal uh, entropion, what we usually do is re we reposition the anterior lamella and we can augment the effect by uh, providing a lid split at the gray line. This is the surgery that we usually do. In moderate cases, along with this, we can combine a tarsal wedge resection and we can also advance the posterior lamella. So this is the diagram of a tarsal wedge resection combined with anterior lamella repositioning. And in this image, we can see that the posterior lamella has been advanced. What do we do in severe cases is that we have to rotate the terminal tarsal conjunctiva, which has the keratinized margin and the uh, metaplastic lashes, which can be done with the help of a tarsal fracture. Also, we can use a posterior lamella graft to lengthen the posterior lamella. So this is what we do. We do a tarsal fracture and this uh, terminal segment is rotated or we can use a, a membrane graft, mucous membrane or an auricular cartilage graft to lengthen the posterior lamella. Now moving on to the surgery. First, I'll be discussing anterior lamella repositioning. I have shown with the diagram what we usually do. Basically, I'll be uh, splitting the uh, lid at the lid crease, separating the orbicular skin uh, uh, muscle uh, layer from the posterior lamella. And then I will be repositioning the anterior lash line higher up on the tarsus. Looking at the surgical video, first we begin by providing the traction sutures. Cotton sutures are used to provide traction on the lid. Subsequently, I'll be splitting the lid at the lid crease. Then I will be splitting the uh, layers and uh, exposing the tarsus. And at a higher level at the tarsus, I'll be providing horizontal mattress sutures, which will be passed through the tarsus, ensuring that they don't penetrate the conjunctiva, and then they will be passed uh, anterior to the anterior lash line. And these mattress sutures will reposition the anterior lamella at a higher position. After checking the effect, two or three more sutures are passed and then the skin is closed. Moving on to tarsal fracture with rotation. In this case, what we do is basically we will be providing an incision full thickness uh, splitting the tarsus 2 to 3 mm anterior to the meibomian gland opening. This will be the sulcus subtarsalis. And after that, I would be passing sutures from the uh, proximal segment of the tarsus and I would be taking them out over the anterior lash line. And this would help in uh, providing rotation of this terminal segment of the tarsus. So looking at the surgical video, after providing the traction sutures, this full thickness incision is given over the tarsus. Now the tarsus has been exposed. We are passing horizontal mattress sutures from the proximal segment of the tarsus and taking them out over the anterior lash line. And as many uh, uh, mattress sutures as required to rotate the terminal segment. Then there is a lower lid entropion in which mainly the cause is in an involution. In involution, the main path problems that need to be addressed is that there is an overriding of the preceptal muscle, which becomes overactive and hypertrophic which can be addressed using a vase procedure or a wicket procedure. Another patho pathology that can be found is a horizontal lid laxity, which can be addressed by horizontal lid shortening. Another pathology can be a disinsertion of the lower eyelid retractors, which can be handled with Jones plication of lid retractors, or they can be atrophic changes in the tarsus, which can be uh, corrected by posterior lamellar reconstruction using a hard palate graft or a mucous membrane graft. So basically, we have to see which uh, particular problem that a particular patient is having, and then we have to proceed with the surgical planning accordingly. Showing the procedure, a uh, vase procedure in which basically what we do is we provide a transverse lid split which creates a fibrous barrier which prevents the preceptal muscle from overriding over the pretarsal muscle. In addition, we provide uh, everting sutures as we can see in this image. And these everting sutures uh, transfer the pull of the retractors to the lash line and help in everting the lower lid. Looking at the surgical video. So, I'll be, uh, so we make a, a surgical mark 4, 4 mm below the lower lid margin to avoid damaging the tarsus. Then using a lid guard to protect the cornea while we are making the incision. Then we are making a full, a full thickness incision in the lower eyelid. Take, making sure that the incision is at the same level at the, uh, at the skin and as well as at the conjunctiva. The incision can be uh, 
increased in a size using West Quad scissors if need be. Then after identifying the lower eyelid retractors, the sutures are passed and anterior to the lash line and transfer uh, the pull to the lash line causing eversion. So there would be a fibrous scar which would prevent uh, overriding of the preceptal fibers and there would be a uh, suture which would evert the lower lid by transferring the pull of the retractors to the lash margin. Then moving on to Jones procedure, what I discussed previously also that there can be a, a disinsertion or a laxity of the lower retractors which can be tightened using a Jones procedure in which we uh, pass a suture which will uh, plicate the lower lid retractors. So moving on to the surgical video, after making the same, uh, same uh, cotton sutures and using a, a, a lid splitting incision to split the pre-tarsal and the pre uh, septal orbicularis muscle. After that, we'll be dissecting the orbital septum. After creating an opening in the orbital septum, we identify the lower lid retractors. We can confirm the presence of lower lid retractors by asking the patient to look down or look up and we can see the movement of retractors along with the movement of the eye. And after passing a suture through the retractors, we pass the suture through the lower border of tarsus and then we uh, pass a horizontal mattress suture um, to, I'm sorry, to uh, plicate the lower lid retractors and then we can close the skin. Moving on a little bit about ectropion due to the shortage of time, I'll just be discussing one surgery. Um, sorry for the inconvenience. Uh, ectropion is mainly an outward turning of the eyelid margin. I'll be discussing involutional ectropion. Again, we have to address the main pathology at work. Either it is horizontal eyelid laxity or it is lamellar dissociation or a retractor disinsertion. So accordingly, we have to plan our surgery. I'll be showing a surgery of lazy T procedure which corrects the medial ectropion with horizontal laxity. Basically, what we do is that we do a pentagon excision to excise the lower uh, horizontal laxity and we do a tars uh, tarsoconjunctival diamond excision and we tighten the retractors along with shortening of the posterior lamella which corrects the medial ectropion. So, moving to the surgical video, we mark an uh, incision 4 mm from the lower functor with a scalpel, I make an incision and then we check how much is the horizontal lid laxity. The extra tissue can then be excised in a pentagon fashion. Subsequently, a, tarso, a diamond shaped tarso conjunctival incision is made and the tissue is excised. And afterwards, we'll be passing a suture, making sure to include the retractors in it. This will help in shortening the retractors and along with inversion of the punctum. When this diamond shape uh, uh, incision is closed and sutures are brought out through the skin and then this horizontal defect that we have closed is also closed. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Asmita. I think we'll take questions at the end of the session. We are running slightly short on time and I encourage everyone to stay put to the timing of their presentation. So we now have uh, Dr. Prithvi, and he will be talking about use of Botox in oculoplasty. Hello. Good morning, respected faculty, my delegates and my dear colleagues. Today I'm going to talk about Botox, uh, use of Botox, botulinum toxin in uh, oculoplasty. Uh, coming to overview of it, uh, it's extracted, toxin is extracted from a bacterium called uh, Clostridium botulinum. It, uh, it can cause the placid paralysis. The toxic dose is way higher than the dose watch, what we use. Currently. The mechanism of action is uh, botulinum toxin uh, splits uh, or uh, denatures this snare proteins, which will be uh, useful for the vesicles to bound to the membrane of the uh, cholinergic uh, terminal uh, uh, axon, where it 
it will help for releasing of the neurotransmitter which will act on the acetylcholine receptors to cause contraction because of the uh, destruction of the snare proteins by the toxin this uh, transmitter will not be released and cause paralysis uh, toxin a will uh, cleave the snap 25 and also uh, toxin b will uh, cleave uh, synapse to brevin the effect will start uh, within uh, 24 to 48 hours will peaks by 14 days it lasts for three months uh, we can check for the action of the buttox by two weeks it's not if it is not responding we can repeat the toxin and uh, recovery occurs by spotting of new terminal axons and the study uh, found that subcutaneous injection is as effective as intramuscular injection and because less pain reconstitution of buttox uh, uh, it, it, it comes in a vial with uh, 100 units which is reconstituted uh, in a preservative free sign which can be kept in uh, refrigerator, refrigerator and can be used up to four hours it should be stored in minus five degrees Celsius. If it is uh, reconstituted in uh, preserve, preservative saline, it can be it can prolong the shelf life. Uh, this is a video showing the reconstitution where it which should be reconstituted with the uh, with the without any uh, turbid motion. So saline which is injected uh, with the uh, vacuum and suction pressure which is uh, they already there in the vial, and it should mix with the swelling motion without any uh, turbulence. Clinical application is mainly for the essential blepharospasm spasm and uh, hemifacial spasm, uh, wrinkles of the face. Uh, it was actually first demonstrated in strabismus. It can be used for lead retraction caused by TED, uh, myoclonic disorder, and also EB4. Uh, we can use lacrimal buttocks for EB4. EB4. Uh, this is to describe that uh, the corrugator muscle, uh, the glabular muscle is mainly the corrugator, which is placed deep in the inside the frontalis. Here, we have to block this. We have to inject the uh, buttocks deeper to the frontalis. Laterally, this muscle becomes superiorly. Uh, when also, when in, uh, injecting the botulinum toxin, frontalis muscle should be blocked at least uh, one finger above the area and also one finger below the ear line, mainly to prevent the ptosis over here and also the resistance of the ear line posteriorly. And, uh, for the for the blepharospasm, we need to inject over the uh, uh, pretarsal orbitalis or the medial and the lateral aspect, and inferiorly we need to avoid over the medial aspect. That will uh, cause the lacrimal pump failure. Also, it can diffuse into in, uh, inferior oblique and cause motor, ocular motility disturbance. Uh, there is a nasalis muscle over here, which can uh, which can cause uh, 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 folds over here, which can be blocked by giving injections over here. This is to describe the vector force of the muscles on the face. Our uh, frontalis will, pull, will be pulling the vector above, and the orbitalis will be pulling it down, and labral muscle will be pulling it medially. If you give the injection over the close to, frontalis close to the brow area, it can cause a drooping of the brow, which can be cosmetically uh, affecting the patient. A contraindication mainly with the patient with allergy, infection, pregnancy. Complications are asymmetric block, ptosis, or lack of tunnel because of orbicularis weakness and developing the extracular muscle involvement. This video is to show the aesthetic use of the Botox. You can see a 53 year old male patient with the furrow lines because of glabular muscle hyperactivity, bunny lines because of nasalis muscle hyperactivity, profit because of orbicularis hyperactivity. These are the uh, extension of the corrugator muscle, the laterally it, it, it becomes superficial and procerous muscle in the center. This is a point for the procerous muscle injection. This is a point for uh, corrugator injection. So, after uh, cleaning with uh, isopropyl alcohol, we can inject up to 2.5 to 5 units of botulinum toxin or with the diameter of around uh, 10 mm, which will act. Or for around uh, two centimeter areas surrounding it by diffusion. This is for the crow feet. There are three points it's been injected in between the uh, creases. We can see the uh, after injection in the subcutaneous area, we can see the bulging which, which, which occurs. These are the forehead horizontal lines because of frontalis overaction. 
it should be given at least one finger breadth above the uh, bro area to prevent uh, drooping of the bro Where, wherever the action the hyperactivity is there we can inject over there this is to show about uh, use of botox in blepharospasm this 68 year old female lady comes with bilateral blepharospasm essential properly and uh, which is disturbing her psychologically and so obscuring, uh, obscuring her vision usually uh, described is we can give lateral and medially also in, internally in the two points in uh, in blepharospasm it also uh, affects the glabular muscles so we have to block also procerus and uh, corrugator and also propate this video is showing a uh, user botox in the epi fora This patient presented with proximal canicular block under uh, proparacaine, like palpable lobe of the gland was exposed. Botulinum toxin A was injected around uh, 2.5 units. This is a patient comes with uh, late retraction because of TED. Uh, the video is showing the uh, Botox insertion in the injection into the LPS. If the upper lid is averted. Under pro paracaine, 0.5%. Conjectiva is held and injection was given subconjectively. at the superior border of the tarsus. Thank you. Sir, if time permits, can I add on? And if you permit. Do we have time? Yeah, please uh, go on. And Renalini, you In can uh, just upload your There are more applications of uh, botulinum in oculoplasty. Uh, one you have already said for uh, essential blepharospasm, hemifacial spasms, epiphora, and uh, thyroid eye disease lit retraction. More can be uh, for dry eyes. It acts as a medical um, punctum plugs when you inject just one unit in the lower, uh, around the lower punctum. Fine. Then, uh, uh, of course, in intractable corneal ulcers, neurotropic ulcers, you can always give Botox in the LPS to induce a temporary ptosis to help in the healing. Then actually also as a substitute to lateral tarsorephy, you can inject uh, it in LPS to induce the ptosis. These are a few more indications of Botox. Thank you. Uh, and uh, we go on to our next speaker, Dr. Mrinalini. She will be uh, presenting the tricks uh, of the trade in mastering enucleation, a very important surgery for intraocular tumors like melanoma and retinoblastoma. Over to you, Mrinalini. Uh, good morning, everyone. Okay, uh, so I'll start with enucleation. Enucleation is the removal of the entire growth while preserving the remaining adnexal and orbital tissues. The primary indications for enucleations are intraocular malignancies, like Ma mentioned, retinoblastoma and melanoma, uh, or in a blind, painful eye, uh, a deformed eye where you cannot rule out an intraocular tumor. That will also be an indication for enucleation. Historically, it was considered for severely traumatized eyes with extensive prolapse of uveal tissue, but this is no longer an indication. Going to the next one. Uh, the surgical techniques, uh, 
um, I'm going to talk about is the imbrication technique, the integrated implant technique, and the myoconjunctival technique, which I'm going to show you a video of. So previously, imbrication technique was done where the superior rectus was imbricated with the inferior rectus and the medial with the lateral one. And the implant use was a PMMA or a silicon implant. Uh, the main complications were because you're directly placing the muscle over the implant, uh, the centration uh, used to be sometimes not as good and implant displacement and migration used to happen. Also, the motility, because you're placing the muscle not at their anatomical site and you're stretching it, the motility was not as good. Then integrated implant technique, muscles are directly sutured to a hydroxy appetite. You place a scleral shell or a mesh around the implant and the muscles are placed corresponding to their muscle insertion. So the, mot the implant motility was good in this, but it was very expensive. And also uh, there is a complication of persistent infection and implant exposure. Myoconjunctival technique, which uh, we are going to show a video of, in which the rectiles are sutured just short of the fornices. And uh, this gives a good implant motility as the patient, as the muscles contract, there is a, a shortening and deepening of the fornices, which is transmitted to the uh, prosthesis. And the implant motility is comparable to what you get in an integrated implant technique. And this is also cheaper. Uh, so, in enucleation, implant size is very important because uh, for the prosthesis and for the appearance, you have to replace the orbital volume correctly. And around 70 to 80 percent of the volume is replaced by the prosthesis, uh, by the implant, and the remaining 20 to 30 percent by the prosthesis. Uh, implants we'll be discussing in the afternoon. So broadly, there are integrated and non-integrated implants, non-integrated like silicon and PMMA and integrated like hydroxyapatite and porous polyethylene. Okay, let's begin the video. So first, uh, you do a 360 degree conjunctival peritomy with a Westcott scissor. After the peritomy is complete, you dissect the subtenons in all the quadrants. Then you have to identify and hook all the recti. So here we've hooked the recti and we are going to pass a vicral suture through it and then release the recti. Similarly, for the remaining recti, we will hook, brittle, and cut the recti from the insertion. For the obliques, we pass the hooks uh, We pass two hooks, we identify and we sweep the globe from posterior to anterior. We catch hold of the obliques and release them. We pass two muscle hooks, we uh, sweep the globe, we found the inferior oblique uh, and we are going to release it without passing a suture. But uh, after releasing all the recti, we are going to prolapse the globe with the help of an enucleation scoop. And then you have to pass the enucleation scissor and uh, move it along the optic nerve and go as deep as possible. Because optic nerve length, uh, the amount you cut is important in uh, retinoblastoma cases. 
and after you release it you have to pass an adrenaline soaked gauze and put uh, tamponade for five minutes now we are going to put the implant and close close it in layers after removing the tamponade we are going to close the posterior tenons first We are closing the posterior tenons here with vicro sutures. You can place interrupted sutures. Now we are dissecting the anterior tenons from the conjunctiva. After freely dissecting it, you can close the anterior tenons again with interrupted sutures. And finally, the conjunctiva is closed. Closed in, uh, then we place a conformer and do a temporary tarsiraphy, which will be taken out after six weeks. Um, important complications intraoperatively first, you have to make sure you're operating the correct eye. So, uh, EUA should be done before the surgery, and you should be careful while dissecting the tenons that uh, extraocular muscles should not be lost because they will be giving uh, motility to the implant. Hemorrhage, you should make sure that proper tamponade is given. And postoperative early complications can again be infection or a conformer extrusion and late can be a contracted socket or implant exposure and wound dehiscence. Thank you. Okay, all right, Asmita. I uh, we uh, just happened to notice that we did not show the uh, the pa passage of uh, the thing through the fornix. Yes, but uh, so that the sutures that were passed through the muscle had to be passed through the conjunctival fornix uh, in the myoconjunctival technique. But obviously, I think she was wanting to show the uh, the prolapse of the globe and the technique that we use to cut the optic now without the need for stay sutures through the muscles. So uh, that uh, was also an important step. So anyways, uh, let's uh, go on to our next presenter. We now have Dr. Asmita, and uh, she will now be presenting uh, a very important surgery, decoding DAC cryocystorhinostomy. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Okay, so I'll be discussing an important surgery that we frequently uh, see in oculoplasty procedures. Uh, that's on. Okay, decoding uh, DAC cryocystorhinostomy. So basically, an external DCR creates a passage between the mucosa of the lacrimal sac and the nasal mucosa in the middle meatus. So uh, first we begin with what we'll be doing in the preoperative workup. One of the important things is to check the blood pressure to decrease bleeding during the intraoperative time. ENT evaluation is done to rule out any atrophic rhinitis or any other nasal abnormalities and we check the bleeding and clotting time. Preoperatively, we provide the patient with nasal decongestants. We started two to three days prior to uh, decongest the nasal mucosa. Positioning is also important that the patient should be comfortably supine and we raise the head by about 10 to 20 degrees. That also helps in decreasing the bleeding during our procedure and we have adequate elimination. We do nasal packing with uh, lignocaine in the ipsilateral nostril. Uh, the important thing that we have to keep in mind is uh, that the uh, pack should be inserted with the help of forceps in the direction of a medial papilar ligament, basically superiorly and posteriorly. We should avoid that a nasal pack ends up in the uh, inferior cavity of the nose and it should be in the proper position. This will also help in providing additional nasal anesthesia and also mucosal constriction to the middle meatus. This is the trolley that we prepare for our DCR procedures. The instruments will be taken up in the second half of our uh, today's session. 
anesthesia is provided using one and one uh, one thousand sorry one and one lakh uh, lignocaine adrenaline uh, which is loaded in a 10 cc syringe the anesthesia is given in the intra, along the infratrochlear nerve that supplies the lacrimal apparatus near the supra orbital notch the needle is inserted into the lateral edge of the medial third of the eyebrow and the 2cc of intrug is injected along with that we anesthetize the lacrimal crest subcutaneously and also uh, inject into deeper tissues up to the periosteum both superiorly and inferiorly Moving on to the surgical steps, the first step is a skin incision, which should be about uh, 3 to 4 millimeters from the medial canthus. Alternatively, we can make it at least 10 millimeters away to avoid the angular vein, which is lying in between these two incisions. Then we proceed with a blunt dissection of orbicularis fibers with an artery forceps. And once we have the medial palpable ligament is exposed, we can disinsert it if needed to provide better exposure. As you can see in this image, the skin has been excised. Uh, orbicularis oculi fibers have been separated to expose a thick white medial palpable ligament. Then we go for separation of the periosteum along the entire length of the incision with a sharp dissector or periosteum elevator. Then we retract the lacrimal sac and elevate the uh, periosteum till the lamina preparatia, which is the thin bone, is approached. Lamina preparatia is a thin bone which is papery and pink pinkish with a sharp dissector, then the lamina is punctured. Then we proceed with the bone removal using a kerosene bone punch. We should ensure that the osteotomy is at least the size of a thumbnail. A large osteotomy is indicated that it should extend superiorly ab above the level of MPL, inferiorly till the level of the inferior orbital margin and posteriorly till the lamina preparatia as much as required and anteriorly as much as needed for a good nasal flap. Then we go ahead with dilation of the upper punctum with a punctum dilator. We can, if needed, inflate the sac with a viscoelastic, but this step is not mandatory. Then we provide a long vertical top to bottom incision with an 11 number blade or crescent as some surgeons prefer along the medial wall of the sac to create la a larger interior and a smaller posterior flap. As we can see in the image, the bulge is shown, which is the inflated lacrimal sac. And on in this lacrimal sac, we will provide an incision, a long vertical incision, creating a large anterior flap and a small posterior flap. Then we'll fashion the anterior and uh, posterior nasal mucosal flaps by providing two straight vertical incision and two small horizontal cuts to create the uh, flaps. Again, we should make sure that we have a large anterior flap and a small posterior flap. Posterior flaps are usually uh, usually excised, but we can also suture them. So as we can see in this image, the posterior flaps are sutured. And in this, we can see in between this uh, dotted line, this is the nasal cavity with the nasal pack visible. And this is the anterior nasal flap. After that, we proceed with uh, suturing the anterior nasal uh, um, flap with the anterior uh, mucosal, sorry, anterior lacrimal flap. And then we close the orbicularis uh, muscle and the skin is closed with interrupted of uh, cutaneous subcutular uh, sutures. Surgical video showing the particular procedure that I was discussing. So the first thing is that we make a uh, mark uh, nasal to the uh, medial canthus. Then we provide a skin incision uh, at least 10, 10 millimeters in size. In this surgery, we chose to provide uh, traction sutures to help with uh, exposure. After that, we are separating the orbicularis muscle. After this, we'll start elevating the periosteum. We can see the lacrimal bone and the posterior lacrimal crest is also visible. Now, after the infracture, we are proceeding with the bone removal using a, using a kerosene bone punch. After we've made an adequate size osteotomy, confirm that it is uh, at least the size of a little finger or by a thumbnail, we can confirm. We can see the nas nasal mucosa. In this particular surgery, it was chosen to uh, uh, actually. This particular surgery, we uh, did intubation for this uh, patient as well.
So we're making the sack flaps using a crescent. Similarly, creating, creating nasal mucosal flaps. This is a tube that was passed. Yes. After that, we proceed with a suturing of the anterior flaps together. The posterior flaps have been excised. After that, we close the orbicularis and the skin. What is the post-op care? Basically, just complete bed rest in a propped up position. They should be told to avoid blowing of nose. We can give the patient oral antibiotics and uh, uh, painkillers. Along with that, the nasal pack is removed after 24 hours. Otropin drops can be given twice a day. And uh, sac syringing may be done if there are some uh, clots in the nasal cavity. Basically, if the patient is complaining of post-op watering, that means there are some clots in the cavity. And then we can pro provide uh, syringing and probing to remove the clots. The sutures are removed after one week. Thank you. Ah, thank you, Asmita. Uh, can you tell us uh, how do we decide how large the osteotomy has to be, or what are the the um, edges, or how uh, till what are the landmarks for creating the osteotomy? Because... Um, uh, basically, inferiorly we can go up to the inferior vital rim. Anteriorly, we can go as much as possible, and posteriorly up to the lamina capricia, and superiorly slightly above the uh, medial palpebral ligament. We should avoid like going too superiorly or doing any uh, rotational movements during the bone punching because that can damage the cribriform uh, uh, plate and lead to some CSF leakage. So yeah, be careful during yeah. that. Procedure. So essentially, what you're saying is that all the osteotomy that you create, you have to extend it inferiorly and anteriorly, mm -hmm. and avoid going superiorly and posteriorly. Yes. Right. All right. Thank you so much. We now have our next presenter, Prithvi again, and he will be presenting techniques in TOSIS surgery. I in please uh, insist that you try to shorten your presentations. Otherwise, we may have to skip some of them. It's already, yeah, uh, yeah we are lagging behind. Yeah. Um, before going to one, one uh, photo I need to show. Uh, any tosis surgery, we need to uh, give the good contour along with lifting the uh, lid. You can see the corneal reflex where the eye peak of the uh, lid uh, be maintained, and along with that, uh, there is a, a contour to be maintained over here. I'm going to uh, first patient. Uh, there is a 10 year old male child with uh, left eye congenital simple moderate tosis with MRD 1 of 0 with uh, 3 mm tosis. Uh, LPS was uh, around 7 mm with good bells. We plan to do LPS. Application of around 15 to 18 mm. Literacy has been marked, and three points are marked along the coronal light reflex and the lateral and medial limbus. Skin is inside, subcutaneous tissue dissected, and orbicular pain has been uh, dissected out. Anterior superior border of the tassel is exposed. LPS is dissected. Uh, the septum part is not reached. This side uh, marking has been done. Amount of resection uh, application to be done. LPS is implicated uh, along with the uh, at the superior border of the tarsus. Uh, Aponeurosis has been implicated with the desired. Uh, Margin of application. Uh, Three point of suture is taken. One at the level of the uh, corneal reflex, which is the highest peak of the lid lift, and one at the uh, lateral limbus area.
switches are readjusted based on the lift with the, the within relation to the other eye and also the proper contour If the LPS section is very poor, there will be drooping of the lid post operatively. If LPS section is good, there will be lift um, at the more than the level what we have left. So based on that, we need to re-modify the level at which we have to leave the lid. This is a pre and post of the, of the same patient. This 28-year-old female patient presented with the left eye congenital simple severe ptosis with MRD1 of minus 1 and uh, with 4 mm ptosis with uh, LPS section of around 5 mm. We plan to do LPS resection of 20 mm. This is the uh, percutaneous route. Lid tree size, uh, height has been uh, uh, measured from the normal eye, and at the same point, it's been uh, measured and incised. Suburbicular plane dissection has been done. We can see the fat prolapsing when the septum has been breached. The LPS is exposed. Superior part of the tarsus is exposed. The lid is, uh, uh, conjectural surface is exposed and the Ballooning has been, been done with the xylo solution to separate the conjecture from LPS molar complex. LPS has been dissected out of the uh, conjecture. Lateral and medial pons have been cut. Uh, desired amount of the LPS has been marked and it's been sutured to the upper anterior border of the tarsus with the horizontal mattress suture along using uh, ethylon 60. LPS is ejected out. Uh, there is lid forming, crease forming suture where uh, skin sutures taken along in the bite of LPS. Uh, next patient is 19 year old female presented with uh, left eye congenital simple moderate ptosis with MRD1 of minus 1 with ptosis of 4 mm with uh, LPS action of around 6 mm. Good bells. We plan to do LPS resection via conjectural route. Conjectural surface has been exposed with the traction suture. Conjectural is inside the upper part of the tarsus. Muller LPS complex has been separated from the conjectiva by dissecting it out. It's been disinserted from the uh, upper part of the tarsus. And tarsus has been, if you can see the tarsus which is freed up. And it's been dissected out of orbicularis. The uh, LPS is separated from the septum now, which is then cut along the medial and uh, lateral on, which makes the LPS free, which is uh, traction which are applied to it, and desired amount of the LPS has been marked. LPS is being sutured with the tarsus and the knot suturing will be uh, not uh, looped outside into the skin and knotted. Thank you. Okay, uh, that was short and sweet, uh, not taking too much time, just the videos.
good so uh, well uh, is shown most of the things except uh, like that uh, mmcr muller's muscle conjunct tabular section uh then lps plication as you know we have been uh, promoting as a first initially as a very physiological surgery but now as a universal ptosis surgery because i usually can correct any amount of ptosis with uh, lps plication mild moderate and severe because if it's severe uh, you use it as an internal sling and take it up to the vitnals and uh, the only thing you have you have to be careful about is that you don't cause too much uh, of lag of thalamus so i guess uh, i mean i would uh, no commercial interest in that but i really would try i would say that you should all master that technique very well so the next speaker is uh, what i don't know which dr bupender yadav and he is going to be speaking on uh, eyelid reconstruction so uh, we would request him again to focus on his videos and yeah. yeah, I think we can, like sir saying, we can just go on to the videos straight yes. because we are really short on time. I'm Dr. Pratidhi Yadav, senior resident at the RPC. I'm showing some very important videos of the alert reconstruction surgery. The choice of surgery depends on the extent of the defect, the state of the remaining periocular tissue, and the age of the patient. The aim of the surgery is the, to re establish the smooth surface. Uh, to line the eyelid and the protect the cornea and outer layer of skin and muscle and structure support between the two lamina of skin and mucosa origin provided by the tarsa plate. A smooth abrasive eyelid margin is necessary, which is free from the keratin and trichosis. Uh, uh, a normal control of the eyelid is necessary. Um, this is a, to repair the full thickness eyelid effect. This is, uh, this is a chart which provides the a roughly estimate which depend on the horizontal extent of the defect. If, if the defect is less than one third, we can do the direct cantholysis with or without uh, cantholysis. If the defect is more than one third and less than two, any one half, we can do the semicircular flap. If the defect is more than one half, we, we can do the blood sharing procedure like cut up here. Uh, this, this is a, a diagram representation of the tangent semicircular flap. Uh, this is a reverse semicircular tangent flap used to repair the upper eyelid defect. In this surgery, after assessing the defect, we mark a semi curved line, which is initially, initially lateral and liberally and curved up superiorly. And after that, we incise the skin with 50 number bleed. And we do the later canthotomy and superior cantholysis. We pull the lateral part of the defect medially to the and suture the, the, we took the partial thickness suture through the tarsa plate and oppose the grip. After that, we use the vertical metal suture to oppose the eyelid margin. After that, we close the skin with. After that, we close the little canthus. There is certain key point, especially place if it's att attention to on awareness the lacrimal glands and and specifically when performing the super cantholysis. Reapproximating the later cancer without accommodation the good fixation to the later orbital and peristome may lead to a webbing of the newly created cancers. And now we cover the cutter beard. It's a two-stage procedure, which is a sharing procedure to reconstruct the defect involving the greater than 50% of the eyelid width.
there is a case preparation of appellate coloboma. We mark the skin around 4 mm from the margin and we give a full thickness incision. After that, we give the vertical incision from the later on medial part of the. We advance the flap uh, under the bridge and switch and suit in the three layers. If I suture the conjectiva to conjectiva, after that we suture the lower obliquus to upper LPS. And in the last, we switch the skin to skin. The key for the, when forming the bridge during the first stage of the procedure, the margin artery arcade must be pressured by creating the incision at least 4 to 5 m below the lid margin. The second stage of surgery is the lysis of the flap and this usually carried out at the 6 to 8 week after the first stage. Now we cover the mustache flap. Mustache flap is used in the reconstruction of the full thickness roll rate defects. Nasal quantum mucosal graft or A cartilage graft can be added to provide support and rigidity to the newly created roll rate margin. This is a patient with this is a 60 year old patient with devoted basal carcinoma. Uh, after taking a wide excision, there is a large defect was created, and we plan for the massage cheek flap procedure. In the in the procedure, we start the we start making a circular line from the starting of the later canthus and goes up to the temple and then after down and then downward to, to the pre auricular skin then we undermine the tissue and create a rotation flap It is sutured to the origin defect. And the later canthus was formed. And the, this flat provides only the any anterior lamina. So with posterior lamina was formed by the MMG graph. This is a pre-op and interop and post-op chart.
the key points are the semicircular flare should be undermined completely in the sacrificial plane to avoid injury to the patient. To prevent late, later contraction, the superior limit of the semicircle for a muscular flare should be at least as high as the probe. And the fixation of the under, uh, patient on the underside of the rotary flare over lateral orbit rim is important to avoid the post operative low lead retraction of the active PM. Thank you. Thank you, Bhupinder. Uh, we have two more speakers left for the session, uh, and we have already finished the time. So, Parag, maybe just the video, and uh, that's about it. So, Parag, and uh, next would be Mrinalini. So, we'll just stick to the video so that we finish in five minutes. Uh, So Parag is going to be uh, showing us videos for orbital flow fracture repair. And I think he has two videos. One is to show entrapment release. Yes. And the other is for the large fracture. So I will be quickly going through two cases and showing you videos. So basically we have two type of indications for uh, flow fracture. Immediate repair is basically indicated in trapdoor fractures where uh, inferior rectus muscle is entrapped. And uh, one is large flow fractures where uh, um, uh, rigid implants are needed for uh, orbital flow reconstruction. So, so, in first case, this is a 12 year old child with history of fall from roof uh, presented to us in casualty with oclo uh, cardiac reflex. On CT imaging, we are able to note that IR is uh, entrapped, and we are able to see on the imaging that on the on this side, the we are not able to appreciate the IR clearly, and it is entrapped. So coming to the video directly. So our aim of the surgery in this uh, case is to provide a barrier and to release the entrapped inferior rectus muscle. So initially traction switches are placed through upper eyelid and lower eyelid as well. So once the traction switches are passed, now FDT is being performed, uh, which shows that uh, uh, there is FDT is free in down gaze while it is restricted in up gaze, uh, confirming our findings that IR is restricted. Now lateral canthotomy is being performed along with cantholysis. We are approaching this case through a transconjectival route. We can also do uh, floor fracture repair through uh, uh, skin route also. Uh, now the uh, uh, monopolar cautery is being used to give a transconjectival incision 3 mm below the inferior border of the tarsus. Uh, following this incision, the dissection will be carried out between conjunctiva uh, in the suborbicularis plane between the septum and the orbicularis. Now the three traction switches are passed through the retractor uh, conjunctival uh, layer combined with uh, conjunctival and retractors. Inferior rectus traction switch is being passed. Now uh, inferior orbital rim is being exposed and a periosteal incision is being given with a 15 number blade. Periost periosteum will now be elevated with a freeus periosteum elevator. Now, once the periosteum is elevated, we can appreciate the margins of the fracture. Along with the entrapped inferior rectus muscle, uh, care should be taken not to pull the muscle out so that uh, because it will lead to injury to the inferior rectus muscle. Osteotomy is ideally to be enlarged and uh, IR muscle uh, is to be gently pulled up with a uh, lens spatula or a blunt instrument. Now, this is the IR muscle which we can see. Now, once the uh, muscle has been released and all the margins of the osteotomy have been identified, a barrier implant is being placed uh, covering all the margins of the uh, um, uh, floor fracture. And once the implant is positioned, FDT is done again to confirm uh, uh, whether the IR is free or not. And once we have confirmed it, we now do the closure in layers. Once first uh, with the periosteum, uh, followed by Now the lower lid tarsus uh, is again being sutured to the lateral canthal tendon, uh, followed by reconstruction of the lateral canthal tendon.
the conjunctival incision is closed uh, with the interrupted six of vital sutures. And this is it. So this is this was one indication when uh, the IR muscle is entrapped and we have to do the repair. And other is when we have large floor fractures, like in this case, we have uh, multiple orbital fractures, roof as well as floor, or I will be only showing the uh, roof repair part. We can see there is a large floor fracture with prolapse of all the orbital contents into the maxillary sinus. So this is the video. Uh, FDT is usually free in these cases. In this case, uh, however, the FDT is tight in the down gaze because of the impingement of SR LPS complex by the roof fracture. Uh, IR muscle is being, brittle suture is, passed, is being passed through the inferior rectus muscle. And similar to the previous case, lateral canthotomy, cantholysis is being performed, uh, has been already been performed, and transconjunctival incision is given, and uh, dissection is carried out between suborbicular sprain to expose the rim, and uh, uh, incision is uh, periosteum is elevated with the uh, in, incision is given over the periosteum with a 15 number blade, and periosteum is elevated, and uh, here we can see through blunt dissection, and uh, hand on hand technique we were able to lift all the contents out of the uh, one important thing i wanted want, want you to show here is that the dissection that is being carried out here now uh, shows the posterior edge of the posterior edge of the tumor it is usually formed by the palatine bone and it is usually it usually does not it is not fractured and this is very important to identify because the posterior support to the implant will be provided by the uh, posterior ledge, which is formed by the palatine bone. Once the, all the margins of the uh, fracture have been identified, a universal titanium implant is being placed uh, with support uh, anteriorly with the uh, orbital rim and posteriorly with the ledge. The implant once placed will be secured to the rim with the ti uh, titanium screws with the manual screwdriver. Once we have confirmed the position of implant, now this is the manual screwdriver with the titanium screw, and the implant is being fixated. Once the implant is positioned into its proper position, uh, closure will be done in layers, and uh, uh, and then the closure will be done, as shown in previous video as well. So uh, important points to remember uh, in both the surgeries are that we can approach the uh, floor fracture with both the approaches through skin approach or through the transconjunctival approach. Both have their advantages and disadvantages. Transconjunctival route offers better cosmetics, but it may alter uh, final eyelid position because we cut the retractors while approaching the orbital rim. And all the margins of the fracture are to be uh, uh, exposed properly, especially the posterior edge for providing uh, better support to the implant and that is it thank you okay thank you dr parab that was uh, wonderful videos you have shown that uh, coming to the last uh, speaker of the session we have dr minali she will be speaking on contracted socket management Okay, since we are short on time, I am directly going to how, okay, if it's uh, like we know that there are two classifications, Gopal Krishna classification and Byron and Smith and Byron and Smith along with the surface contracture also takes into account the volume and the bony contracture. So if it's a mild socket contracture with only shallowing of the inferior phonics, so then you can put a phonics formation suture. If it is a surface contracture, moderate to severe, you want to correct only the area. You can use an NMG or an AMG. Uh, but for these grafts to uptake, uh, it has to be a vascular socket. In an avascular socket, in an irradiated socket, these grafts will not be uptake. 
properly and for volume correction you can uh, do a secondary implant and if you want to correct both area and volume you have to do a dfg uh, now this is one test like in cases of surface shortening you want to differentiate whether uh, it's mild moderate or severe then uh, you can do this probe test uh, what you do is uh, if there is you can put the probe test in the inferior fornix and see if there is no movement in the upper fornix that means there is only an inferior uh, 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 so uh, inferior fornix uh, shelving but there is no surface contracture in that case only fornix formation sutures can be done if there is a mild shallowing it's moderate contracture you can uh, correct it with an amg or mmg again severe contracture there, when you push it down the probe there will be shifting noticed in the upper fornix uh, going to the AMG. Okay, as you can see, this is you can see that the inferior fornix is shortened and there's cicatrix formation. So first, we are going to form the inferior fornix. We are uh, taking, we are measuring around 15 mm, and we are giving a get cut in the center of the fornix. We'll be dissecting subconjunctively and uh, freeing that area. completely then we have to pass fornix formation sutures uh, we uh, pass silk sutures uh, through the cut end of the conjunctiva that you're seeing too deep in the fornix through the periosteum and come out of the skin we'll place three such sutures to form the fornix inferior fornix first Okay, so the suture is taken out from the inferior edge and uh, taken out from the skin. Similarly, we will pass three phonix formation sutures. Now the uh, bare area or the base, we have to place the AMG. You can see the bare area here. Now we are going to cover it with AMG. What you have to make sure is that the stromal side is placed base down. And here we are going to use a fibrin glue to attach the AMG and just pass the four cardinal sutures at the corners. So the AMG is lifted up. Now we are going to put fibrin glue. Revert it back. Make sure it is attached. You trim the edges. And... We're just passing the four sutures. Then you place the conformer and place a temporary tarsarapi, which will be there for six weeks. Okay, moving on to the next video, MMG. Here you can see that all the furnaces are shortened. So first, we'll be doing the preparing the socket. We'll be uh, pre uh, forming the inferior phonics as well as the superior phonics. Uh, this video is courtesy of Dr. Rachna. Uh, okay, we gave a nick in the center. We are going to dissect. There should be uh, sufficient conjunctiva to form the superior as well as the inferior phonix, which would be around 15 mm each. So we're dissecting it. Then again, similarly, as we pass phonix formation sutures in the previous video, we are going to pass three in the superior lid. 
and three in the inferior. So now the fornix is formed. Now you have to take the MMG from the oral mucosa. Usually we do 20% oversizing of the mucous membrane graft to prevent the primary contracture. You're marking the uh, edges of the MMG to make sure you do not damage the frenulum. Then we are going to inject xyloadri that will give the anesthesia to the patient as well as help us in the dissection. Then you uh, give a nick with the blade and do uh, dissection subcutaneously. Make sure that you do not take fat in it, only the mucosa. Yeah, we've dissected the mucous membrane graft and then you cauterize the bed to increase the surface area. What you can do is, sorry, uh, meshing. You can give uh, vertical uh, incisions alongside to increase the vertical surf uh, the surface area of the graft. Mm -hmm. Okay, here you can see what we're doing is meshing. We are giving, increasing the surface area of the graph that we've taken. Now we're going to suture it in the base. Secure it with vicryl. The superior sutures are being passed, then inferior. So now it is perfectly placed in the bed. After this, you place a conformer and put a temporary tarsal up. Even last video is DFG. Uh, DFG has again three components. First, you prepare the socket. Then you're going to harvest the dermis fat graft. And then again, you place it. So here again, you see that there is volume shortening and there's severe surface shortening. So now uh, we've made a central nick. We are dissecting and as uh, shown in the previous video, we are going to form the superior and the inferior fornix with the fornix formation sutures. So the fornix formation sutures are being placed. Okay, now uh, how to harvest DFG? We take it from the upper and outer quadrant uh, of the hip. You should make sure that you do not take it from the weight-bearing area and do not damage the sciatic nerve while taking it. You make an ellipse, which should be 20 into 20 mm. You can go as much as to 25 mm, but not above that. And the dissection you should do here is very careful. You have to dissect the epidermis from the dermis. So here the epidermis is being dissected from the dermis. And the depth uh, is taken more than the length because orbital fat will undergo atrophy. So now we are making a deeper incision and dissecting the fat beneath the dermis. It has been dissected out. Now you can close the... You can close this in uh, two layers using Vicryl and the skin sutures can be placed horizontal mattress. So... Okay. Okay, now we'll just go to the socket. Uh, this is... 
we'll place the DFG into the socket and we are suturing the dermis with the uh, the free end of the conjunctiva the in the inferior phonics you have to make sure that the conjunctiva doesn't dip below otherwise it will cause inclusion cells and the fat is being reposited so this is how it looks after suturing again we'll place a conformer and do a temporary tassiraphy so this is how, uh, in conclusion uh, shallow phonics, there's no surface or volume loss. You can do just do a phonics formation suture. Surface loss, but no volume loss. If it is only mild, you can do a phonics formation with relaxing incision, moderate. You can put a phonics formation suture with AMG, severe surface loss. You can do an MMG with phonics formation. Surface loss with volume loss, you can do a DFG or MMG with secondary implant. And if the, it's a, a poor vascularity of the socket, you can do a vascular pedicle graft. Thank you. Okay, uh, so that was a wonderful presentation. So uh, we come to the end of this uh, video assisted skill transfer session. And uh, uh, I'm happy that uh, the speakers were able to cover most of the essential areas of oculoplasty, including eyelid, nexa, lacrimal, socket, orbit, and uh, shown us a cross section of uh, whatever. Uh, basic uh, surgeries are required in these areas. So once you've gone through this uh, session, you'll be able to, you know, manage your uh, basic oculoplastic surgery. So uh, I guess uh, people must be quite saturated. So, but we can't afford to have a break at this time. You can keep on shuttling in and out of the tea or coffee area but uh, we can't have a formal break right now so we'll go on to the next session which is the challenging cases session and uh, dr parag is our first speaker so i will be presenting a, a, a case with which is a fairly common presentation but it came as a surprise to us at the end of the examination so a patient was a 46 year old female who was a homemaker, resident of Rajasthan Sekar village and presented with chief complaints of pain in right eye for past one year, headache, outward protrusion for right eye for past 10 months, diminution of vision in right eye for two months and in left eye for one month. So patient developed pain in right eye, which was associated with pain on the right side of head, which was dull aching continuous type. Outward protrusion of right eye was noted which was insidious onset progressive and did not have any postural variation. There is history of diplopia for past six months, which is, has progressed. Uh, and there is history of cold intolerance. Uh, in past history, patient is a known case of hypothyroidism and uh, is, a patient is also a known case of diabetic mellitus for past two years. On ocular examination, uh, best corrected visual acuity with uh, 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 correct with spectacle correction was 69 in both the eyes other uh, ocular examination was uh, within normal limit on uh, orbit examination on inspection uh, there was no facial asymmetry proptosis was a present in the patient which was axial in nature as we can show in the photograph scleral show is present in the patient uh, in the right eye of uh, right eye lower lid Lid lag is lid lag was there in the down gaze, and we can see that the vertical palpebral aperture height is more in the lateral half, uh, uh, and uh, compared to the center and the medial part, which is suggestive of a lateral flare. And extraocular movement was restricted in all the gazes. Uh, there is presence of yellowish uh, lesions in both eye lower lid on the medial aspect, uh, which are suggestive of xanthal asthma patches. And multiple darkly pigmented lesions are also present over cheek area, which are suggestive of freckles. So, uh, uh, the, uh, clinical examination for proptosis was done. A uh, worm side view on worm side view, we can appreciate that the right eye is proptotic. On Nefsegger's view, also we can confirm the same findings. Objective uh, examination of proptosis was done with exophthalmometer, and uh, proptosis of 4 mm was noted. Uh, on palpation, there was no uh, orbital mass which was palpable. Tenderness was pulp, uh, there on deep palpation and retropulsion test was positive. And retro re resistance to retropulsion was firm. 
so uh, till now uh, considering the clinical findings we were initially when the patient pre patient presented to us we were thinking in lines of a thyroid eye disease patient was also a known case of ted uh, patient had lower uh, eyelid scleral show along with lateral flare which are signs of uh, lateral flare which is the first sign of ted but uh, on examination on palpation we were able to note that the retropulsion test was positive resistance to retropulsion was firm which indicate that uh, there is a space occupying lesion in the orbit and thus we investigated further so in summary she is a 46 year old female who had presented to us with a unilateral painful progressive proposis for past one year which is associated with loss loss of weight and retropulsion test is firm so based on our clinical examination we could uh, come up to these differentials uh, basically of a space occupying lesion of orbit uh, which is uh, long standing cavernous hemangioma or mesenchymal tumors of orbit orbital inflammatory disease we, we was kept to be a most probable diagnosis at this point because patient had complain of pain for past one year uh, to rule out orbital inflammatory disease, uh, invest further investigations were done, uh, blood investigations were ordered, ESR was uh, found to be raised, and all the inflammatory markers like serum ACE for sarcoidosis and CNK, PNK uh, uh, for uh, vaginas were all uh, came out to be normal. IgG4 disease, uh, IgG4 simmer, serum IgG4 levels were also within normal limit. HbA1c was raised, which was uh, 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 which we expected as patient is a non diabetic. Uh, imaging was ordered, chest x-ray was normal for the patient. On MRI, uh, on contrast MRI, we could uh, appreciate that there were bilateral orbital space occupying lesions in the intraoconal space. And on contrast imaging, we were, we were able to appreciate that the lesion was homogeneously contrast uh, uh, enhancing. And optic nerve was seen separately. Uh, and mass was seen encasing the optic nerve. So on basis of investigations, we were able to rule out orbital inflammatory disease. And now on the basis of MRI, we were thinking in lines of a orbital meds or a, 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 a xanthogranulomatous disease because the patient also had a clinically presence of xanthelasmas. Uh, further investigations were done to rule out meds and a mammography and USG thyroid came out to be normal. A uh, whole body PET CT scan was done for the patient and this came as a big surprise to us. FTG uptake was uh, heterogeneously enhancing uh, soft tissue mass lesions were seen in uh, intraconal uh, uh, space of the bilateral orbits. And uh, FDG uptake was also noted in the thyroid, but uh, uh, FNAC was done from this uh, nodule and it came out to be non-significant. Uh, Mild FGT, FDG uptake was also noted in the pre aortic region, which uh, which which came which we later came out uh, uh, came to know that it is because of the involvement of the lymph nodes, and FDG uptake was also noted in the bilateral humerus and bilateral femur heads. So uh, on pets uh, pet scan, there was a symmetric bilateral involvement of uh, which is multi system involvement, which was characteristic of a. Uh, uh, histiocytic disease, which we call as Ardim Chester disease. Now, on the basis of above investigations, we were able to rule out uh, uh, met metastasis. Multiple myeloma also has lytic lesions, as were noted on the PET scan, but serum electrophoresis was done for the patient and it uh, there were no, uh, uh, it came out to be normal. So, uh, we were able to rule out other things and we were left with the uh, uh, probability of a histiocytic disorder. So only point against the uh, histiocytic disorder was that it is a, uh, uh, which is the Ardim Chester disease was that it, it, is a, it is a relatively rare disease. Otherwise the symmetrical presentation of the PET CT and clinical presentation were uh, in line with the diagnosis. Meds. Uh, similarly, we were able to rule out other differentials. Incision biopsy was run with anterior orbitotomy for the patient. Histopathology shows fibrofatty tissue infiltrated by lymphocytes and histiocytes. Immunostains were positive for CD68. So, Ardem Chester disease is not an uh, exclusive histopathological diagnosis. So, in view of in view of characteristic symmetrical findings on imaging, along with histopathological features, a diagnosis of bilateral Ardem Chester disease was made, which was involving orbit, bone, and lymph nodes. 
and uh, once the diagnosis was made a uh, patient was referred to oncologist for further management uh, this is the classification which is which has been ex accepted uh, by the uh, histiocytic society for classification of uh, histiocytic disorders uh, due to shortage of time i will go, not go in detail so management uh, further management was done for the patient by an, uh, by our oncologist and patient was started on injection vein blasting 10 mg uh, weekly injections along with prednisolone so uh, currently a consensus guidelines has been formed for the treatment of adem chester disease and biopsy and characterization for braf v600 e oncogene is recommended in all cases and braf inhibitors like bemurafenib and dobrafenib are currently the first line of treatment for treatment of this disease thank you that was a great case parag ma'am would you like to add something you know ma'am i would like meanwhile to ask dr ashmita to uh, take up the stage uh you didn't show the ihc results right see uh, i think you just showed the biopsy cd68 what about cd1a which is very important cd1a is negative in case of uh, adam chester only then you can diagnose oh, yes, it was negative ah, you should have at least mentioned <laughs> all the ihc results an interesting case yeah it wasn't uh, clinically diagnosed uh, earlier even histiocytic disorder wasn't thought of yes ma'am but only biopsy you could make out it's on biopsy and it yeah, the, the diagnosis was put in good case yeah yeah the take home message from the uh, this uh, case presentation was basically what it appears is not what it is actually it was it she came as a thyroid eye disease patient she had a long history of uh, thyroid disorder i mean when, when you see proptosis in a patient with a history of thyroid the, the thing that you usually think is it's thyroid and then you may not you know go in and investigate the patient but she did give a history of weight loss and uh pain and all that and uh, uh, even then we were not able to clinically uh, suspect a bilateral disease and it has uh, happened several times now where clinically we suspect a patient as a unilateral proptosis it turns out to be bilateral and your course of clinical diagnosis completely changes so i think uh, that's the take home message investigate and keep your eyes open uh, for things that are not immediately visible right okay so asmita quick 5 minutes presentation okay I'll begin with my uh, case. A uh, nine-year-old girl presented. A nine-year-old girl presented with complaints of right eye proptosis for the fi past five to six months. She was giving a very vague history, which has exaggerated over the past one to two months. On examination, she was afebrile with proptosis, eyelid edema, and chemosis with prolapse of conjunctiva with signs of exposure keratopathy on the uh, cornea. Uh, we did a CACT. The patient had presented in the emergency, and in the axial and sagittal cuts, we uh, we saw a well-defined uh, retroorbital, uh, retrobulbar, intraconal, multi-loculated lesion with some uh, peripheral enhancement. Bony expansion changes were visible, indicating that it was a, a long-standing lesion. As we can see, yeah. Hold on, Asmita. Can anyone uh, guess what it is just by looking at the imaging? A nine-year-old girl sudden onset proptosis with a uh, intraconal lesion, well-defined, uh, causing changes in the bony area. Yeah. Okay. Go on. Go on. So as we could see that there were bony changes, so we suspected that it was a long-standing lesion which has probably uh, undergone some uh, sudden change in the past one or two months. So the differential diagnosis which came in our mind with the, in a child with unilateral proptosis was probably a venolymphatic malformation which has developed a sudden hemorrhage or it was a structural lesion dermoid or epidermoid it could be an abscess or a hematoma or it could be a parasitic infection or it could be a meningocele so uh, as the most common cause of a proptosis in a child was a venolymphatic malformation which has undergone hemorrhage so we suspected that that was our uh, that was the patient that we were dealing with so our next step was obviously aspiration and injection of bleomycin we went ahead with our plan and uh, intraoperatively we were surprised because we got a clear fluid aspirate 
So what did we do next? So uh, we suspected that probably we were dealing with a case of hydrated cyst, although we uh, were not suspecting that. So uh, intraoperatively, we alerted the anesthetist that uh, there might be an anaphylactic reaction because we punctured an uh, hydrated cyst. The aspirated fluid was sent for cytology. At that point of time, uh, we did not have hypertonic saline. So we went ahead with our plan of injecting bleomycin and started the patient on albendazole and steroids postoperatively. Further investigations were done. The serology was 0.92, which was equivocal. Ultrasound abdomen was normal, but the X-ray chest again showed a well-defined lesion in the mid-lower zone. The cytology of fluid was aspirated and sent, but we could not find any scolex per se. The debris was seen, in, although debris was seen. The CCT chest again showed a well-defined lesion in the lateral segment of the right middle lobe with a rim of peripheral enhancement. This is what we could see in the CT scan and the X-ray. Now we were a little sure that we were dealing with um, a multi-organ um, involvement of a hydrated cyst. The MRI showed again a well-defined lesion in the retrobulbal intraconal compartment. But now after aspiration, we could see some uh, septations within this cyst. And now we were sure that this was the endocyst which has separated from the pericyst. And now we were sure that our diagnosis was in fact a hydrated cyst. So was it a slip up or did we discover a new treatment? So we went ahead with our review of literature and we found that orbital involvement is pretty rare in cases of orbital disease and multi, uh, multi, uh, multi uh, cysts are even more rare. On ultrasound, we should have been able to see a double layer sign of the hydrated cyst. On CT scan, the orbital hybrid cyst appears as hypodense, well-defined fluid filled cyst, which is thin walled and mostly unilocular with a fine peripheral ring enhancement. But at this point of time, the differentials, uh, differentials can be an abscess, hematoma, lymphangioma, lacrimal cysts, and dermoid cysts. So a better imaging modality is an orbital MRI, in which the cyst appears as a low-intensity signal on T1 and as a high-intensity signal on T2. On enhancement, uh, the lesion exhibits capsular contrast enhancements. So uh, how to rule out abscesses that there should be constitutional, constitutional symptoms like fever, headache, etc. And only uh, peripheral enhancement rules out other lesions, which are uh, hemangioma, lymphangioma, and malignant tumor. Dermoid cysts should show some fatty and calcified components within the lesion. Serological tests came out to be equivocal, but we have found that they can be negative in about 50 to 60% of the cases because of the integrity of the cyst wall in the orbit. But however, the final diagnosis is made by demonstration of scolysis in the fluid and histological appearance of the cyst wall after the surgical removal of the cyst. This is what a cyst, uh, hydrated cyst usually looks like. On CT scan, we should have been able to see a well-defined uh, capsule of the cyst, which was not actually apparent in our particular case. That is why probably we did not think of a hydrated cyst in our case. This is how in uh, histopathology it looks like. We can see multiple scolysis provided with booklets adjacent to a thick membrane. Then we looked at the management options. The WHO has given a classification based on the ultrasound findings that follows the natural history of the course from simple undifferentiated to a transitional stage to an inactive stage. C1 is active. C2 is active with multi... Sorry. With a multivascular, multi-septate appearance. Then it becomes uh, goes into the transitional stage where there's a detached laminar uh, membrane which is floating in the cyst, which is the water lily sign. Then it becomes a complex mass and turns into a heterogeneous hypoechoic cyst without the daughter cyst and degenerating membranes may be visible in that. We mainly, we go ahead and treat them in cases of active and transitional cases and we leave the inactive case and watch and observe them. So what are the trends in the management? We have surgical options, we have percutaneous sterilization techniques, we have chemotherapy and we have watch and wait for the inactive cysts. Surgical excision is basically what is being practiced for orbital cysts at, as of now. Basically, the ultimate goal is to excise the cyst without uh, letting it rupture. But due to the complex anatomy of the orbit and a thin wall of the cyst, this may not be possible in every case of the cyst. The problem that happens is that the orbital cyst often ruptures and this can lead to a severe anaphylactic reaction. Asmata, you can tell what happened in your case. I think we can wind up with that. So, uh, percutaneous aspiration... Uh, it has been tried in or, uh, other cases where there is a hydrated cyst in the liver, but has as of now, what is the role in? Um, okay. So in orbital hydrated cyst, do we have a role of the pair technique? Only one study I could find where there was a percutaneous treatment of an orbital hydrated cyst. It was published uh, quite a long time back, but it was not really followed up. Where we used 15% hypertonic saline injection, and after nine months. Uh, the cyst had drastically reduced in size. 
So we followed up our patient to see what would be the response of bleomycin in our particular patient. We can see the pre-injection photo and after three months, there is a significant clinical improvement. This is the pre-injection CT scan and this is the post-injection CT scan after three months. At pre-injection, the size was pretty large and it was 35.7 cubic centimeters in volume. And after three months, it has already shrunk to 12.2 centimeter cube uh, in size. So what are the lessons learned? One thing is that we should consider hydrated cysts, especially in the pediatric age group when we are dealing with the orbit, uh, orbital cystic pathology. Serological tests may not be very conclusive because uh, it, it is uh, well circumscribed and it has integrity and probably the patients do not have a positive serology and whenever possible MR imaging should be preferred to CT due to better visualization as we have already seen. Pear has been used for hepatic and pulmonary cysts but not yet popular for orbital cysts. The scolicidal solutions that have been used in the past include hypotonic saline, absolute alcohol, silver nitrate and mebendazole. Percutaneous intralesional bleomycin has been used as a sclero sclerosin to uh, treat lymphatic and slow flow val vascular malformation for many years and even now it is being used for simple renal or hepatic cysts. So probably uh, pair is a minimally invasive and risky, r less risky procedure and may be a promising surgical uh, non-surgical alternative for treatment of hydrated cysts. Thank you Smita for that wonderful talk. Uh, I would like to invite Dr. Prithvi for his presentation on orbital inflammatory disease. What's the diagnosis? So while Prithvi prepares for the presentation, I think uh, what we wanted to highlight in the last case was that hydrated being very rare, it is, uh, and uh, with cases presenting with such huge uh, cysts, it might be difficult to even imagine that this is a hydrated cyst. So that is something that one needs to keep in mind. And with the sclerosing therapy that is now being taken up by most of us for treatment of uh, venal lymphatic malformations, we might come up with surprises like this where we end up aspirating a hydrated cyst. And if we are not prepared, we may not be having hypertonic saline. Injecting bleomycin in this case did work. There is no literature supporting this, but this was an accidental uh, uh, happening which turned out to uh, with a good outcome. So this needs to be evaluated, but that's how the, the title uh, serendipity or slip up. So, so there's, we are not advocating bleomycin. Uh, not, he did not undergo any surgical treatment or uh, as far as we know, no medical treatment as well. He was referred. I'm going to present a case of orbital inflammatory disease. The inflammatory disease of orbit is also always a puzzle. We need to connect the dots and find the uh, cause. If we don't able to find it, we put it as idiopathic. Uh, this patient was a 45-year-old uh, uh, male patient, a police by profession, presented with uh, left periorbital swelling, which was waxing and waning. It was more uh, in the morning hours he has swelling. It is there since last one year, associated with mild redness with uh, mild dull aching pain, which was not associated with any extraocular movement, uh, with progressive diplopia for upcage and downgage. So based on this uh, history, we were thinking in terms of it's a long-standing uh, uh, periorbital swelling, waxing and waning course. We are thinking of mainly in terms of inflammatory disease, along with uh, yes pain, but which is, which is not associated with uh, extraocular movement. So less likely to be a my myositis. So I, uh, based on this, uh, we mainly looked upon ruled out uh, causes which can cause the inflammatory conditions and also the congestive pathology because he has mild congestion. He didn't have any periodical swelling while bending down or with valsalva. Uh, he didn't have any protrusion of eyeball. Uh, we thought uh, because of this, there is no any mass inside. He didn't have any features suggestive of any TB uh, or any shortness of breath, which, was, which, which can be there in TB or in uh, sarcoid. Uh, he didn't have any palpitation. Uh, or giddiness, which can be there in hyperthyroidism in TED patients. Um, it didn't have any nasal stuffiness discharge of fundamental, which is suggest which may be seen in uh, vaginal disease and also hematuria, which can be see also seen in vaginal disease. Uh, there is no any other systemic illness. Uh, examination wise, we couldn't find any lead signs uh, which was suggesting of any TED. There was there was mild uh, conjectival congestion, but there is no any intraocular uh, inflammatory signs as such. Um, there was no mask palpable. There was, there was no any retropulsion uh, uh, positive. It was not positive. Examination wise, we could see that patient was having deficits in the elevation as well as in depression. His movement were restricted, limited. So based on this uh, existing examination, we could 
uh, patient with uh, middle aged male, chronic history of uh, periorbital swelling with pain, limitation of movement, in elevation and depression with mild congestion. Uh, we could, uh, it's, uh, we, we were thinking of uh, inflammatory condition which may be infective or non infective. Infective, we need to rule out parasitic long standing disease which can bout uh, inflammatory uh, on and off inflammation. TB and fungal and specific inflammatory diseases like uh, granulomatous, which can be long standing, which will have mild pain, uh, and also fibro inflammatory infiltrated diseases such as IgG4 vasculitis. Vasculitis will have systemic features and no specific, non specific inflammatory condition like myositis. But in this patient, didn't have a pain on extra glue movement. Thyroid was less likely because he didn't have any list signs. So, we based on this, we ordered uh, to look for any uh, in, uh, features of all this inflammatory pathology. His uh, CRP was elevated and his CRM AS was elevated, uh, but his calcium was normal. But uh, AS, uh, we don't know whether it's because uh, it's a sore card. Also, its Montox test was positive. Montox test uh, will not tell whether it's active or latent uh, TB. So, we don't know whether it's a sore card or tuberculosis. So, we did imaging for this patient. We found a sino orbital mass uh, which was uh, along the uh, floor of the orbit. Which was heterogeneously enhancing with uh, uh, in MRI, it was showing uh, hyper intense on T1 and it was hypo intense on T2 more than the uh, gray matter of the brain, which is suggestive. It was it is a fibro fibrotic uh, kind of lesion and it was having an enhancement which with the uh, IR being pushed upwards. So, sino orbital disease based on this, we were thinking of fungal or vaginas or IgG4 or sarcoid or TB. So, in, in, uh, we were still in dilemma, we couldn't connect the puzzle, so we did biopsy intraoperatively we could find a mass which was whitish fibrotic kind of uh, mass which, which was AOS we couldn't it, it could it didn't bleed much histopathically uh, slides uh, uh, where uh, it was showing uh, lympho uh, plasmocytic infiltrate in the first slide we can see uh, there is uh, fibrotic areas here with thick blood walls uh, phlebitis uh, features of phlebitis with uh, giant cells can be seen, seen over here, and uh, IHC staining was showing uh, IgG4 was more than 50% of the total IgG with uh, more than 15 to 20 cells per IgO field. Uh, with, uh, considering this histopathic uh, slide, we were thinking of uh, IgG4 disease. So we did the serum, serum IgG4, it was came to be 360. I thank uh, Seema Kashyap ma'am for the uh, histopathic slides given to me for this. So based on the Puzzle. We are, now we are trying to connect the dots. Clinically, it is a middle-aged male, who most common age group for the inflammatory condition, chronic history, uh, with some uh, with periodontal swelling, pain, with limitation of movement. There was elevation of CRP. Uh, there was uh, space occupying lesions, sino orbital with fat fat stranding, hypo intense on T2. In drop, we could find the fi fibrotic firm avascular mass with histopathic so pathological slides showing fibrosis with uh, more IgG4 uh, uh, cells. Uh, the blood distribution investigation also confirmed, it, it told that it's it, uh, showing that it is two times elevated serum IgG4. Based on this, keeping the criteria given by Umera et al, we considered uh, IgG4 disease. Uh, we ruled out systemic uh, involvement because if the IgG4 is more than uh, two times elevated, or most of the time there'll be systemic involvement. We need to always rule out the systemic uh, involvement of IgG4 disease. Most commonly it involves pancreas. So we did the uh, USG abdomen, CCD thorax to rule out other areas. We started him on prednisolone dose of 0.6 mg per kg once daily, which was uh, given for first two weeks and tapered 10 mg every two weeks. Now he's on 40 mg. He's currently doing well with uh, decrease in inflammatory, inflammatory signs. His movement has been improved and develop has been reduced. This is the current picture. You can see the movement has been better compared to the previous uh, pre-treatment. Pre IG4 disease is mainly immune mediated uh, fibro inflammatory disorder. It will have lymphoplasmocytic infiltration with high IgG4 cells with storyform fibrosis, obliterative uh, phlebitis. It will be, it, it has a sclerotic mass. It will always, it will mimic the SOL. So, most of the time we need biopsy to prove the IgG4 disease. It will be usually painless enlarging mass. Bilateral disease is most common, but it is asymmetrical. Uh, Visual acuity will not be impaired. Systemic involvement will be there in most eighty percent of the patient. Pathogenesis is uh, incomplete. Based on the current uh, up-to-date uh, 
information we could, they could tell, we could tell that cd over cytotoxic t cell is the center for the disease which will produce interleukin 1 IG, tgf beta and interferon gamma which will mediate the fibrosis and also release of igg4 will produce igg4 class switch which will increase the igg4 levels uh, the antigen which is triggering which is causing the uh, cd4 type cytotoxic t cell to rise is, is not not known these are the based on the uh, involvement of the organs it's been classified adenic involvement mainly orbital lacrimal and cervical gland can be involved along with paranasal cells if there is higher concentration of igg4 more than two times or three times always evaluate for systemic disease thank you prithvi can you just show us that initial imaging slide of your patient the imaging one so we often see this picture of a sinoorbital disease and I, I think he's correctly put the first differential that we think of as a fungal. Would anybody beg to differ seeing this picture? Yeah, but the only thing that we need to note here is the infraorbital groove widening, which is a characteristic sign that is seen in IgG4. I think that was the only thing that Preoperatively also made us think of IgG4. And then, of course, intraoperatively, when we saw the mass and the fibrosis, we were almost sure that it was IgG4. But of course, fungal would have anyways been the first on our uh, this thing. So I just wanted to ask ma'am, Dr. Sain, ma'am, uh, in uh, uh, IgG4 pathology, I mean, what? how do you see what in uh, your lesions that you see? What do you see in most of the cases and what is the criteria that uh, is used for making a diagnosis? Because I guess it's not the same for other body lesions as compared to the orbit. No, basically in pathology, we get a granulometrous inflammatory reaction. So it's uh, firstly, we have to rule out a fungal infection. And uh, if there is necrosis, then AFB stain for tuberculosis. So basically it's a diagnosis of uh, exclusion. So if fungal, fungus is negative, and uh, it's not suggestive of tuberculosis. Then we do our IgG stain. And uh, of course, we have to co correlate with the clinical features. So it's basically it's a diagnosis of exclusion. And uh, there are other uh, features also. Uh, we see fibrosis, which is storiform in appearance. Then presence of eosinophils. That also points to a diagnosis of IgG4 and, uh, and presence of plasma cells. Thank you, so Thank you so much, much ma'am, for the Thank inputs. You. Thank you, Prithvi. We would like uh, like to have next Dr. Bhupender for his talk on a puzzling case of unilateral proptosis. Over to you, Bhupender. Because of unilateral proptosis. A 45 year old with PIP, right? uh, from the Uttarakhand, present to RPC with the complaint of uh, progressive out of protection of left eye from over past two months, which is with mild ocular pain. The onset system occurred two months back when she complained of outward protection of the left eye, which was progressive and the mildly painful. There is no his sensitivity is starting diarrhea, no history of any trauma, no history of any chronic drop or fever, night sweats. There is no history of any recent weight loss, loss of appetite, fatigue. They know history of any epistaxis, they know history of any system illness and similar complaint in the family. Uh, after the onset of symptoms, she considered a local private clinic, patient was evaluated, was evaluated and the thyroid profile and CMRI was done. The thyroid profile was normal at that time. And patient comes with, with another private hospital and, and at that time, epilepsy was done. The epilepsy showed that there is no definite magnet sense and features suggest of major calculation. Patient presented to RBC and evaluated. Patient has a history of hypertension for the last two months, last two years, and the patient was newly diagnosed. That Patient newly diagnosed diabetes mellitus. On examination, there are general physical and systematic examination within normal limits. On ocular examination, the patient have a any vision in the left eye with sigma 18, which improved to sigma 3 with the pinhole. There is a 6 mm proctosis in the left eye. Uh, the movements are restricted in all gaze in the left eye, and there is a, any abduction proctosis in the left eye. Uh, there is a, a grade 1 RPD in the left eye. On proctosis backup, there is a proctosis, uh, the apexia proctosis, uh, which is around 6 mm, and there is an intermediate dystopia of the left eye. The, on inspection, there is no obvious mass visible, and the extraocular movement are restricted in all gauges, and the pupil direction are, uh, on pupil direction, there is a grave and RPD, and there, there is a mild proctosis present, and, and there is an inferior exclusion present. Uh, 
on palpation the mass present in the superior region which is smooth in which, which is smooth firm non tender and pressure re retrocussion of firm and there is a defect in the later orbitorium which are not well defined after the after that we order the usg orbit tct had an orbit usg of the xh and rotating blood is this this is a CRM, this this is a cmri of the peri-brain orbit there is a mass lesion on the later side of the orbit which is as intense on t1 and the and as to happen intense on the t2 the mass pushing the later reactors is really And on post on contrast, there is a motor enhancement of the lesion, which is mainly in the peripheral area. On UOG, there is a cystic light lesion with a moderate to high spike in the cavity. And CCC, CCC had an orbit shows the fairly defined heterogeneous habitus region with lobulative margins in the extra corner space with extra orbital extensions. There is a near complete resorption or erosion of the later wall. The lesion is heterogeneous enhancing with thin interlink enhancing septic. On check test, there is a prominent highlight marking the scene. Routine blood chemistry is normal, except there is a uh, ESR is high. And there is uncontrolled diabetes mellitus. And USG abdomen shows the mild hepatic bile with uterine thyroid. On clinical summary, the 45 year old female with prenatal painless progressive apexal progressive for the last two months. On examination, there are optimal visual, grade one RPD, firm non tender orbital mass, retrocussion test firm, later orbit mass not well defined. On investigation, there is cystic lean on this USG, prominent hyaluronic marking, high ESR, unbounded diabetes mellitus, and prone erosion in CCP. On, on this basis, we, we assume there is a this is a chance of aneurysm bone cyst or in fact a subparistral abscess, intracellular hemangioma, hydrogen cyst or epidermoid cyst. Uh, aneurysm bone cyst, they point the favor this is sudden in our incidence on onset. This is lighting expansion mass lesion, usually associated with pain. They point, I guess, this, this is a real lesion. In fact, the cyst, they very point favor the prominent highland market, uncontrolled diabetes. A point I guess this is most, mostly occur in the setting of orbital cellularities, particularly in the pediatric population. Hence, patients typically present with orbital sinus symptoms. Patients have monitors are negative and there is any there is any, no history of any TB. Intracellular hemangioma, the points of the the predominance in the four to fifth decrease left, or there is it occurs mainly in the females. And point again, this is slow, this is slow growing lesion, and they are after the classic cloud design of polka dots and appearance on the city. Hard is, point is paper that this is a painless progress practice and most common clinical prediction addresses, and there is an increase in ESR. And point again, there is a, any absence of ischemia in, in our patient, and there is a presence of bone destruction in our patient. Orbital vessel points in favor the most common cystic lesion is the orbital damage. And points against the disease slow green table is usually called the post abomination. The probability diagnosis will be based on the properly short duration, mass present on extra panel along the later wall. There is a resorption or regenerable. We make a proper diagnosis of aneurysm bone cyst. It can be a primary uh, aneurysm bone cyst or a secondary aneurysm bone cyst with occur secondary fiber dysplasia, giant cell fever. Non acidifying fibroma, quadroblastoma, osteosarcoma, and fibromyxoma. Uh, we planned a left eye anti orbital for X ray biopsy and semi surface pathology analysis. And this is an interoperative pattern. There is a high, highly vascular tumor. We saw interoperative, there is a, a body dissection. On histopathic finding, there is a necrosis in the slides, and there is a osteoformation and gasification in the cell. Uh, 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 and it come out that patient has a high grade of sarcoma with extensive necrosis. Uh, our histological feature are suggestive of osteogenic sar uh, osteogen sarcoma or osteosarcoma. Final diagnosis of melanogen patient will stand for the registration for the starting chemotherapy and we any, uh, advise the participant to evaluate the disease, disease metastatic disease or primary. <laughs> This is a, so much head and that osteosarcoma, so much related cases. There is only few studies are available. 
none of them show that there is any importance of chemotherapy or radiotherapy in the cases of uh, osteosarcoma. Thank you, Bupinder. We would love to have some questions, but before that, I'll invite Sahil for his. Uh, yeah. So, Dr. Sahil uh, was a senior resident with us. He is uh, now in a project with community and he is a uh, very talented and, again, young and dynamic oculoplastic surgeon. And uh, he'll be presenting another interesting case. Uh, we'll take the questions at the end so that we can finish the session on time. Uh, good afternoon to everyone here. So I'll be presenting this curious case of a baby born with globe luxation. Uh, I have no financial disclosures for the talk. So we had this 18 years old, uh, 18 hours old baby brought to our emergency with protruded right eyeball. The birth history was an uneventful normal vaginal delivery. On examination, we found that the child had unilateral protrusion of his right eye since birth. There was conjunctival chemosis and congestion with exposure keratopathy. The lids were not visible and had a dilated pupil. However, the fundus was within normal limits. Also, the other eye was within normal limits on examination. So, how to proceed in such cases? The questions that were to be answered were, is the child systematically fit enough to undergo an examination and anesthesia if at all required for coming to a diagnosis? And what would be the diagnosis in such a case? Was it a case of a true proptosis? Was it a biflon? Or was it a case of luxation of globe with retraction of the lids behind? So, scratching our veins uh, and coming to differentials for proptosis at birth, we thought of orbital teratoma, encephalocele meningocele, orbital capillary hemangioma, and hematoma. Encephalocele meningocele is defined as a protrusion of the kidney contents beyond the normal confines of the skull uh, caused by defect of the cranial orbital bones. They manifest soon at birth and have a proptosis, as, uh, but they have a soft tissue mass present there and have visible pulsation, which increases with bending forward and crying, which was absent in our case. Congenital orbital teratomas are rare tumors. They have progressive unilateral proptosis and they grow very rapidly. They again manifested birth with uh, showing exposure keratopathy. However, they have a destructive proptosis, which was absent again in our case. Orbital hematomas are common with forceps delivery and a difficult labors. They have marked echimosis of the lid, chemosis of the conjunctiva. However, they are also associated with abexial proptosis, associated scalp hematoma, and there is definite movement restriction in all directions. It could also have an unusual case of lymphangioma presenting right at birth. So, in our case, there was no visible skin echimosis or scalp hematoma. Also, there was no visible pulsation. So, we, it was neither a case of an encephalocele, meningocele, or a hematoma. So, we decided to go ahead with imaging. But what could be the modality in such a case? Anyone? We went ahead with the norm, uh, NC, NCCT. Why? It's rapid. It's easily available for us. We don't have to give a contrast, especially in an emergent time in the evening hours when we don't have other access to other modalities and can demarcate the bone very well. So on CT, we had artifacts with no bony defect, no tissue herniation, no mass lesion, no hematoma. So all major causes ruled out. Now, we were still uh, left uh, with this following answers, uh, following questions. But was it the absence of lid or was it a true luxation of the glue? Luxation of the glue with the retraction of the lid will be a, a case of anterior displacement of the eye where the equator of the glue protrudes beyond the retractile eyelids. The glue will be well formed in such cases. There will be marked congestion, proptosis and exposure keratopathy. On the other hand, a blepharon is congenital absence of the eyelids with exposure of cornea. However, there is minimal or no chemosis, no proptosis and the globe may or may not be well formed. This was a case report by us on severe microblepharon similar to a case of a blepharons uh, in which we had done a full thickness skin graft for rehabilitating the child published in International Ophthalmology, Ophthalmology in 2017. So all these features were absent in our case. So we only had a suspicion of globe uh, luxation left out and we went ahead with an examination and anesthesia plan for repositing the globe with or without canthotomy and a tarsography. This is a small video showing the improv steps that we had taken for the child. So coming again that the child had, it was a newborn male, 18 hours old, presenting with forward protrusion of the right eyeball since birth. There was completely exposed and prolapsed globe with the corneal haze present, diffuse congestion amid dilated pupil. We were very lucky that we are at AIMS and we were able to take up the child within four hours of presentation due to the dedicated uh, anesthesia team that we have. We had a proper periocular cleaning done using a betadine soaked swab stick. All 360 degrees should be very well done. Then the lower lid was slowly pulled away from the globe using a spatula and forceps. The globe was then manipulated using the lens spatula to prolapse slowly back into the orbit inferiorly. A similar maneuver was then done for the upper lid, pulling the upper lid away from the globe. 
and we had a very well repositioned globe. After repositioning, this step is very mandatory as thorough cleaning of both upper and lower lid should be done, especially of the areas that are trapped behind the laxative globe, as well as the palpable and bulbar conjunctiva, so as to prevent any undue foreign bodies infection getting trapped inside the furnaces. Towards the end, a uh, temporary suture tarsography always helps us in supporting the globe in such cases. So, coming to discussion, uh, luxation of the globe is entered displacement of the eye usually behind uh, when the equator of the globe protrudes beyond the retracted eyelids and the lids close behind it. Uh, on based on etiology, it can be divided into three categories: spontaneous, voluntary, and traumatic. Uh, the pathophysiology that lies behind is any undue pressure, posterior pressure against the globe causes the globe to move anteriorly, advancing it forwards. The cornea becomes dry. Uh, it induces a blink reflex so as to uh, rehabilitate the dryness. This causes the orbiculus to come into action, and then the cycle continues. So this was the child at 18 hours of life and immediate post-op at 24 hours of life. And the child was very healthy with a good visual vision and uh, uh, good restriction, uh, a good uh, extra ocular movement in six weeks of life. Uh, on doing the literature, of, uh, literature a review of literature, we found that there was no single case reported at birth with spontaneous globe luxation. However, this, there was just one case uh, of such luxation at birth following traumatic delivery. We were able to report this very recently in the World Journal of Emergency Medicine. To come to a conclusion, in the present case, even though there were no signs of periorbital trauma, we all know that the newborn, uh, newborn bones are pliable and the orbits are shallow. So we hypothesize that due to the manual pressure at the time of delivery of the temporal region, that must have caused the globe to prolapse out. And such early identification and timely intervention can definitely help to save them. Thank you for your patient hearing. Okay, so thank you, uh, Sahil. Uh, that was an interesting uh, you, case. Sir and very nicely presented and it was an interesting case but it's sorry for the child and the family too and see uh here this in your case one i have one doubt you have this uh this this kid it was spontaneous uh sublux it, uh, it, it was it was, uh, was it throughout the time or is it come back to the normal so position also it presented us with protrusion it was still there even at, after 18 hours of birth right from the birth parents said uh -huh. that there was a protrusion of the globe which was present as such till the time we uh, repositioned it back in the it orbit was, you see in, the, in this picture which you have shown the cornea seems to be look shiny right sir. so this was a little bit unexpected because if it is exposed lighter they would so expose your keratopathy yes. also that's so why there was a little keratopathy relatively yes, 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 yes. okay uh another thing like there's no any history of uh birth uh, delivery a traumatic no, delivery there was no there was no trauma so that's yeah. why we expected that probably the undue pressure that we could provide while pulling the baby out yeah. that we give over the temple region that must have caused the globe to collapse out. yes yes okay very really interesting so any any take up any any anyone have any more questions uh any query doubts thank you so much yeah thank you thank you sahil so with that, uh, we'll go to the next speaker. Uh, Marina Alani is here. Uh, so we have uh, Dr. Marina Alani. Uh, she will be speaking on un unraveling the mystery of an unusual orbital pathology. Yeah. Uh, OK, I'll uh, start. So a 62-year-old male hailing from North Delhi, who was an engineer by profession, presented to us with the chief complaints of protrusion of the right eye. For more than a year, the uh, proptosis was gradual, painless, and progressive. He also had complaints of double vision. There was no associated diminution of vision. He also gave history that he had noticed a hardness in the right side of the cheek, which was present since eight nine years and had progressed over the past two years into a swelling so systemic history he was a known diabetic but the sugars were well controlled his hp even c was 6.2 and uh, he had history of uh, coronary artery bypass grafting done in 2013 and root canal in 2014. Uh, important negative history there was no history of trauma we took history of weight loss to rule out any neoplasm or tb uh, to rule out any inflammatory disease, there was no history of pain or redness, uh, had no history of cough, shortness of breath, and we are here ruling out sinusitis. There was no history of nasal stuffiness, runny nose, headache, or epistaxis. To rule out any history of immunocompromise, uh, there was no history of drug abuse, organ transplantation, or corticosteroid use. So on examination, you can see that there is a facial asymmetry present on the right side. You can see that there is a cheek swelling present. And along with that, there is uh, 
fullness of the upper lid and inferior scleral show on inspection. On worm's eye view, you see that there is a proptosis of the right eye. It was an abaxial proptosis and it measured of about 7 mm on hurdles and with a superior dystopia of 2.5 mm. Uh, going to palpation, retropulsion was mildly positive and uh, we could palpate the mass in the infrotemporal quadrant. It was firm to hard, it was uh, non-tender, it was non-reducible, bony margins could be felt separately and the cheek swelling uh, we palpated, the extent was one centimeter lateral to the lateral nasal wall, extending to one centimeter anterior to the tragus, and inferiorly the line passing through the upper lip. So uh, on uh, vision was 6-6 six, six, and uh, the fundus was within normal limit, the pupillary reactions were normal and the um, extraocular movements, the abduction was limited and the dextro depression was limited. Okay, so based on the history and the clinical examination, the history was of a painless unilateral gradual proptosis and uh, uh, with the firm to hard swelling in the orbit and the cheek, we uh, came to the following differentials that it could be a neoplasm, uh, probably benign, probably a peripheral nerve sheath tumor. It could be a sclerosing type of inflammatory disease. It could be a chronic infection like a tuberculosis or a fungal lesion. So we did the inflammatory workup and nothing came positive. Only ANA was elevated. The chest x-ray was normal. The MAN2 was negative. The HIV was negative. So let's go to the imaging. Here we see a T1 weighted MRI. This is the actual section. You see that there is a hypo intense lesion in the infro uh, infrolateral uh, uh, extra conal space, not well defined. And again, here you see the IR is involved and the adjacent paranasal sinuses are clear. T2 again, heterogeneous lesion, retroorbital, infrotemporal quadrant, ill defined. On contrast enhancement, we can see that there is a peripheral ring enhancement, which points towards that it could be an abscess. So uh, then this is the MRI of the cheek lesion and the cheek lesion is separate from the lesion in the orbit. There's no direct contiguity that we could establish. You can see here that the, uh, it's an ill-defined lesion, which is hypointense and here it's heterogeneously enhancing. So now after the clinical and the radiological findings, we thought it could be a cold abscess since it was long standing and the cheek lesion was there for almost eight to nine years. It was painless and um, uh, so probably cold abscess and or an infective lesion, a fungal lesion, though the sinuses were clear, there was no sinus involvement or it could be a cystic neoplasm, probably a schwannoma. So since the cheek lesion was very superficial, we referred the patient to the maxillofacial department if they could do a possible biopsy and it came out as aspergillosis. But we had a diagnostic dilemma as the cheek lesion was separate and the orbital lesion was separate. There was no direct contiguity between the two lesions. The galactomanine levels were ordered and they came out to be negative. ENT evaluation was done and the maxillary sinus was not involved. So we were in a dilemma whether is it aspergillosis or if there is an um, incidental another lesion present in the orbit. So we went ahead and we uh, did an orbitotomy and took out the lesion. It looks like an abscess only you can see the thick walls of the abscess. The, this was sent for histopath examination and on histopath what we can see is that these are uh, the histopath is courtesy to Professor Seema Sain. Uh, we can see cholesterol clefts which are present which are present in chronic lesions. There is central necrosis, there is peripheral inflammatory cells we can see and on the special stain on the GMS we can see that there are acute angled branching hyphae which are present which was again it confirmed a diagnosis of aspergillosis but it was a surprise because the sinus was not involved and though he was diabetic but his sugars were well controlled he'd had no history of an immunocompromise and the two lesions were not in contact with the sinuses so the medical management was done he was given iv he was admitted for two weeks iv boriconazole was given and he was discharged on oral 
So this is after two months of treatment. You can see that the uh, the proptosis has resolved, and the extracocular movements are full and free. And even uh, the radiological resolution you can uh, see. Uh, management in brief: uh, aspergillosis should be like an immunocompetent. We'll make two categories, immunocompetent patients and immunocompromised. So you should have a high index of suspicion. You should always uh, rule out, you should always keep these things in the history that whether the uh, patient has history of AIDS or hematological malignancy or uh, steroid use or uncontrolled diabetes, or if he hails from an endemic region or environmental exposure. In that case, you can go ahead with the imaging with the histopath. And if it's confirmed, if it's a sinoorbital disease, the ENT people can do the debridement and you can start the patient on voriconazole. Uh, or in our case, as it was in abscesses and abscesses respond poorly to medical treatment, then you can go ahead and take out. So uh, this was a retrospective study done in our center where, you know, aspergillosis has uh, presentations in young individuals which were also immunocompetent. So what are the common? So you should look out for these presentations. Then aspergillus can be present in immunocompetent individuals as well. The most common being a proptosis, which could be painful or painless and can be associated with restriction in extracurricular movements, uh, diplopia, decrease in vision. So this was a literature search done for immunocompetent individuals. And here you can see that it's mostly presents like a sinoorbital disease. It doesn't present only as an orbit without the sinus involvement. Uh, the systemic treatment, voriconazole versus amphotericin. This study was published in New England Journal of Medicine. And uh, uh, they said that voriconazole group had better clinical outcomes, better survival rate, and even the drug-related events were very less. So, voriconazole is medically a better uh, option than amphotericin. Serum galactomanan levels, what role does it play? So, in patients with hematological malignancies, it, it's very useful. It helps in early diagnosis of invasive aspergillosis. And they found out that the baseline levels and the after the treatment, the levels go down or become negative. So it correlates well with the therapeutic response, also with the survival. So if you do it and it comes negative twice in a two week, then you can stop the treatment and that has a good correlation with the survival. Though in non-hematological patients, it has a low diagnosis. Renani, we will miss the lunch today. I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay, so take home messages that uh, even if there is an absence of a sinus disease, uh, you should keep uh, uh, a high index of suspicion for long-standing lesions in close vicinity. Consider aspergillosis in your differential because there are case reports where they did not keep it and they thought it was an inflammatory disease and started on steroids and worsened the outcome. Thank you. Thank you so much. Very well presented. And we have two more cases remaining, but I think everyone must be very, very hungry. And so we just the team decided that we will probably resume with the two talks that are left post lunch. So let's have lunch and then finish this session and begin with the next session after that. So we'll see you in around half an hour. We'll start at 1.45 for the next session. All right. Thank you so much. Let's let please all go out for lunch. Problem. You come at the right time. Please join us.
Maybe also. इसको ट्रांसफर करना है मैम इतना आर पी सी डी नहीं डी नहीं वर्कशॉप एक पी पी टी अलग नीचे और कुछ ऐसे हाँ हाँ ये वाला इसको मैं दिया था पेन ड्राइव नहीं नहीं ठीक है यार यार हेलो बेटा
So welcome back. Uh, quickly, we'll go to the two more case, uh, challenging cases are there, which are left over for the previous session. So now uh, I invite Dr. Navneet to present uh, the, the challenging cases uh, and amelotelic intraocular mass masquerading as coral melanoma. Good afternoon, everyone. I'll be presenting the case of a 29 years old male who presented to us with chief complaints of redness and watering in the right eye for three days. Patient had an accidental insect entry in the right eye three days back before presentation. There was history of redness and watering, not associated with diminution of vision, pain or discharge, no history of any flashes or floaters, and there was no known systemic history. On examination, the systemic examination was within normal limits. Ocular examination, both eyes visual acuity was 6 by 6. And anterior segment examination, there was mild congestion present in the right eye and rest of the findings were within normal limits. However, on examination of the fundus in the right eye, there was an intraocular mass present at the posterior pole, which, had, which, which was amelanotic and was abutting the nasal margin of the optic nerve. And on ultrasound of the right eye, there was a dome-shaped homogeneous mass uh, present arising from the choroid measuring 7.34 mm in apical thickness and 11.84 mm in largest basal diameter with mild to moderate internal reflectivity with a positive kappa sign. An FFA and ICG of the eye was done and it showed a large homogeneous circular hyperfluorescent area in the nasal retina showing no internal vasculature and the macular area showed a normal perfusion. So we made a diagnosis of a right eye amelanotic choroidal melanoma based on these findings. And the patient was advised a CE MRI, which showed an intraocular mass abutting the optic disc, which was hyperintense on, on T1 and hyperintense on T2. And a FDG a PET CT was done showing a mildly metabolic mass in the posterior medial aspect with a SUV max of 1.59 and no metastasis elsewhere. So this patient was uh, counseled for a stereotactic gamma knife radio surgery. Uh, why? Because this patient had a functional visual acuity of 6 by 6 in the right eye. So we didn't advise uh, enucleation for this patient and uh, was not amenable to plaque brachytherapy also because the tumor was situated right at the posterior pole. So this is the clinical picture of the funders post gamma knife surgery at 6 months. Uh, there was a decrease in size uh, with the mass measuring 6.2 millimeters in apical thickness and 9.9 millimeters in the largest basal diameter. And this also shows the residual uh, fibrosis after the uh, gamma knife therapy. And the post-op visual acuity was 6 per 24 in the right eye. But after 15 months, the patient presented to us again with uh, no uh, PL uh, visual acuity in the right eye. And the mass was present again at the posterior pole with a total regmetogenous retinal detachment. And the mass on ultrasound measured 15.2 millimeters in apical thickness and 15.9 millimeters in the largest basal diameter with a total re retinal detachment. FDG PET CT was repeated with a mass with SUV max of 3.21 and VER showed no significant response in the right eye. So based on this, uh, we planned the patient for enucleation with a primary silicon orbital implant. A histopathology of the eye showed spindle-shaped cells arranged in fascicles with focal cystic changes, that is antennae A and antennae uh, B bodies. And immunological stains were also done, which showed positivity for S100. However, the sample was negative for HMB45 and melon A, CD34, GFAP and KI67. So based on the histopathology, a final diagnosis of right eye intraocular schwannoma was made. So this is the clinical picture post-operatively six months with right eye artificial eye in situ. So what is an intraocular schwannoma? It's also known as neurilemoma. It's a very rare tumor arising from the iris, ciliary body or the choroid. But it may also arise from the Schwann cells of the ciliary nerves which enter the posterior aspect of the sclera. And it's an encapsulated non-pigmented mass which is rarely malignant. It's also called a pseudomelanoma because of its difficulty in di differentiating from uveal melanoma. So, histopathology is very essential in the diagnosis for this mass. It may present with different uh, clinical presentations like diminution of vision, leukocoria, floaters, neurovascular glaucoma or maybe an incidental finding. It may be associated with systemic features of neurofibromatosis. So, what could have been different in our patient? We could have either observed the patient 
or we could have done a biopsy in the first uh, setup so biopsy is very important especially in cases with diagnostic dilemma and it can be done in cases where with amelanotic melanoma and especially when we have a confusion in the diagnosis so how do we differentiate choroidal melanoma from an intraocular schwannoma melanoma arises from melanocytes whereas schwannoma arises from schwann cells melanoma may be pigmented or non pigmented schwannoma is always non pigmented histopathology shows spindle cells epithelioid cells or a mixed pathology in melanoma whereas on uh, in schwannoma it's spindle cells with long eosinophilic cytoplasmic processes what is important is uh, immunohistochemistry which is positive for s100 hmb45 melan a cd34 gfap sox10 and ki67 in melanoma whereas schwannoma is positive for s100 and uh, leu7 so my take home message would be that schwannoma even though it's a rare, rare benign proliferation of the schwann cells intraocularly differentiation is very important from a melanotic melanoma and confirmatory diagnosis is always made after a histopathology report thank you thank you navni that was a great presentation so navni this is a very hard working and committed senior resident doing great work in oncology thank you, thank you. and we have professor kashyap here ma'am would you like to say something about the histopathology uh, of schwannoma some comments also could have been one of the modalities of uh, uh, diagnosis you could have done an intraocular fnac and on that we can do immunohistochemistry so there itself we could have made a diagnosis so otherwise uh, yeah schwannomas are spindle shell uh, spindle shaped cells they are uh, benign tumors unlike uh, melanoma and s100 is positive hmb45 as you have rightly uh, pointed out yes, but one of those things which i said intraocular fnac can be tried yes, in diagnostic uh, and difficulties. Yes, uh, uh, ma'am, you are absolutely correct here. In this case, like usually for this melanoma, no intraocular melanoma is like straightforward diagnosis by around 60 70 percent. We get diagnosed with indirect ophthalmoscope and then uh, uh, supported by the ultrasound and all. So sometimes we get become over diagnosis, like like this uh, this type of uh, schwannoma is very very rare in intra intraocular schwannoma, no. So you are rightly pointed out that in case of like a melanotic type where there's not typical sign of this uh, pigmentation or of choroidal melanoma is there. Yeah, definitely we should have uh, done uh, FNSC and then go ahead with the uh, treatment, whatever is suitable for it. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, ma'am. So uh, now we have a, a, a speaker from uh, Dr. Kusumita, she's SR. Uh, she will be speaking on pigmented conjectural mass in a young boy. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'll be speaking about the case of pigmented conjectural mass in a young boy. Uh, the, he was a nine-year-old male child presented with mass in the uh, right eye since one month associated with decreased vision, redness, photophobia and bloody discharge. Uh, informant was his father and it was reliable. It was a peanut sized dark colored mass noticed in the right eye uh, associated with difficulty in opening and closing the eyes. Also, uh, we can make out multiple wrinkles, uh, freckles uh, all over his face which was noticed since 6 months of his age uh, which first appeared in nose and then uh, spread all over the body and also had an history of photosensitivity and photophobia. There was no family history or uh, in the siblings. Uh, moving ahead to systemic as said, uh, there, there are multiple prickles frick, uh, interspersed all over the body with hypo hyperpigmented uh, macules with crustaceans all over the body. There were no regional lymphadenopathy, uh, other systems were within normal limit. On ocular examination, uh, the un uh, visual acuity in the right eye was uh, PL positive PR accurate with inadequate closure of eyelids. On conjunctiva, we can make out an hyper, uh, hyperpigmented mass uh, with irregular surface uh, with a bloody discharge overlying it. Uh, rest, the, uh, rest of the anterior segment findings were not visible and further moving to uh, examination under anesthesia, we noted uh, the hyperpigmented mass arising from the temporal bulbar conjunctiva uh, along with the limbus from 6 o'clock to 12 o'clock hours with adjacent cornea involving whereas the nasal cornea appeared clear uh, 
and the nasal anterior segment also appeared normal. Further, we move ahead to investigations on USG uh, of posterior segment. It seems to be anechoic. On MRI of brain and orbit, uh, uh, the T uh, the T1 weighted image showed an hyper uh, hyper intense lesion, uh, plague like lesion in the epibulbar region, limited uh, in the epibulbar epibulbar region on T1 and T2 weighted image with post contrast enhancement, uh, thus suggesting of melanoma. So the provisional diagnosis of xeroderma pigmentosa was made with right eye conjectival melanoma and with left eye conjectival xerosis. So we planned ahead with left eye uh, wide local excision of the conjectival mass with cryo application at the margins along with amniotic membrane grafting uh, over the conjunctiva and cornea under general anesthesia. Uh, this is a short video represent uh, showing the same case uh, wherein initially the margins were uh, wide margins were marked all around. Um, and the uh, dissection was done with a note, uh, minimal uh, manipulation and no touch technique was followed. The conjectival side was dissected using the crescent blade. The conjectival decision, uh, dissection was little difficult because the extent was not, uh, couldn't be assessed uh, clearly. So initially debulking was done at the uh, corneal side. So uh, the remaining part was re uh, again dissected back with the uh, crescent on the cornea. Uh, then cryo was applied at the margins. Applying cryo at the base of the uh, clera and applying absolute alcohol over the corneal side as well and followed by amniotic application and suturing it. Moving ahead, ahead to the histopath report, uh, histopath uh, uh, on H and E stein low power uh, view of the conject uh, the conjunctival tissue showed uh, the spindle cell uh, spindle cells groups of fascicles of spindle cells were visible here represented here harrow and on the high power view the cellular atypia and cytoplasmic malignant pigments was visible uh, along with uh, prominent nucleoli within the uh, within the spindle cells were also seen and uh, a surrounded necro surrounding necrosis was also visible all these features suggestive of malignant conjunctival melanoma then the patient was uh, followed up uh, the post op patient was the patient was kept on uh, eye drop interferon prophylactically for four times a day uh, uh, for three months. Uh, at the end of three months, the patient has a best corrected vision of six by twelve, six by twelve, with cornea having a uh, clear cornea with LSAD uh, inferotemporal area, with, and follow up having having no recurrence. And the patient was kept on a uh, regular follow up every three to six months to look for uh, other signs of any malignancies. So, zero derma, uh, zero derma pigmentosa is an hereditary condition with, uh, with an autosomal recessive pattern which will have a consequity of parents more commonly. Uh, so, the ocular manifestation mainly occurs in the sun exposed areas like lid, cornea and conjunctiva and photophobia is the most common manifestation. Uh, apart from that, the patient can present with uh, pterygium, xerosis, uh, conjunctival pigmentation, OSSN. Other than that, the ocular neoplasms that can occur is in the frequency of, uh, is in the order of squamous cell neoplasia followed by basal cell and malignant melanoma. So, conjunctival melanoma is a rare presentation and usually manifests at an younger age group as the patient uh, uh, will have a shorter lifespan. Um, and also the ins uh, they represent around 5% of only ocular tumors. So 
uh, high suspicion is required and uh, followed by which uh, early aggressive treatment is required as we did with wide local excision and cryotherapy and um, uh, AMG and close follow up of the patient is required. Thank you. Thank you, Kusumita. Excellent presentation. Very nicely documented. So Kusumita is a very bright and enthusiastic senior resident working in oncology. Yeah, doing commendable work. Thank you. Any questions for this case or we can move on? Just a surgical excision was done and then no uh, further uh, like thing was required any adjunctive uh, Sir, adju topical chemotherapy or anything like that adjuvant we had given interferon alpha 2b for three months uh four times a day we had mentioned and there are few case series where uh, uh in these mel uh, melanoma and pam conditions where the interferons is being used uh, especially with positive margin conditions and which which showed good good response with no recurrence uh, but some, very few uh, ca case reports. Some were, other but... topical chemotherapy is also described for conjunctival melanoma, isn't it? Like MMC also? Yeah. Uh, MMC. Uh, what is the latest status on that? But the uh, epithelial toxicity and the uh, other things are high in mitomycin. Yeah, in this case, maybe because the cornea was it's also involved so thinner, so it may have been. Yeah. And, all right. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Kusumita. Thank you, sir. So now moving on to the uh, third session, uh, today's uh, workshop is orbital pathologies and infections. And for the first speaker, we have uh, uh, a very uh, highly experienced and then a very senior Madam Professor Bauna Choda. She will be uh, speaking on the management of orbital regional blastoma. Thank you, Lomi, for the generous introduction and uh, thank you for this opportunity. Very happy to be a part of this workshop. Oh, can we have the lights for uh, demo? So uh, over the next few minutes, I'll be giving a brief overview of our experience uh, with orbital retinal blastoma something that we've been doing for more than a decade now at our center and uh, the impact that the multimodal approach to treatment has had on these patients. So as you all know, the goals of therapy for retinoblastoma primarily depend upon the stage at which the tumor a child presents to us. The first and foremost, of course, being a life-threatening condition, it is to save the life of the patient. We have been trying to save eyes as well. And now with the latest advances in different therapeutic modalities, conservative globe salvage management treatments that we have, we're also able to save the vision in children who do present to us in, at that stage. Uh, so why is orbital retinoblastoma so important and what is its relevance, particularly in the Indian scenario? So this was a paper that was published by our team in the British Journal of Ophthalmology in 2016, where 600 patients of retinoblastoma were reviewed. These were ones that were actually presenting to RP Center. And what was really alarming here was to see that children with extraocular tumor at presentation comprise more than one fourth of the patient population. And of these 16% were already metastatic. So clearly it tells us about the magnitude of the problem and how critical it is to address the issue. Now, going beyond India, if you look at Asia, 43% of the global burden of retinoblastoma is in Asia. And that is why, uh, you know, there are certain treatment modalities that are specifically have to be designed to be able to address the lower middle income countries and the poor countries, which, you know, may not be the priority in the West. So orbital retinoblastoma is one of them. Now, as we all know, it is a major contributor to mortality. As seen in our own paper, the statistics that we did, and also by different other investigators and groups all over the world, orbital retinoblastoma, once there's extraocular disease, is a major contributor to mortality and a great risk factor. So how do these children present to us? Most often they present as proptosis. There may be accompanying pain and redness. If the glow uh, is still, uh, you can view and it is uh, still visible. You can sometimes also see leukocoria. There may be a stephyloma in more advanced cases. There could be a fungal mass. And sometimes you also have children with localized lymph node uh, enlargement. 
So uh, the diagnosis essentially, once we uh, have a suspicion of orbital retinoblastoma based on the history and clinical presentation, what is really critical is to do a, a good protocol-based contrast MRI of the orbit and brain, wherein we use uh, you know, both T1 and T2 weighted images, contrast enhanced, fat suppressed, and then we go ahead with this imaging to be able to confirm the diagnosis. It also helps us to define the local extent of the disease and then, of course, sometimes in bilateral cases, there may also be the possibility of a trilateral retinoblastoma, which can then only be ruled out by MRI. Once we have the MRI and we know that this is a case of orbital retinoblastoma, a metastatic workup is a must in all such cases presenting with these kind of symptoms. So for that, we have our team in the pediatric oncology department where they do a complete workup, including baseline biochemistry, bone marrow biopsy, CSF examination, bone scans, and also sometimes a whole body PET CD scan to look at the state of distant metastasis. Now, uh, we are specifically going to talk about multimodal approach over here and how it has changed the management of orbital retinoblastoma. So, in many, many years ago, these patients were treated with orbital excentration, which, of course, apart from being a disfiguring surgery, was also associated with poor survival outcomes. And that is why there was a need to define a more um, standard treatment protocol for these patients. And that's how multimodal approach came into being. But what it essentially means is once you have a child with orbital retinoblastoma, they're first treated with three to six cycles of neoadjuvant chemotherapy. This is given in the form of intravenous systemic chemotherapy. And after three to six cycles, initially after three cycles, we repeat an MRI to see the treatment response. And then if it is not adequate for an enucleation, we can continue up to another three cycles. By and large, most of these patients show a good response to neoadjuvant chemotherapy. The eyeball the globe shrinks, the tumor shrinks, and then it is amenable to surgery. So an enucleation is carried out followed by an external beam radiotherapy to the orbit and the remaining cycles of intravenous adjuvant chemotherapy. So this is briefly to explain how it works. So if you look at the International Retinoblastoma Staging System, which is proposed by Dr. Shantida from Argentina, stage three are the patients with these kind of orbital regional extensions that may or may not be accompanied by lymph node extension. And these are the patients that respond best to this kind of a multimodal therapeutic approach. This was the first randomized study on orbital retinoblastoma published uh, ever in the ophthalmic literature. And in this study, which was from our center, our group basically evaluated uh, patients uh, with respect to two different treatment protocols. One was the VEC protocol, and one was the five drug treatment protocol of ringcrystine, cyclophosphamide, idorubicin, alternating with etoposide and carboplatin. So this was a randomized study. Patients were divided into two, randomized basically into two groups groups and treated with these specific uh, chemotherapy protocols. Now, what did they we find? To, basically, in a nutshell, what we found was that at one year, the survival, kaplan meier survival for both group A and group B patients was comparable, 81% and 79% respectively. But at four years, the survival for group A patients, if you remember, they were treated with the VC protocol, was significantly better than that for group B patients that were treated with the five drug protocol. So this has become the standard of treatment at our center. And this is one such case. You can see what I was talking about. You have this uh, large orbital mass on the left-hand side responding extremely well to three cycles of neoadjuvant chemotherapy over here you can see on the right and similarly the similar response you can see on the MRI the mass here and this this very shrunken thysical kind of globe which is now amenable to enucleation so we can operate and treat post-operatively with radiotherapy and adjuvant chemotherapy. This is another example of a stage 3B disease where I was talking where there is lymph node extension as well. Again, treated with a similar treatment protocol, MRI over here at presentation. You can see the optic nerve is thickened all the way up to the orbital apex and also showing right-sided preauricular and cervical lymph node enlargement. But again, this responded very nicely to the chemotherapy protocol that we are using.
Now, uh, metastatic disease becomes more tricky because there you have stage 4A cases with hematogenous metastasis. You can have stage 4B cases with CNS extension where the prognosis is even more dismal. So for that, for some cases, we can subject them to autologous stem cell transplantation. And this modality has helped in some cases with hematogenous metastasis, although the outcome of this with CNS metastasis still remains very poor. So this is one such case who presented with 4A disease and over here it was the right maxillary sinus that was involved you can see on the MRI same uh, picture on CT scan and the PET CT also uh, showed a uh, sorry, PET CT also showed a large mass lesion in the right maxillary sinus and the distant um, metastasis also in the proximal shaft of the femur. So this was a case of 4A disease treated by autologous stem cell transplantation, PET CT after six months, no metabolically active lesion was seen. But this is not always the case. Once the child develops hematogenous metastasis, there is no magic treatment, there is no miracle. If it works, well and good, but uh, those with CNS metastasis, it definitely doesn't work. Uh, for this multimodal treatment protocol, we also now have long-term follow-ups of these patients. This was a child seven years later when he presented to us. He had a, a stage three disease with tumor extending all the way along the optic nerve right up to the pre-chiasmatic segment. And this is seven years later uh, after having completed treatment, the optic nerves are normal, the optic chiasma is normal, he's enucleated in that eye, but the other eye, the vision is six by six. Challenges remain, like I said, stage 4B metastatic uh, CNS metastasis is still very challenging to deal with. And most of the times these patients are offered palliative care rather than intent to cure. Now the whole world is coming together, and this is the global retinoblastoma presentation and analysis published recently in JAMA Oncology, where many countries have come together and presented their data, and the outcomes are, again, what was expected, that children from low-middle-income countries are, are the ones that have more advanced disease. And given that this treatment, this cancer is curable, these data are certainly concerning, and they mandate intervention at national and international levels. Before I end, I would like to express my gratitude to Dr. Jerry Shields and Dr. Carol Shields for inspiring me throughout this journey. And I'm very, very grateful for the support that we received at RP Center from our chief, from the faculty, from our residents, and from all the staff. These are some glimpses of the Retinoblastoma Awareness Week program that we had last week, and the week has just finished today. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you so much, ma'am. This was a very uh, illustrious, uh, very lovely presentation. And then you have uh, a cover up a very difficult uh, manage, managing part of these extraocular retinoblastoma cases. Thank you so much. Is there any, any questions to take? Thank yeah. you. Ma'am, in that study that you quoted from the center, uh, <clears throat> the VEC protocol that was used, was it standard or high dose? Yeah, it was high dose because for extraocular we use only high dose. Okay, yeah, so using high use, dose uh, Yeah, VEC. we use basically high dose VEC versus five drug treatment. Okay. So it is with great pleasure that I invite Dr. Lomi for the next talk. And he's a wonderful surgeon, a great colleague to work with, and I'm very, very proud of the work that he's doing. So the podium is all yours, Lomi. Thank you so much, ma'am, for a kind introduction. So uh, I was speaking on the current perspective in the management of choroidal melanoma. So it, you all know that melanoma is, uh, choroidal melanoma is the most uh, common uh, intraocular adult uh, intraocular tumor. So uh, the diagnosis is like uh, it, it, when a present, present, patient can present as a accidental uh, diminution of the, accidentally doing ophthalmoscope fundus examination, it can present as a floaters or, or progressive visual loss or uh, par, uh, paracentral scotoma or with a blurry vision where there is associated retinal detachment. So uh, when you see this type of uh, cases, this is very typical choroidal melanoma. We can all pick it up. We usually present as dome shape or it can be present as mushroom shape in ultrasound or sometimes color button shape. Uh, it may be a, a melanotic or a melanotic or it may be associated with or without retinal detachment. So when you see uh, such cases, we basically uh, pick, 
take this those patient for the ultrasound. So we do the ultrasound B and uh, B by A scan. We see that when we run the vectors through the, through this lesion, we see the low to moderate amplitude spikes over here. And initially there is high spike and this is fall repeat fall down from this uh, uh, this inter internal reflectivity in the in the lesions. So this is a very typical sign of this uh, cordial melanoma, which is seen in uh, these ultrasound pictures, where you see a, a, a dome shape or mushroom shape in a base skin with a cordial, uh, cordial excavation with an acoustic shadowing is there. Uh, and a very typical sign, this is the, the a steep angle kappa. This angle kappa is there. So with this findings, you can make it the diagnosis of cordial melanoma. Sometimes it may be difficult to differentiate uh, hemangioma. So you, you, uh, fundus fluorescence angiography is helpful. It which shows the early hypofluorescence and then late hyperfluorescence in case of uh, melanoma. Whereas in case of hemangioma, you see a early hyperfluorescence and followed by late, hyper, uh, late hyperfluorescence is there. Sometimes OCT is also helpful when this lesion is very small, where you see a normal uh, retinal thickness, index photoreceptors with some debris, uh, debris on the back of retina. And sometimes there may be serious retinal detachment can be seen. And on MRI, uh, basically it's done to see the, if there's any extraocular uh, uh, involvement is there or, or the optic nerve involvement is there. On T2 weighted images, we see the hypo intense lesion and then uh, T1, you will see the hyper intense lesions. PET CT scan is, is usually indicated where because it's a malignant disease. So, and the most common site of of uh, of metastasis is uh, liver. So, we basically as best line we do in all the cases where you see here in this case uh, uh, we see a, uh, a liver metastasis here. The high FTG uptake is there. Sometimes you see a, a typical uh, presentation where uh, like a melanotic type or diffused, diffused uh, multi, multi nodular thickness is there or deep, diffused corneal thickness uh, lesion is there or sometimes very anteriorly located uh, tumor is there. So in this case, we, we usually go for the FNSC here. Just want to show this video, FNSC. So out here uh, we use a, a 25 gauge uh, trocar cannula to a parse plana root. It is done under uh, local anesthesia. Patient have to be explained uh, about the procedure. Uh, if there is any chance of um, uh, risk of tumor spelling is there. And also we have to pre-prepared uh, and then co co coordinate with the pathologies about this uh, the sample which we'll be sending. Usually it's a, it's a liquid biopsy and then we, we will require the immediate, immediate transfer of the, uh, uh, this biopsy. So we insert a 24 gauge needle through the 23 gauge needle trocar cannula. So we insert through the lesion, avoiding the vessels, and then we give a to and fro movement. At the same time, the assistant can uh, have to have to pull the plunger of the of the syringes so that there is suction is there. And immediately, uh, you can put a cryotherapy, or either you can close it uh, with a six zero or uh, by crate sutures. And the sample has been has to be sent immediately to the pathologist. Uh, So next, so what all can be done? We have seen various uh, various cases here. So what all can be done for these uh, choroidal masses, for these choroidal tumors? So the, there are various factors which determine the methods for management. So starting with the size, the size of the tumor, the location of the tumor, and the extent of the tumor. Also look look into account the visual status of the affected eye and of the fe fellow eye, the age and general condition of the patients, and also explain all the procedures, take the consent and the wishes whether to re retain the globe in case of large choroidal melanoma. So uh, the treatment strategies can be seen in this flow chart. We, when we, we divided the uh, melanoma into small, medium, and large based on the COM study, where for for a small uh, choroidal mass for small choroidal melanoma, you can either observe or do, can do uh, thermotherapy, or for the medium uh, uh, choroidal uh, melanoma, a plaque brachytherapy is a gold standard, or 
or you can for thicker tumor you can consider for the combined plug bracket therapy with uh, transpapillary thermotherapy or the, you can use gamma knife surgeries and also the proton beam therapy is another options for large either you use gamma knife therapy or proton beam therapy or sometimes transcleral growth that may can be done where it is very really large for the uh, for the radiation therapy or you can do inoculation and exenteration for a small size tumor, uh, transpapillary thermotherapy is usually indicated where tumor thickness is less than three millimeter size. So in this case, we see that pre-treatment uh, and then the, when the, when we indicate is like where you see any tumor uh, increasing in size based on the OCD scan or subretinal fluids are just start coming out, then can consider for uh, transpapillary thermotherapy. Then plug bracket therapy, whether you can use retain 106 or iron 125. For tumor thickness less than 5 millimeter, retain 106 is indicated. And for larger, uh, less than 10 millimeter, is iron 125 is indicated. And the usual radiation dose at the apex is 70 to 100 gray. So these are the two plugs which are uh, currently uh, in use in our center, the Baba Atomic Research Center plug. There's notch plug and then another is a round plug. So this is one case where we, uh, where plug bracket therapy has been done for the medium size, and then this is pre and post treatment results. The another way along uh, with a size of uh, five, uh, five milli uh, millimeter thickness, where uh, bracket therapy has been done, and you can see uh, at 12 months, there's a decrease in apical thickness to 2.1 mm. Another combined plug bracket therapy can be used uh, for the thicker tumor, where, or especially in case of routine one zero six, it has a steep dose gradient in large tumor, so that the apex dose may not reach the recommended dose of 85 gray. If it is higher, higher gray uh, radiation dose, there might be scalar necrosis might be there. So it is avoidable. And for that one, there's uh, you can use either sandwich technique that is a plug bracket therapy from epistolar area and then intra uh, from the anterior apex, you can do the, uh, the transpiratory thermotherapy. So there's one case with 6.2 millimeter apical thickness. Uh, vision is 6 by 18 here, and we do the uh, uh, combined therapy. And uh, this is a six month results showing uh, decrease in the, uh, uh, on the epical thickness here. So, radiation retinopathy is one of the most common complications we, we see in case of plug bracket therapy. So, uh, so, treatment for this has to be considered while, uh, while especially uh, this uh, bracket therapy has been uh, to consider. It's basically because of the rise of the uh, of the VGF due to evil melanoma or due to the radiation therapy because of the ischemic tumor and our adjacent retina, there might be neovascularization and the cell, cell loss, vascular leakage and macular edema. So there's studies where we shows that uh, OCT can be uh, OCT can be a full uh, investigation to see for macular um, edema in case of coronal uh, melanoma, where you see co compared with radiated and irradiated eyes, we see that in the radiated eyes, we see that there is a, a vast uh, increase in the central macular thickness as compared to the non irradiated eyes. And even in the OCT, you see that there is uh, the foveal avascular zone area is enlarged in size, and then also the superficial and deep capillary uh, plexus uh, in, the, in the parafoveal area is also decreased in, as compared with the radiated versus non irradiated eyes. So the uh, the role of uh, bevacizumab, uh, this uh, anti vgf has been uh, proposed, uh, which shows that uh, with that with that dose of uh, intravitreal uh, bevacizumab, there is reduction in around for uh, which is seen around forty percent of of the cases without this uh, intravitreal injection, as well as when compared with the, with this uh, um, control group, it is only twenty six percent at the month at the twenty four uh, accumulative months. So patients receiving intravitreal vision demonstrate less OCT macular edema, clinically evident radiation retinopathy, moderate low vision loss, and poor visual equity we've seen in this paper. Another mode of treatment is proton beam therapy. This te technique allows for the delivery of high doses of radiation specifically to tumors, thus uh, reducing the damage to ad adjacent structures. There's recent studies by Verma et al. which shows that the five years overall survival rates of 70 to 85 persons and five years metastasis free survival and this is survival uh, specific survival rates between 75 to 90 degrees in this picture we see with the pro, for, uh, with the for protons here we see the radiation dose uh, to uh, to the adjacent structure is much higher in case of x-rays whereas in case of proton there is much lower and there is no entry and exit the uh, uh, radiation exposure in case of proton beam therapy the indication of gamma knife in coronal melanoma is another uh, important uh, aspect here. 
especially for large size uh, which are not feasible for bracket therapy or mass which are just uh, just um, or encompasses the optic nerves or some young adult which are we want for go want to go for globe sparing or unexplained visual prognosis we can consider for this uh, gamma nerve therapy explaining the uh, explaining the that uh, the side effect of this radiation therapy uh, we can ex uh, we can consider for gamma nerve uh, treatment so here is one case where uh, which is done uh, along with the help of neurosurgery where trial for, uh, the 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 frame the frame has been the steel frame has been placed to, to immobilize the neck and along with it we have to immobilize the eye so the uh, fixation of, of the three rectile muscle has been has been done and the patient has been sent for the uh, for the radio, uh, radio, uh, for the gamma nerve therapy so this is a, a case a case with a large uh, tumor mass and that with little detachment so after uh, around two years time you see it, there's reduction in tumor size and and then and then uh, there's no progression of this tumor so uh, another case with gamma nerve therapy uh, with, with tumor thickness of 6.5 millimeter patient have undergone here same with uh, patient the tumor is involving them uh, the optic disc area so this is not feasible to place the op the plug uh, anatomically near the optic disc so we consider for gamma nerve therapy uh, six months post treatment the apical thickness have come down to 4.1 millimeter so complication of gamma nerve therapy uh, are like exudative retinal retinopathy is there neurovascular glaucoma radiation retinopathy which is hemorrhage and then uh, uh, with a low dose it can cause uh, around 91 percent control rate as compared with this uh, bracket therapy this around around 50 percent 50 60 persons for large choroidal melanoma, uh, we can other, other concept for inoculation too, with a, with a given a good cosmetic prosthesis. And other surgical intervention are like parasplana vitrectomy, endoresection for posterior choroidal melanoma, transcleral choroidectomy for tumor two ticks for the radiotherapy, and sometimes you have to consider for orbital exenterations. So choroidal metastasis sometimes can be seen in case uh, uh, of uh, secondary metastasis here. So in case you can consider for the external beam radiotherapy also. So uh, the future perspective in managing metastasis given melanoma, uh, there is no current therapy that has succeeded to improve overall survival of the patients. That's why it, the, the highlighting the urgent needs for the new strategy for potential therapeutic tar targets, whereas that this immunotherapy is that that uh, is to the dead the most promising therapeutic approach for metastatic given melanoma, and then treatment using nucleic acid is another uh, novel approaches which is on preclinical uh, clinical trials. However, the translation into clinical meaningful strategies is yet challenged by the, its toxicity, the poor pharmacokinetics, non-specific uptake, and unwanted immune responses. So the potential immunotherapy targets uh, to the macrophage inhibit inhibiting factors, the, pro the program dead ligands 1 or interleukin 6 and 10, or sometimes this uh, cytotoxicity lymphocytes uh, associated uh, proteins 4. So basically, these drugs are, uh, are are the drug immunotherapy drugs like decarbazine and selumetinib are on the phase three, uh, which targets on the mitogens uh, activated uh, protein kinase. So uh, the ipilimab and nivolumab is another drug which is on trial now. So so irrespective of all the treatment mo uh, modalities chosen, patient needs careful observation for years. Initially, three month measurements of dimension of tumors on, on follow up. If no changes are there, you can just do the six monthly follow up. If growth of lesion detected, consider for further management. And a yearly PET CD scan of, whole, of the whole body may help for early detection of distant metastasis. So finally, the take home message is like despite all the recent advances in the treatment of metastasis disease, Early detection and treatment of tumors before they become metastatic remains the primary goal and has the potential to heal even melanoma. Thank you all for your kind attention. Yes. What about TTT primarily in melanomas? Uh, would there be an indication for using TTT? Well, uh, yes, like TTT for a very small lesion around 2, 2.5 millimeter, we can either observe it six monthly or if there is on, on OCT scan, you see there is subretinal fluid RDR and the tumor size is as compared with the previous uh, imaging, it seems to be increasing. And and that, and then the the location of the tumor is if it, if it's nearby the optic disc or near the near the fovea fovea area, then in those cases that yes, TDT can be considered uh, uh, either from uh, from uh, brachytherapy. Yeah. Uh, 
And when you use the sandwich technique, so you, you how do you do it? You do first bracky followed by TTT, or you do TTT first followed by bracky? In our in our cases, uh, in previous uh, thesis, like uh, I have given the uh, sentence thesis, what we have done is like at the time of uh, removal of the plug, we are we have done the TTT, and then uh, we follow up subsequently in first month and and second month and third month we are do we have done the TTT again. So in yes. the same setting when you yes. have removed the time of the removal of the plug only. Right. Yes. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank yeah, you. Thank you. Thank you, Lomi. That was an excellent talk. In fact, a very difficult topic to cover in such a short span of time, but you, you've done a great job. Thank you. Uh, thank you. And uh, we are very happy to welcome Professor Sanjay Sharma, who's just joined our team. And uh, the next speaker is uh, Dr. Rachna. She's going to talk about targeted treatment for orbital mucomycosis, another very important and significant topic, uh, especially with regard to the COVID pandemic. Yeah. Thank, Thank you, Rachna. Thank you so yeah. I think it's very difficult to stay awake after having lunch. So I think all of us are dozing off. So let's just clap your hands and yeah, start uh, afresh again. Yes, so targeted treatment in orbital mucomycosis. Uh, let's see, what do we know about mucomycosis? So it's an opportunistic fungal infection. And the most common uh, predisposing condition is uncontrolled diabetes, right? Others are there like organ transplantation or hematological malignancies. But what, why I've highlighted uncontrolled diabetes is because rhinocerebral disease and orbital involvement is more frequent in cases of diabetes than in cases of organ transplant or malignancy. So what we come across when we talk about rhino-orbital disease are cases with uncontrolled diabetes. That's the immunocompromised status that we'll see. And of course, also in studies from India where they have seen what is the predisposing condition causing mucomycosis. 73% cases, it's uncontrolled diabetes compared uh, to Europe and North America, which, where it's only 36%. It's caused by the zygomyces group. We all know, we all read about it. They are uh, broad aseptate, uh, having broad aseptate hyphae. Important thing to remember is that rhizopus is the most common species that causes this infection. So this was a very interesting uh, bar graph that was there in the study by Rodin et al. who did the epidemiological study for mucomycosis. And you can see how uh, over decades, uncontrolled diabetes remains the most common predisposing condition for mucomycosis. However, the other comorbidities, which were almost non-existent in the 1940s, have become quite significant in the current era, which includes malignancies and then injection uh, uh, drug users, solid organ transplants, bone marrow transplants. So these, in addition to uncontrolled diabetes, have become more significant. Coming on to orbital mucomycosis, it is potentially fatal. In the largest meta-analysis, which uh, was reported by Turner et al., 49.7% was the survival rate, which means more than 50% patients of orbital mucomycosis actually die of disease, which is a very high figure. And then, apart from that, in the ones who survive, there is a high morbidity. High morbidity in what sense? Globe salvage happens in only 43%, so which is to say, that more than 50% of patients actually undergo exenteration. And in the ones who do have their globe salvaged, you see vision is only there in 25%. So again, potentially fatal, highly morbid. We know it's an angioinvasive fungus, causes endothelial damage, secondary thrombosis, tissue necrosis, and rapid permanent disease progression. What we do not know about orbital mucomycosis is whether exenteration improves survival. So from all the data that is there in literature, we have this largest meta-analysis and large retrospective series. Authors of all these studies have come to the same conclusion that exenteration does not affect patient survival. But still, we are doing exenteration in 53% of cases of orbital mucomycosis. So when is exenteration indicated? Now, again, in this study that was done for indications for orbital exenteration, Hargrove et al. tried to find out from a review of literature of 113 articles and also a survey sent to various people who deal with mucomycosis 
and what said was that there is no standard of care currently to exist uh, to guide physicians on when egg penetration may benefit a patient of mucormycosis. So we really don't know. What do we know about management? We know that it's three pronged. We do correct the immunocompromised state. We debride the necrosed tissue, and we start the patient of systemic antifungus, which is essentially systemic amphotericin B. Now, debridement, when you have to do it in the nose and paranasal sinuses, is not an issue. But when you have to do it in the orbit, it is an issue because limited debridement may not be feasible in all cases, especially when it's not surgically accessible. And also, it's in the apex, it's close to the critical structures. You may not want to do a limited debridement. Exenteration, we've already said, it's highly disfiguring in these patients where we do not know what to do. So, all right, I've gone back, I think. Okay, all right. So then, uh, like we said, what what to do, how to decide on egg generations. For example, you have this case here. He's a 37 years old male, diabetic, presence with this right eye proptosis, restriction of extraocular movements. And when you do an imaging, what you see is this apical disease. Would you want to exenterate this young patient who has only limited orbital disease? I think I would have to think twice before I advise an exenteration for this patient. What about another case? This is a 53 years old male. He has he had COVID mild, and then he developed this uh, mucormycosis with a left eye severe proptosis, restriction of all extraocular movements, chemosis, and congestion. But clearly here on the imaging, what you see is a diffuse orbital involvement. Here, perhaps most of us would advise an exenteration because you see you would feel that all of this orbit is actually filled with necrotic tissue and perhaps any amount of your intravenous amphotericin B is not really going to work in this patient. And therefore, maybe most of us would advise exenteration here without really having an evidence of uh, the benefit. So, so what do we know now? That debridement is not only difficult and disfiguring, there are no clear indications there are no clear benefits. And also, it may not be possible for many patients who are not for fit for general anesthesia. On the other hand, when you have to give systemic antifungals, it has limited penetration in the necrosed area. And also, there may be a systemic toxicity that may not allow intravenous administration. So many of these patients, you may not be able to debride, do debridement, or you may not be able to give antifungals. So in which case, again, the treatment out become, outcome becomes highly unsatisfactory. That brings us to the question of doing a targeted drug delivery to orbit, which is not something new, which people have been exploring for quite some time now, especially the ENT surgeons. And what, what it means is that you are directly delivering the antifungal into the orbit, into the necrotic tissue, which is otherwise not possible through systemic uh, administration of the drug. How you can do it? You can do it either through orbital lavage and irrigation following limited debridement, or even more minimally invasive would be an intraorbital antifungal injections. How can this help? This will probably reduce the need for debridement since the point of debriding the necrosis is that it uh, will not allow the antifungals to enter that area. So as far as lavage and irrigation is considered, there are small number of cases, but definitely the literature does say that it does have an effect and people have reported case reports where even despite a cerebral involvement with uh, irrigation with one uh, with amphotericin b for almost 11 applications like in this particular case they were able to salvage the globe without having to do an exenteration as far as intraorbital injections are considered, they are minimally invasive, but again, the literature is very sparse. Now, there's only one series where they have, this is just a case report, again, to show some support in favor of intraorbital amphotericin B. But what I would like to show is this particular algorithm that was introduced by Ashraf Patal, where they have started using routinely uh, transcutaneous uh, amphotericin B injections for patients with imaging uh, evidence of involvement of the orbit. And in mild cases, even without a clinical evidence, sorry, in moderate cases, even without a clinical evidence of disease, they would still go ahead and do this injections in these patients. We also did a study during the COVID times, and we did uh, decide what was advanced mild and moderate disease based on basically clinical 
evidence that is proptosis and retropulsion and also based on imaging so anything more than two quadrants we put it as advanced rest was mild and moderate and we gave injections of intra amphotericin b so now here in 18 patients when we did give these injections out of which covid were only uh, covid were the majority and we even did in three non covid patients what we found was that we were able to avoid exenteration at a follow up of 3 months in almost all cases there was resolution of pain or heaviness or th that the patients reported. There was no deterioration of vision due to injections in any of these cases. So apparently the injections seemed to be safe. Also, there was improvement of vision in two patients, extraocular movements recovered in all patients. However, there was no significant improvement in imaging. At a follow-up of six months, we now have actually two patients who have had a recurrence, one of which has already undergone exenteration, and the other one is now uh, undergoing ex uh, imaging and evaluation for further treatment, and we lost one patient due to extension to the CNS. So at this point of time, these are yeah just few examples to show this patient we gave. The one that I showed you uh, initially, we gave injections and he had full recovery of all his symptoms. This is another lady. This was a non-COVID patient and she had also skin involvement and apparently a diffuse, a more uh, diffuse superior orbital involvement and she recovered. And this was a recurrent patient who initially had got injections and then he came back with pain uh, in the eye and a recurrence of ptosis. We gave him three injections and he, the ptosis completely uh, went away. So at this point of time, I think we can safely say that we can use intraorbital amphotericin B as a minimally invasive bedside procedure. It may reduce the need of debridement and exenteration. It appears to be a safe procedure in terms of vision loss or any other side effects. We do not expect any significant change on imaging in these patients. So it's basically based on the clinical uh, reporting by the patient and the clinical signs. Recurrence can happen on longer follow-ups and it needs to be further studied whether those uh, can be dealt with repeated injections. However, at this point of time, cases with severe orbital involvement and diffuse necrosis must still be treated with exenteration. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, ma'am. So uh, very nicely illustrated uh, and take it, uh, every point was clearly shown here about the very difficult uh, management of this orbital micromachiasis. Uh, if there's any questions, uh, anyone can have. I just had to, I probably skipped one slide on Ashraf Ittal's study where uh, when they compared uh, these two groups of uh, mild to moderate mucomycosis, they did realize that exenteration, the chances of exenteration did reduce in patients where they had given in intraorbital amphotericin B. However, it did not significantly increase the risk of death in these patients. So apparently it does reduce the possibility of exenteration in these patients. Okay, I have one question, Dr. Rajna. It was a very nice presentation. Uh, do you have any experience of using some of the azoles which are indicated for mucomycosis? Uh, we are using posaconazole as a second line treatment after we've stopped amphotericin B uh, or in cases where uh, the patients are not tolerating amphotericin B. But I think at this point of time, it would be very difficult to say on uh, how their outcomes are in terms of if you compare them to primary amphotericin B treatment since experience is still very limited with their use. But yes, I think everywhere in the world, posaconazole is now being taken up as the alternative treatment if amphotericin B cannot be used. Okay, out of the 18 patients which you have uh, uh, analyzed, their posaconazole was given to anyone? Yes, oh. all of them as a one oh, right. as an adjunct. B was stopped, yes. Okay. Posaconazole Thanks. continued for almost six months. Mic, mic please. Was that associated with any other procedure like uh, debridement or anything else? Yes. So in patients uh, where uh, medial orbit was involved close to the paranasal sinuses, in all cases, uh, a debridement has been done. Uh, 
in the but, orbit yes yes okay. but if there was just a sole apical involvement or an infraorbital in, uh, sorry a, a lateral uh, extracolon involvement which was very rare so in cases that were feasible for a debridement a debridement was done by the ent surgeons at the same time that they did their sinus debridement okay. and the one patient you showed that uh, middle aged patient having gross proptosis Yes. Did he underwent enucleation or any other excentration? Okay. Only in patients who had mild to moderate involvement, and those which were classified as having severe involvement were still advised excentration. Although we did give them injections during that time while they were waiting for their fitness for excentration. So we are still evaluating and seeing if that did reduce the fungal loads on the histopathology. But that is still being, uh, we don't have the results here. And uh, I mean, have you followed any like guidelines how to do in uh, injection or any specific pockets we have to gain with? Yes. Injection? So like uh, the most common area from where uh, the infection arises and enters the orbit is the, uh, the ethmoid sinus. So mostly we give injections either transcutaneously or transcarancularly in the medial orbit. Deep medial orbit is where we give it. And uh, the ideal thing is to give it in the area that you localize on the imaging. So if it is inferior orbit, you give it there. If it is medial, so it has to be guided by your imaging. And uh, what we followed in our protocol was to give seven injections alternate day because it does induce some inflammation every time that you give the uh, injection. And we did seven injections for each patient. Thank you, ma'am. Okay. Uh, do you had the incidences where patient were waiting for excentration and because of the known clearance you resorted to amphotericin B injections what were the outcome in these patients yeah so there was uh, we actually did this in five or six patients I at least remember one patient where we actually did not have to do excentration but having said that I would say that's too, I mean, I wouldn't want to put that thought in your mind that that is a possibility. I would still say that where you have a severe disease, as indicated by a severe proptosis or a retropulsion, which is firm to heart, excentration is what you must do. You can still give injections so that during the time that while the patient is waiting for excentration, it might help reduce the fungal load and extension, possible extension into the CNS. This is just a very theoretical and uh, we are still evaluating the histopathology of these patients controlling them uh, uh, comparing them with controls to see if that did make a difference on the fungal load my experience is contrary to what your last statement is because in few of the cases where the excentration was actually required and consent was not available yeah they did respond Fine. and i do not know what was there because many survived many did not Yes. Again, like I said, these injections will not affect survival because as far as we are saying, even excentration does not yes, yes. affect the affect survival. The so all we are talking about is a disfigurement from excentration. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So moving on to the next speaker now. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, I invite Dr. Pridvi. You will be speaking on infectious cysts of the orbit. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we are moving on to one more uh, infectious condition of the orbit, which are the infectious cysts. Uh, these are the following uh, cystic lesions of the orbit which uh, is infected. One is the uh, dacrostosis, uh, acute uh, uh, dacrostitis, where the NLD block is there, following which there is a, a, a retention of the mucus, following which secondary infection. And there is an abscess in a child where, where you can see the uh, perios. Uh, uh, the preceptal abscess and also the subperiosteal abscess and the cystic sarcosis patient where you can see uh, cystic sarcosis cyst in the muscle along with the scolix uh, where, where the presentation is uh, uh, cyst in the conjunctival area and the other patient uh, is showing the hydrated cyst where a patient present usually with proptosis in an early uh, childhood. Moving on to cystic sarcosis, uh, it's a parasitic infection caused by larval form also known as uh, cysticercus cerebrosae, uh, it's a uh, larval form of uh, tenuous volume, a pork tape form. It is endemic in the poor sanitary area. Uh, it's commonly affecting the subcutaneous tissue, also can affect the central nervous system causing seizures. It can involve the ocular uh, structures and omit can cause uh, blindness which can be prevented. 
In orbit, it can involve extraocular muscle, uh, most commonly, and subconjunctival space, orbital tissue, where uh, myosystis occurs is most common involving the superior rectus, which can actually present with the cyst, which is in subconjunctival tissue along the insertion of the muscle. Uh, rarely, the optic nerve can be involved, uh, where uh, optic neuritis can be uh, pre the presentation with uh, decrease in vision. This is a normal life cycle of the tina solium. Uh, the red cycle indicates the normal cycle where uh, human is the uh, definitive host, where adult worm stays in the intestine uh, where the eggs will be released, which will be uh, ingested by the pigs, where cystic surface happens in the pig. Where accidentally human, if we ingests, ingest the ova uh, by auto, it, it can cause auto infection. Or uh, there is retrograde infection where the egg migrate uh, uh, ret uh, retro peristalsis into the stomach where uh, egg will break down and form mature into larva where it can affect the affect the uh, man into cystic causes. This is a transmission modality where enteroinfection infection caused by the contaminated food and water, auto infection by ingestion of ova, or internal auto infection because of uh, retrograde peristalsis. Egg when uh, ingested they uh, when they get exposed to the gastric acid, they will get uh, lysed and the uh, egg will get matured into larva, where uh, it get, get migrated into the bloodstream, penetrate the tissues, causing cystic um, in different areas. Based on the area involved, uh, it, uh, it is uh, based on the features they present with, they classified into syndromes, where uh, neurocystic and extra neurocystic where uh, intraocular disease is part, considered as a part of extra parenchymal form of neurocystic sarcosis, whereas uh, other orbital tissue involvement is uh, considered as extra neurocystic sarcosis. Uh, these are the uh, common presentation of the orbit, uh, where uh, some uh, patient can present with periocular, periocular swelling, proptosis, ptosis, with uh, main signs of motility restriction involving the muscle, proptosis, and also diplopia. Optic nerve compression or involvement of optic nerve can cause uh, uh, optic neuritis. Also, we can see the disc edema uh, where patient can present with uh, uh, decrease in vision with uh, disc edema uh, with optic neuritis features. La laboratory findings, there is no any, uh, it doesn't deal much in the uh, diagnosis of the cystic sarcosis. Their ELISA can be positive, which can augment the diagnosis, but uh, negative test will not rule out the infection. Extraocular lesion, uh, as we can't see the uh, uh, cyst directly, we need to have a good clinical suspicion and also we need to know the imaging modalities to evaluate the condition. Ultrasonography, uh, which is very handy and we can uh, be useful for the diagnosing the condition, where uh, we can see the well-defined cyst uh, in the muscle along with the uh, hyperechoic scolix, which will persist in the low gain. You can see it is in 85 decibel, which uh, the scolix, which is visible, it's also persisting at 60 decibels with high amplitude at that area with bulky, involvement of bulky muscle and uh, the cystic area inside. CT scan uh, shows hypodense mass with uh, central hyperdensity with, uh, because of scolix with uh, surrounding soft tissue information. A dead cyst uh, may cause uh, Inflammation, which is very uh, enhanced, which is uh, which can cause uh, increased contrast enhancement. Scolix may not be seen during during the dead cyst. MRI uh, in T1 image, weighted image, uh, the cyst will be hypo intense with the scolix, which which will be hyper. In uh, T2, it will be reversed. In the right side, you can see the uh, disseminated uh, cystic sarcosis, where uh, by brain parenchyma is almost fully. Uh, implanted with the cyst. These are the phases of the cystic sarcosis. Initially, uh, the initial phase is viable phase where the parasite will avoid the host immune response. There will not be any uh, inflammatory uh, response. Uh, following which, there will be inflammatory stage where uh, parasite failed to evade the response and uh, immune will start uh, uh, evading the cyst by targeting them. Uh, following which, there is uh, intense inflammation altered uh, fluid. Initially, the fluid inside the cyst will be clear. Later on, in the fluid will get altered. Uh, finally, the uh, immune will start boosting up and it will uh, destroy the uh, cyst. It can cause cyst to be non-viable, causing gran calcified granuloma. 
Cyst, multiple cysts can be present simultaneously at the in different stages. Usually, we, uh, my myocystic sarcosis can be treated with uh, oral albendazole with 15 mg per kg body weight for four weeks uh, with prior administration of prednisolone for two to three days at uh, one mg per kg, tapered over four to six weeks. If uh, cyst steroids are always necessary uh, to control the inflammation before starting the antiparasitic drugs because the fluid inside the cyst can get leaked with the, uh, when the parasite dies, which will cause intense uh, inflammatory reaction. We should always rule out uh, multifocal neurocystic sarcosis and also uh, intraocular cystic sarcosis, where, where uh, if you start the antiparasitic therapy, which will cause intense reaction, cause, can cause cerebral edema and seizures, intractable seizures, and also cause vitritis if it is intraocular. Uh, if there is no steroids, if there is no scolic inside, we can only start on steroid therapy. Surgical removal is always preferable if it is accessible under steroid cover. Histopathically, it's uh, around 5 to 15 mm long, a fluid filled cystic structure with a thin bladder wall. There is invaginated scolex surrounded by convoluted spiral canal. This is one of a patient which presented with uh, subconjunctival cyst, uh, which when excision and biopsy, we could uh, find out that uh, it was a cystic sarcosis. In the green arrow, you can see the scolex booklet. In the red arrow, you can see the sucker plates. And in yellow arrow, you can find the invaginated scolex. And this is the no, structure of the cystic These are the few patients which we treated. This patient uh, came with subconjunctival cyst. Uh, when we did ultrasound, uh, we could find the cystic and it was excised and started on uh, steroids. Second patient was presented with ptosis and uh, restriction of uh, movement. There was a superior early and there was a cyst in the superior rectus, which was treated, treated successfully with steroid with, and uh, albendazole therapy. This is another patient, uh, patient present with a uh, restriction of movement uh, superiorly and also uh, uh, medially with the ptosis, which uh, rec recovered with uh, steroid and albendazole. I think iridated cyst already been discussed in the morning. I, I think we'll go on to the next speaker, yes. So. Thank you, Prithvi, and thank you for trimming your presentation. And uh, yeah, that was thoughtful. So I uh, now invite Professor Seema Kashyap, ma'am, for her uh, talk. Ma'am will be talking about pathology of orbital and adnexal infections. So just before uh, ma'am starts with the presentation, I think the one presentation that Prithvi uh, did not mention about was also aseptic orbital cellulitis that often uh, can happen with cystic circles. So the extensive clinical talks, uh, I'll be talking on the pathology of uh, infections. I'll be showing interesting cases. So the first case is uh, that of a 22-year-old male from Bihar who had a painless progressive swelling below the medial canthus extending along the lower lid since 12 years. And conventional DCG showed a dilated right-sided lacrimal sac with uh, filling defects. Similarly, CT dactrocystography also showed dilated sac with filling defects. And uh, peroperatively, when the sac was opened up, uh, the sac showed numerous polypoidal growths. This is the histopathology. You can see the um, sac, which is opened up with numerous polypoidal growths. And this is a uh, cut section, again showing. So anybody diagnosis? Very classical lesion. Yeah. So Low power, you have this uh, stratified squamous epithelial lining and uh, subepithelium, you can see dense inflammatory infiltrate along with these small little rounded structures in various stages of development. So you can see this is a sporangia filled with uh, spores. So this was a rhinosporidiosis. Anybody, what preparation is this? This is another case. This is an impression cytology. Patient had a, clin a conjunctival lesion. And uh, you can see over these 
squamous uh, cells, superficial squamous cells, you can see a cluster of uh, these small little rounded organisms and high power you can see these are rhinosporoidal spores. So you can pick up on impression cytology as well. So this is uh, nose and nasopharynx are the most common sites of infection followed by conjunctiva and lacrimal apparatus. Another case of a seven-year-old male who presented with diminution of vision for two months and clinically diagnosed as traumatic cataract. So lens aspiration was done and here you can see the initially this was the size of the cyst and here after the aspiration the in, size increased. And here on the USG you can see this uh, cyst wall. Uh, so, an uh, AC tab was sent as well as a vitreous tab. AC tab, we did not find anything, but uh, vitreous tab, grossly itself, in the container, we could see some fine floating particles within it. So, this was a cytospin preparation, and what we saw were these small little organisms. This is, uh, you can see the hooklets, and yet another high power, you can see these hooklets. These are hydrated scolases. So I shall skip this, I think, because it's already been covered. Histopath, this is how the laminated membrane of uh, hydrated is seen with the scolases. Uh, another case, I think Prithvi has already um, covered this up. This is a cyst wall, thick walled uh, cyst with the scolex. And within the cyst, you can see the cyst wall is very thick. It has marked uh, inflammatory infiltrate. And uh, this is the classical cysty circus with the sucker and the scolex. Uh, another case uh, of a 31-year-old male who had left total maxillectomy done for osteosarcoma followed by radi radiotherapy. And he presented to the eye OPD later on with infective keratitis, exposure keratopathy, and left eye evisceration specimen was sent. Now, this evisceration specimen, when it was sent, uh, we saw these uh, hyperkeratosis, this parakeratosis, there are areas of necrosis. And here there was this uh, aggregate of query organisms. So this is the high power. On high power, you could see this particular area on high power. You could see these are small oval cyst-like structures with a thick wall. And at one end, there is a waistband-like appearance. So special stains were um, asked for. And uh, this was weekly acid fast. You can see these uh, cell wall, the cyst wall was um, stained by acid fast. Similarly, pass also, the cyst wall was stained. And along with these uh, thick waistband at one end, which I was talking about, SM was also positive. So this was a case of microsporidiosis, which is pretty rare. This was in the conjunctiva. And recently, I got another case of um, keri uh, keratitis, microsporidial keratitis. On the low part, I could just see it around the uh, in the posterior part, around along the desmets membrane. But uh, on high part, you could see that it was present throughout the uh, stroma. Acid fast again, it was uh, positive, and SM was positive. So microsporidia, they are pretty rare, but. Um, uh, they should be kept in mind. They are uh, protozoan parasites. And in the eye, deep corneal stromal infections and superficial keratoconjunctivitis have been described. Uh, going on to the another case, uh, I will describe some of the granulomatous inflammation. 68-year-old uh, male, as you can see in the CT picture, that uh, he has a firm, hard mass in the prolateral aspect. And... Uh, this is, I think everybody must have guessed, this is an FNAC uh, smear. So, papiniculous uh, stain shows numerous giant cells along with uh, inflammatory cells in the background and those red cells, uh, the red colored ones are the red cells. And high power of one of the giant cells, you can see an unstained fungal hyphae also. So, you start suspecting whether it is fungus and uh, SM was positive with this acute angle branching um, um, fungal hyphae and uh, septate. So this was um, aspergillus. Another case of an orbital biopsy which was sent. Now this is uh, what you see in the biopsy are these granulomas, numerous granulomas, giant cells. These are multinuclear giant cells and a lot of inflammation in the background. Now this inflammation, when you go on to high power, it consisted of plasma cells, uh, lymphocytes, and what are these cells? Binucleate cells with these red colored um, granules in the cytoplasm. These are eosinophils. So once you start seeing numerous epithelioid cells, uh, giant cells, 
and uh, in the inflammatory infiltrate if there are numerous eosinophils you start suspecting either a fungal infection or parasitic infection so parasitic you will search in the entire slide if you have any remnants of the parasite in case not sometimes in the parasitic infection you have palisading histiocytes if that is also not the case then you ask for a fungal uh, stain the silver methanamine stain and here as you can see this was a uh, aspergillus uh, septate hyphae okay and um, branching at uh, acute angle so this was an aspergillus uh, similarly micros uh, this was um, uh, aspergillus um, infective keratitis positive for aspergillus uh, this was another case um, dr rachna will remember about this case um, this patient um, presented with a, a huge ulcerative lesion involving the upper lid and uh, lower lid she was an uncontrolled diabetic and what we saw on the HNE was uh, large areas of necrosis. And um, uh, there was no inflammatory reaction, no epithelioid cell granuloma, just large areas of necrosis. And within the uh, necrotic areas, you could see these unstained uh, query fungal hyphae. You resort to uh, SM, fung S uh, silver methanamine stain. And here you can see these uh, fungal hyphae, which are branching at right angle, no septae. Uh, no septae, so aseptate fungal hyphae having irregular width. These are mucormycosis. Now, mucormycosis, most of the times, they just show large areas of necrosis. They, you may not see epithelioid cell granulomas or the inflammation, which you see in aspergillus uh, infection. So you should keep this in mind. And generally, the blood vessel wall is also invaded. So this was a case of mucormycosis. Uh, in this... Um, granulomatous lesions i'll show you one more case uh, large areas of uh, epithelioid cell granulomas here you can see the lowest part these are all granulomas and then go into high part granulomas with langens giant cell these are again high part of um, giant cells and you can see some areas of necrosis so in such cases when you don't see the inflammatory reaction consisting of eosinophils but you see, in addition, uh, necrosis, then you start suspecting um, mycobacterium tuberculosis. You ask for a AFB stain. It may or may not be positive. In ocular cases, generally, we do not get positive AFB. But if you get, this is how the AFB look like, beaded appearance. Okay, These are the AFB bacilli. Uh, another case of a 42-year-old male who had this uh, orbital mass and... Um, this is a specimen, sorry, this is a little blurred, but you can see these yellowish necrotic areas. Now, on histopathology, what we saw were these uh, areas of fibrosis, and these were microabscesses. Within the microabscesses, there were these branching bacterial colonies. High power, you can see these inflammatory uh, neutrophilic reaction, you can see these uh, bacterial colonies. And special stains, sparse was positive. You can see the thin filament is branching at uh, the periphery. Silver methanoin was also positive. And AFB acid fast was, sorry, not AFB, acid fast stain was uh, weakly positive in this particular um, case. So this was a case of nocardiosis, which is actually, uh, originally it was thought to be a fungus, but now we know that uh, they are true bacteria, aerobic, gram-positive, non-motile, filamentous bacteria and they can cause all sorts of ocular infections. Uh, this is a very recent case which I got, a 39-year-old male with mucoid discharge at the medial canthus. So on HNE, uh, you can see the discharge which was there, this was uh, processed, and you can see these bacterial colonies. Again, here it's very clear. You can see these filamentous, thin branching um, bacteria at the periphery. On PAS, which is positive, silver methanamine, it was positive, but acid fast is negative. So this was a case of actinomycosis, which is similar to that of nocardia, but they are acid fast negative. And the last case, anyone? Spotter? No? This is the epithelium and you have this lesion over here. High power, you can see these cytoplasmic eosinophilic inclusions. This was a molluscum. 
or less come contagious. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. It was such a colorful presentation. And I think all of us were so absorbed into, you know, just trying to find out what lay in there. It was uh, beautiful. Yeah, we were actually dazzled by so much color. And the residents should, I mean, how much, I mean, you won't see so much color anywhere in API Center. So you should go and get uh, your training there in pathology more often. Because uh, if nothing else, the colors should attract you. No? मतलब आपकी कलरफुल पर्सनालिटीज भी हैं, but you know they won't ever find so much color every anywhere in life also. And we I now want to invite Professor Sanjay Sharma sir. He sees ophthalmic radiology. He's the head of ophthalmic radiology at RP Center, and I'm sure you are going to have a wonderful time looking at the. The various uh, radiological images that you may not be able to, you know, otherwise um, understand. So I welcome sir for his talk on radiological diagnosis of orbital infections. So that patient <clears throat> that Dr. Seema ma'am was, you had shown uh, of mucomycosis, that young lady, a uh, girl, she was actually having idiopathic thrombocytopenia and she had been receiving steroids for almost two months and then she developed mucomycosis and she was still on steroids when she came to us. So. We'll get from my laptop uh, for a reason that I have some uh... Uh, cine images which I'll have to scroll. It doesn't run on a regular format. It's a radiology DICOM format. So I thought I'll put it all together and run it, run it from my de desk, uh, computer only. Okay, I think I can start with this uh, right now. Um, So when dealing with the uh, infections of the orbit, the radiology, of course, as you are all aware, does uh, play a crucial role. It plays even more important a role uh, when the examination is limited or being delayed because the, child, the patient is grappling with more life-threatening issues. So that's when uh, the radiology comes uh, even more handy. So what I plan to uh, uh, talk uh, uh, in a short uh, span of 10 minutes is uh, uh, Talk about overview of the role of imaging in these conditions, then emphasize the anatomy, how pre and post septal distinction between a pre and a post septal is important. Then uh, show you a few case examples uh, and uh, uh, gen uh, common appearances before I conclude. I will not be including tuberculosis. I thought it's too short a time. And then in uh, the hydrated and cystisarcai, I, I Understood it should be a parasitic infestation, so which is why I didn't include them in the infection, so called two infections. But I'm glad Prithvi did uh, uh, show many slides on uh, cystococcus. Okay, so, so radiology, uh, of course, does play an uh, important role in detection, but more so it does help you in, uh, in mapping the extent of a disease, whether the uh, infection is confined to just nasal cavity or nasal sinuses alone, or is spread to the orbit, face, neck, masticator space or even intracranial cavity. And it helps in uh, 
uh, also guiding the accurate biopsies. Uh, having done a cross-sectional imaging, you would know where to uh, target your biopsies from. And uh, the other thing important is that uh, it may not always be diagnostic. You still may have a differential of inflammatory tumor or even true neoplasms or lymphoma sometimes. You know, you cannot diagnose an infection on imaging. You can, but ne not always. And uh, uh, it helps in uh, uh, preoperative uh, imaging when you're planning a pre -op, pre -op, uh, to operate a patient. Then in a post-operative setting, uh, the residual disease can be uh, seen, especially if it's seen in a location which cannot be examined. And uh, for example, in Mucor, we have seen that the completeness of debridement is important. So areas which have been left uh, can be picked up on imaging and can also pick up the surgical complications. We've seen patients entering into a OT with the, you know, the other issues and coming out with the ophthalmic complications. So we know uh, what is the abnormality and how to relate. So, and of course the follow-up. Now, what modality to use, CT or MR? So in general, uh, uh, the CT is what I feel is the most clinically, uh, you know, suited in most situations, especially in adults. Although this still remains an institutional preference based also on the availability. And uh, also if you were to, you know, put the patient straight for uh, OT, CT does tick all, you know, uh, ticks all uh, requirements. And uh, of course, depends on the condition of the patient. If a patient is uh, too sick and uh, under life support and a lot of paraphernalia, um, you know, ventilator and things, then MR, of course, cannot be done. You need a quick imaging and the paraphernalia may not be MR compatible. So CT is what you do. And uh, advantage is being that it's, of course, easy to organize. You have an in-house CT. It, you can diagnose uh, the sinus disease, continuous disease spread. Quick, It's quick to perform. And of course, during the epidemic, we have seen that uh, it was easy to sanitize much easily than uh, the MR. MR in our practice has essentially remained complementary to CT and largely as a problem solving tool, not that, uh, you know, alone, it doesn't um, uh, uh, give all answers. It does. In fact, it's even better modality because of fantastic contrast resolution it, it, it shows. Uh, but uh, we still prefer CT because it's all the reasons I mentioned. And uh, MR, uh, if you were to say in which condition will it be suited, it will be suited more for uh, uh, situations in which there are complications already, intraorbital or intracranial complications. We look at them uh, as we go by. Now, advantages are, as I said, higher contrast resolution. CT has a higher spatial resolution, whereas the MR has a higher contrast resolution. If you're not giving a contrast, you would rather use a non-contrast MR rather than a non-contrast CT, because MR has an inherently high contrast resolution, which is why. And disadvantages being that it's a long imaging time and uh, sick patients, as I said, uh, with life support devices, uh, not suitable for uh, MR. Now, it's a frequent question in ophthalmic setting whether or not you should give uh, IV contrast. Now, administration of IV uh, uh, con contrast does significantly improve the image contrast in general. So, which is why it is agreed that we will have to give contrast unless there are reasons not to. So it is generally considered uh, universal. And uh, you should know the uh, the other uh, uh, limitations, which uh, include uh, the uh, patients with borderline or uh, overt kidney dysfunction. And uh, you must always, uh, uh, um, you know, take a look at uh, the effective GFR or a serum creatinine, whatever you may, uh, you have handy before you decide to give uh, contrast. And also the um, nephrotoxic drugs in sick patients, uh, you know, may have been there in an already uh, uh, diabetic patient, maybe elderly patient. So in those patients, the contrast-induced nephropathy becomes even more relevant and damaging. Now, orbital infections, as we know, over half of them uh, of the diseases I recently read is because of infection, so I believe. Right? Then uh, over two-thirds of them are secondary to sinusitis, especially because of the proximity to the ethmoid sinuses. Um, the uh, orbital cellulitis is therefore often the first manifestation of uh, acute sinusitis or a sinusitis in general. General, um, general are more uh, uh, frequently affected and uh, it uh, frequently affects the immune compromised. Not that it doesn't affect the immune competent, but uh, uh, immune compromised are uh, uh, common. Now, we will be talking about the bacterial and fungal infections. Aspergillus, as we've seen, uh, as you've, you must have seen in your clinics and uh, in your day-to-day uh, um, uh, -day practice, 
is relatively indolent, locally aggressive uh, pathology compared to the mucor, which is uh, which is very aggressive, opportunistic, uh, invasive, angioinvasive fungal infections, and which has a high fatality rate. Now, I discussed about the infections uh, um, uh, to de to decide whether it's preceptal or a postceptal. This has a bearing on the management. So the preceptal cellulitis is the one which which is anterior to the septum. I'll show you the septum in the next slide. And the postceptal cellulitis is the is the disease or infection which has got behind the septum. Um, so there are different uh, sources which uh, cause uh, particularly the preceptal forms of uh, uh, in, uh, infections like those arising from the face, teeth, ocular adenexa, and uh, those from the po those in the post uh, septal uh, region, the paranasal sinuses and the trauma, and uh, the endophthalmitis group, which we know is because of the you know post surgery or a post uh, foreign body that we are not considering. So now, what is the facial septum based on which we decide whether it's anterior to the septum or behind the septum, which decides the you know the the aggression with which you're going to treat. So there is a in this diagrammatic, in this schematic, you see that uh, there is a, a facial septum, which is a linear facial septum, which is drawn from the orbital margin all the way to the tarsal plate. This is seen all around, and this is actually seen on imaging also many times, but not always. So if you're able to see uh, the septum and uh, look at your image in multiple planes on a, com on, a cons on a computer or a console, then it's easier. But more often than not, you will not be able to define uh, the, uh, the, 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 the uh, septum so in that case, what do you, what do you, how do you decide? So this image shows that if you draw a line from the uh, pe from the tip of the uh, uh, margin, orbital margin here to the anterior surface of the globe, here, here anything behind is a postceptal. Part of the uh, orbital, part of the uh, lacrimal gland does come behind, but uh, that uh, you will, of course, um, evaluate. Now, one example each of preceptal and postceptal pathologies. That's the preceptal pathology. The entire soft tissue swelling is preceptal. And all this is only uh, the, this, this banana shaped structure is only the lacrimal gland, which is swollen because of contiguous inflammation. And that is the only portion of which is going behind the septum, but it's considered a preceptal pathology. Compared to the postceptal pathology, in which if you see, the, this is a uh, uh, extension of uh, infection which is going behind, clearly behind the uh, septum. So that's how you decide. Uh, as, a, as a quick trick. Now, um, the fungal uh, sinoorbital uh, disease is very common. It may uh, it may either be uh, an invasive or an allergic form. We've seen uh, so commonly, and uh, invasive is mostly chronic. They eventually evolve to develop like a mass and the locally destructive uh, 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 masses. They tend to begin from the paranasal sinuses and then secondarily invade the orbit. It does cause destruction of the uh, uh, bone, as you can see in the anterior uh, cranial fossa here, and extra dural involvement of the intracranial cavity, Sino extensive sinonasal disease with some low density areas, which are presumably representative of uh, abscesses. And uh, unlike the allergic form, which is more indolent and tends to occur in patients who are more atopically have atopic predisposition, and they tend to have. Uh, opacification, which is tends to be bilaterally symmetrical, more or less symmetrical, not exactly, but more or less. But then also you see the central hyperdensity. Central hyperdensity in these patients, the, it is ascribed because of the metallic ions like magnesium and manganese, heavy metal ions, which these fungal elements of mycelium, they tend to have in them, which is what shows them you, sh shows you the hyperdensity. The same thing on uh, MR will be dark. Now, one example, a 38-year-old 38 38-year-old 38 patient, one of our known patients who with, had a chronic headache, proptosis, redness, watering uh, of the red eye, uh, a proven uh, invasive sinoorbital sino aspergillosis on uh, treatment shows a dramatic response. It's still way halfway down the treatment, but shows marked reduction in the uh, size of the so-called Tumefactive involvement of uh, the right orbit and the adjacent uh, posterior portion of the ethmoid air cells. Here, in fact, the entire the uh, entire ethmoid air cells were involved. Here, it's only the posterior, say, a quarter of it has remained. So that's how uh, 
it, the imaging can uh, help you in uh, following up these uh, patients. Now, coming to the. I will show you um, a couple of examples of uh, orbital cellulitis, both pre and post septal. Now you can see, all you see here is a preceptal soft tissue swelling. On, on your left is a soft tissue window, this is a bone window. On a soft tissue window, you can see that there is a diffuse uh, preceptal soft tissue swelling and uh, it's not going into the orbit behind the septum. And there's no bone destruction as you can see here. Note this patient who is relatively more severely affected. It's a young child of five years age who had all these uh, manifestations. If you see, there is extensive preceptal soft tissue swelling, which is extending laterally to involve the anterior temporal region. Also has uh, all the way up to the pinna and a few has few lymph uh, lymph nodes also. Now coming back here, it's seen to go behind the septum and there is what you can see looks like a subperiosteal abscess, which is almost contiguous with the opacified, opacified uh, uh, ethmoidal air cells. So presumably the pathology started from the uh, anterior ethmoidal air cells and then spread by contiguous uh, fashion into the adjacent orbit. And also you can see there is some fat stranding in the orbit and a combination of all these findings has led to increased pressure in the orbit. And you can see which has changed the shape of the globe, which is now which looks more like a you know conical behind a tinting of the globe, which is called a guitar pick sign. It's like a pick of a guitar. You hold it from here, and then you know you may be familiar with this. And then uh, this is basically nothing but a compartment syndrome. A finding of uh, 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 such appearance should alert that some urgent intervention should be done in form of some lateral canthotomy or some form some decompressive measure in order to release the pressure inside the orbit and the stretching of the optic nerve. So the intracranial complications and then uh, the ethmoids are also opacified. So is the nasal cavity here. This is the superior oblique which is quite swollen on this side. Marked swelling here. This is the head scan. So this, there was no intracranial uh, involvement as of now. So these are the two examples. Then we were talking about this. We finished this. And then we uh, now go on to the rhino orbital mucor mycosis. That's, you know, we've all seen the havoc that it's created uh, in uh, the recent times. So how do you, uh, what are the typical um, radiologic appearances? I can see some part of the image is being cut. Okay, that's better. Thank you. So there is a sign called as a black turbinate sign. What is the black turbinate sign? Black turbinate sign is seen on a T1 weighted, T1 post contrast images. Now compare. Compare this turbinate on a coronal image with this enhancement. You know, this side is not enhancing. Mucosa generally does enhance. If it's a normal mucosa, it does enhance. Inflamed mucosa also does. But because we know that the mucor is an angioinvasive uh, disease, it causes some infarction, narrowing of the vessels, obliteration of the vessels. So, which is why uh, it causes ischemia. It causes ischemia, and which is responsible for 
uh, what we call is a black turbinate sign. Okay, so that's that. I'm talking about sinuses because it is believed and uh, it is sure that the uh, the organism basically arises from the sinuses only and then proceeds uh, to involve the uh, the uh, orbit and uh, the brain. And a similar thing you see in the My mouse is also the same color. I'm not able to see which is the uh, I can see now. Okay, so the same thing in axial section also. You can see that the dark middle turbinate you uh, in an axial image on an axial and a coronal image. And now also look at the um, uh, enhancement the the bulky uh, uh, extraocular muscles, bulky uh, medial rectus muscle here. They say that because of the contiguous involvement, it is the mucosal periosteum of the orbit which gets which enhances earlier than anywhere else and that's believed to be a sign of first orbital involvement and which is the reason why the must the 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 uh, middle rectus also gets bulky and enhancing and uh, this also shows somewhat like a compartment syndrome preceptal swelling and uh, look at uh, the marked fat stranding diffuse enhancement and diffuse uh, enhancement of mucoperiosteum here in the uh, left side also some enhancement along infl inflammation along the optic nerve sheath. Now, this is another complication which you may sometimes see in a patient of a mucor. Look at uh, this uh, uh, tubular channel. This is a superior ophthalmic vein on a T2 varied image and an axial image. Whereas here, the whole vein is abnormal. It is completely distended and filled up with what we call it a thrombus, which is a T2 blooming on a on a T on a axial image. So this is all completely thrombosed superior ophthalmic vein. This is another standard known complication of um, uh, uh, mucor, dino, dino orbital mucor. And uh, higher, if you go, um, if you see this cavernous sinus and look at this cavernous sinus, here the cavernous sinus is, is enhancing. Whereas here it's only the intracavernous part of the carotid artery which is enhancing and the remaining part of the cavernous sinus is all dark. That means it's all thrombosed. So this is a patient with a cavernous sinus thrombosis. And same patient, if you were to look at uh, in the coronal view, you see that the artery is narrowed also. It also commonly causes vascular stenosis, narrowing and occlusions. So this is what we picked up on uh, this patient also. Another patient, another uh, set of images in the same patient. Uh, this I've spoken about the guitar pick sign and the compartment syndrome. And uh, look at uh, the, the diffuse enhancement of the optic nerve, which looks because it's stretched as it's markedly stretched because of proptosis and diffuse inflammation all around. This is a set of diffusion weighted images we, which we do to pick up ischemia. Anything which is bright on, on diffusion and dark on an ADC map is ischemic. So now we know what is stretched uh, and what we got, what we're seeing as a stretched optic nerve is ischemic also. So it is not only infected but also ischemic. Now you know why the vision is threatened in these patients. Now these patients also have the intracranial involvement. This is a patient who had uh, infarct here in the anterior temporal lobe. Again, this is a diffusion weighted image which has picked up the ischemic uh, infarct, bright on uh, diffusion and dark on ADC maps. All that which you br see bright here is a uh, edema. T1 is not showing up because it's not hemorrhagic. So that's all in think I the purpose was to give you an overview uh, and uh, uh, I have tell you how what radiology can do. So now to conclude, the imaging plays a crucial role in uh, the uh, diagnostic evaluation of orbital infections, detection of complications, facilitating clinical management and uh, follow up. And the selection of modalities is variable. I mean, depends on this, the, the patient and the, the availability in institutional preference, but is frequently complementary. That is all. To say if there are any questions, I'd be happy to take. Of course, please. Correct. So uh, people have not tried. In fact, you see, uh, uh, we frequently see cases of anterior ischemic optic neuropathy in the neurophile conferences, and we've done a couple of patients. It's not uh, easy to acquire a reliable image of an optic nerve to pick up ischemia the way we do in a brain. Brain, the structure is, is you know, still, and uh, there is still perfusion happening, and there is, so, so, 
in brief, we can acquire more reliable diffusion varied imaging is there than in the optic nerve. This is only one patient who had plethora of findings and it happened to show me the optic nerve ischemia also. You probably can try in a set of patients to see, but uh, generally that's not... You know, yeah, because again, giving contrast in many of these patients correct. who are systemically unwell and toxic, uh, they usually do non-contrast MRIs. Agreed. So, so absolutely. There may be... Imaging, there are yeah. two advantages. One is that it's a short imaging time. It's not an elaborate long image. It's a 30 second sequence. Uh, and the other advantage is that you don't need contrast, which is why in patients who have to be managed quickly in a stroke setting, the diffusion period is a, is a very important uh, 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 sequence that we have on IMR. I think that needs to. Uh, so, uh, thank you so much, sir. Uh, this was a wonderful uh, presentation. And thank you so much once again for all your effort to show all these wonderful pictures. and. And I should say we at RPC are really privileged and lucky that we get all the full package of like uh, for that help us in the diagnosis and management like uh, uh, microbiologists, the pathologists, the radiologists, every set are there. So we are we, we indeed uh, lucky enough. So coming to the final uh, uh, speakers, uh, I would like to invite uh, uh, Madam Dr. Uh, Nishat Hussain. Uh, she is the in charge of uh, ocular microbiology at RP Center. Uh, so she will be speaking on the tissue handling in times of COVID-19. What we know. Over to you, madam. Thank you, Dr. Romi. A very good afternoon to one and all present here. So I'll be speaking about tissue handling in times of COVID-19, what we know. So tissue handling, especially ocular tissues in the times of COVID, why is it a matter of concern as far as transmission of infection is concerned? We'll start with learning about that. We know that sars coronavirus virus 2 is a respiratory pathogen and COVID-19 is primarily a respiratory disease. And respiratory tract has close association with ocular tissues because of continuity of the lacrimal sac with the nasolacrimal duct and closeness of the eye with the paranasal sinuses. Hence, strict respiratory pathogens also they do not spare ocular tissue from being a potential source of infection to the person who's working with the tissues. Uh, there is some... My version of the phone, can you just excuse me for a minute? I'm so sorry. I think during loading, there was some change in the formatting of the presentation. So I was telling that uh, even the pathogens who are strictly respiratory, they do not spare ocular tissue from being a potential source of infection to the person who's working. And also it is known uh, with various studies done globally that COVID-19 is not strictly a respiratory disease. So there are almost all the tissues of the body which can be affected with the virus directly because of the presence of the ACE2 receptors where, from which the virus enters the human tissue and they can be the potential sources of infection and ocular tissues are included in that. So based on these various studies, now all over the world, 
pathologist, ophthalmologist, and infectious diseases specialist, they are of the opinion that ocular tissues are a source of uh, transmission of SARS coronavirus too. And the highest risk of exposure exists in handling fresh, unfixed tissue. And the specimens which carry highest risk of transmission are conjunctiva, nasal lacrimal system, nasal and uh, sinus specimens. But uh, practically any other fresh tissue uh, from the eyes is also potentially infectious. Now we will just have a look at what are the various modes of transmission of infection. So uh, the virus multiplies in the respiratory tract of the individual who is infected with SARS coronavirus 2 or having COVID-19 disease. These large are the droplets and the smaller orange ones are the aerosols. So while the person infected with SARS coronavirus 2 is speaking, singing, sneezing, coughing or eating, droplets and aerosols are generated. Droplets being liquid and larger, they tend to fall down in the close vicinity of usually within one meter, whereas aerosols, they are very small and they tend to dry up and they become airborne and they can be carried to different places with the help of the air currents. Also, droplets they fall down on the hands of the worker whose uh, uh, hands of the person who's infected also on the nearby surfaces and articles thus direct contact with the hands of the infected person as well as the indirect contact with the articles which are infected which are called fomites and surfaces can also lead to transmission of infection and all these modes of transmission can cause definitely short range transmission and long-range transmission is also at least theoretically possible with aerosols as well as fomites and surfaces. So now I will just uh, go a little away from coronavirus and talk about the phases of diagnostic procedures because tissue handling. Most of the times in case of ocular specimens is done for pathological diagnosis and like all other diagnostic procedures, it is having pre-analytical, analytical and post-analytical phases. Pre-analytical phase, it involves specimen collection, transport, receiving and numbering of the specimens. Analytical uh, phase, it involves processing, testing and examining of the tissues and post-analytical phase, it involves interpretation of observations and communication and data entry, etc. This is a very broad and large classification. There are subtypes and sub uh, uh, phases in each one of them. But for our understanding, this is sufficient. And with this understanding, we can infer that it is the pre-analytical and the analytical phases, which are mostly having a risk of transmission of infection. So I will take example of one one procedure of pre-analytical and analytical. This is sample collection of ocular uh, and any ocular lesion and this is tissue processing so while these activities are taking place there is formation of droplets we may or may not see it there is formation of a lot of aerosols the surfaces on which the procedure is taking place it gets infected and also the articles which are being used in the procedure, they get infected. So these are the four sources of transmission of infection and essentially the same ones which are present in the patient. So tissues can transmit the infection of SARS coronavirus as much as a patient can. So what care and precautions do we take for prevention of transmission during tissue handling? If we take care, of these four things which we just saw, then we are sorted. So for droplets, important is to use adequate biosafety level while working, to use standard procedures, and to use proper barriers, including the personal protective equipment. To take care of the aerosols, adequate biosafety level again, very importantly, ventilation and filters because aerosols can go to places to cause a uh, to transmit infection and again standard procedures and barriers. For taking care of the surfaces, cleaning and disinfection and to take care of uh, the risk of transmission from articles and fomites, sterilization and disinfection of the articles, proper management of the biomedical waste and hand hygiene.
I have enumerated all the things which we need to do for prevention of transmission as we saw in the last slide and we can see that both the pre and analytical as well as the analytical phases can be taken care of if we just do these things and we will briefly see how we can actually do uh, actually uh, take these precautions while we are working I'll start with BSL ventilation filters, uh, ven ventilation and filters, and standard procedures. Uh, now, adequate biosafety level ventilation and filter systems. These are not moment to moment and individual level precautions. These involve long term adjustments and uh, some administrative support. However, the benefits obtained they are also large and long lived. So adequate biosafety level involves, for example, I will uh, make you understand uh, with the help of some examples. So when the pandemic was at its peak and in initial phases, when the virulence was very high, we all saw that the COVID and non-COVID areas in all the healthcare settings were segregated. That was to prevent the transmission of infections and that comes under the broad category of proper biosafety level. Also. Uh, not only for laboratories, in other patient care areas also, there were dedicated areas in which only aerosol generating procedures will take place and no other procedures will take place. Also, the use of biosafety cabinets and appropriate containment level. It may be a different room, a different table or a hood or a biosafety cabinet, which is used for a particular procedure that comes under biosafety level. Also, ventilation. So we also saw in the face of the pandemic that in many healthcare settings, the laboratories which were taking care of the COVID specimens, they were shifted from the basements to the ground floors. That was to take care of adequate ventilation as well as sunlight because for aerosol borne transmission, these are the measures which need to be taken to minimize the transmission. Also filters, ultraviolet filters and HEPA filters wherever required as per the procedures were put and they were beneficial in minimizing the transmission. Next, very important thing, having long-term benefits are standard procedures. So standard procedures are nothing but written guidelines for a particular procedure which has to be done. Now, Ministry of Health and Family Welfare initially based on the CDC and WHO recommendations when the first and later in, in later versions also it was there that any procedure having high risk of transmission of COVID-19 should always be done by the most competent person. The reason for doing this is when the most competent person does a procedure, she or he uh, uses the standard procedure and the chances of any errors as a result of which we need to do a repeat procedure are minimum. Hence, the risk of transmission is less. So this sounds theoretical, but it is a very important measure of containment and reducing the transmission of infection that most trained and experienced person should perform the procedure as per the written guidelines. And also, there should be a constant training and skill development program going on so that more and more people become competent and they can also do the procedures. Next is barriers. Barriers have been by far the most dependable precautions which have uh, saved most of us from the, uh, the effects of pandemic. And barriers, they include personal protective equipment. So at the time, of, uh, of highly virulent and highly transmissible strains of COVID-19, of sars coronavirus 2 circulating. These were the two types of uh, personal protective equipment which were being used. This is a gown type personal protective equipment, and this is a coverall uh, type personal protective equipment. So with regards to the pre-analytical phase, of the diagnostic procedures. Usually when a procedure or a collection of a specimen uh, in emergency or in outpatient basis or short admission basis had to take place, then this was the one which was being used. And coverall uh, based personal protective equipment was being used for more invasive samples and mostly in known uh, COVID-19 positive patients. As 
most of the healthcare workers have now uh, got vaccinated and the currently circulating strains are also causing mild disease. For most of the outpatient and daycare procedures, we are now using aprons, gloves and 95 mask with or without a um, eye shield or face shield as indicated as per the procedure. Barriers were also and also being used at the time of transportation of specimens. So this is the time when a potentially, uh, this is the way a potentially COVID-19 infected tissue specimen was being transported. The receptacle like this would be cleaned with 70% alcohol and it would be kept in a receptacle which is having a biohazard label. It is an impervious receptacle and those things will be kept in a closed box and then it will be transported and the person transporting will be wearing a gown type PPE. Also, the people who are receiving these specimens and sorting out and numbering these specimens will also be wearing gown type PPE. However, currently, because there is less risk involved, we are using these sturdy open boxes and clean receptacles with the healthcare personnel wearing only the hospital attire, gloves and N95 mask. And in the laboratory also, gown type PPEs are not right now being used. So based on the procedure involved, apron and 95 mask gloves with or without eye or face shields are being used. Next, we move on to sterilization, cleaning, disinfection, and hand hygiene. Sterilization of articles has essentially remained the same in the face of pandemic. So before the pandemic also, all the articles were being sterilized as per their material and their usage using autoclaves, plasma sterilizers, or hot air ovens, and uh, taking care that all the chemical and biological uh, controls are being put with the sterilization cycles. Surface disinfection has seen some change. And for floors, the most recommended disinfectant is 1% sodium chloride along with the detergent. For other surfaces, 1% sodium hypochlorite. And the important points to be taken care of with 1% sodium hypochlorite are that the, um, it should be freshly prepared for 24 hours. And the contact time of 10 minutes should be given because then we are sure that proper disinfection has taken place. And where we are not able to use 1% sodium hypochlorite, alcohol-based disinfectants containing 70% alcohol are the ones which have to be used. So based on these guidelines uh, by WHO and CDC, all the institutes have formulated their own uh, ways how they are going to disinfect various surfaces and floors of their Mm, healthcare settings, I want to emphasize upon something we did as an institute that we made these checklists. And in all the areas, these checklists are available where every day the in charge has to see that all the high touch surfaces, low touch surfaces, and washrooms they are disinfected and cleaned as per the guidelines provided by the Institute Infection Control Committee. So, this way we can ensure that everything which has been told to be done is being done. For hand hygiene, antiseptic soap and water and 70% uh, alcohol-based hand sanitizers are to be used. And important points to be understood are that all the steps of hand hygiene have to be followed while we are indulging into cleaning our hands. Next, very, very important, uh, however, the last in the list is segregation of, is the management of biomedical waste. So at uh, the, as the, people who are working at the first level of patient care, all we have to do is segregation of the waste at the point of generation as per the biomedical waste guidelines. For COVID waste, we have to follow the same guidelines. Only thing is we need to do the double bagging and label it as COVID waste because when the pandemic is on its surge, and the, or a wave of some more virulent virus or more high transmissibility comes, we again may have to revert with, uh, for these stringent uh, measures because the waste will go for disposal separately as COVID based. So that finishes my presentation. Thank you for your attention. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Yeah, <clears throat> Dr. Nishat. So 
uh during the covid times when mm-hmm. it was added speak i think all of us stopped doing frozen section mm-hmm. um procedures at that time and also uh, fnscs where we had to handle fresh tissues mm-hmm. so uh, what's your take on that i mean in case you have a fresh wave of covid does the procedure stay the same do we have to stop doing the frozen sections and the fnscs or fresh tissue uh, sample handling or can we do it with certain uh, you know protective measures as uh, you Actually, just showed protective measures they will work in all the circumstances for everything because they have been tested and they are in a way nothing is 100% but they are almost full proof however why we decrease taking patients why we stop doing particular uh, Uh, the c- certain procedures is because it is difficult to maintain the load with s- so many precautions for example uh, it is indicated that uh, thermometers or stethoscopes for example they have to be cleaned with 70% alcohol each time you change patients so with 10 patients we may be able to do it but when 100 uh, 200000 patients are coming then we may not be able to do it so why we stop doing certain things which are not uh, em- having an emergency requirement at a particular time uh, during high transmission the reason is that if we are able to follow the precautions then nothing will happen but it is not feasible to follow all the precautions in those times that is the reason sir in laboratory settings we are uh, usually it is in the um, we are using biosafety cabinets sir so if it is for the uh, places where biosafety cabinets may not be immediately available so their cross ventilation will help as well as the falling of direct sunlight but we as an institute we are having all those uh, uh, what do we say facilities but there are people in the audience who may not be having for example so it is important uh, for example collection of i am just giving an example of another infectious condition which is aerosol borne tuberculosis so tuberculosis usually the isolation has to be done in a negative pressure room but if that is not available then we can have a well ventilated room in which there is cross ventilation direct sunlight so we have people from all kind of healthcare settings so the options should be known to them okay thank you so much ma'am uh, for once again uh... and showing us all the protection and and uh, care that we have to be taking care of though, uh, though this covid is still within us so we should all be uh, aware of, of what uh, she has shared so to, with this we have come to the end of the session and i would like to thank all the presenters all the faculties all the delegates both online and offline to be part of this workshop for the final i will request uh, uh professor ms bajaj sir to give a final comments and then we'll wind up this session so uh it was wonderful uh, having all of you here and i thank everybody who has participated and contributed to making this a success uh i was just uh, commenting to dr uh talking with dr kashyap that uh, probably this is the only workshop in rp center which is having so many collaborating uh, departments uh, which who are participating so it makes it much more interesting because if you have just uh, the cornea or the glaucoma people talking uh, after a while it becomes a little uh, monotonous so here we are very uh, grateful to them also for making it such a you know multi speciality kind of a uh, uh, workshop so it, it's great uh, and all of the residents and all who have come and physically participated they have benefited the most because just uh, you know having a shower and seeing your phone online or having breakfast and attending is not the same as attending here physically so you guys are lucky that you were able to make it and uh, attend physically so okay all the best uh, and i hope we can do better next time but uh, this was also a good experience especially 
because after the COVID pandemic, we were not able to do these physical workshops. So any scientific program which is of a physical nature is a sort of a reunion now. So okay, all the best for everyone. Thank you. What? Yeah. So the uh, we'll have uh, on the stage with the delegates and faculty. Please, everybody come on the. I think we are not so many. Or everybody should join. Come on, come on. Fast like commandos. them <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah, come here. You're not like that. I'm Doctor, I get a people. I just go Banner, <laughs> 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 Okay. I'm <laughs> <laughs> What's up with you? I'm moving my pictures. I'm not going to be able to do it. I'm not going to be able to do it. I'm not going to be able yeah, 
get some benefit out of that. So uh, for people who are interested, we uh, had arranged for a hands-on uh, experience uh, in imaging and also for showing you instruments that you may be uh, using in Plasti with various implants. And uh, the third one was for, uh, we have three labs, the RedCam and UBM, yes. So people who are interested may stay back. We have three stations and you can attend and see. And I think that will be really helpful for people who are really interested in, uh, you know, working in oculoplasty. So we'll shortly be starting in around 10 minutes or so. You'll be guided by the senior yeah, residents. Sure. Yeah, it's in, it'll be, one of the stations will be in LT, uh, the same LT. Yeah. And yeah, you'll be guided. Right? Okay. Okay, <laughs> Cannot <laughs> 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 <laughs>
यहाँ खड़े हो जाना और कहीं जाना मत पंचिंग वाला लेना तो फाइव फोर हाँ पूरा ले लिया यार वो ना बहुत दूर से आई है उसमें ना क्लियर नहीं आया